It's 8.31, now 8.32, Saturday, January 26th. Call the council study session for the agenda to order. Roll call, Carla. <laughs> you guys are holding the place. Bergen. Here. Drinkout. Here. Kangas. Here. Mackenzie. Here. Raffi. Here. Cher. Present. Waldstein. Here. All present and accounted for. Welcome to all the staff that's gave up their Saturday, or at least most of it, to join us for this exciting session. I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Move approval to approve the agenda. Second. Motion made and seconded to approve the agenda. All those in favor say yes. 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 Motion carried. I will turn the meeting over to Mr. Bronner for his leadership to guide us through what we need to know. All right. It's my favorite time of year, as sick as that does sound, because, uh, you know, it's going to dictate what we'll be able to do for the next 18 months, really, as we get through budget, and it'll help set our path. So, um, so you can see the size of the book, the effort that goes into this to uh, provide you the documentation you need. Um, ask questions at any point in time you'd like. Um, how we'll probably proceed this morning is do a kind of a brief intro to what we have, what's in the budget, what's not in. Um, we'll talk a little bit about valuation, some things like that, and then I'll have staff come and start to go through each of their budgets. About 10, a little before, we'll maybe take a small break. We'll have the Chamber Heritage Days, the ancillary groups that get funding from us come in so they have a point in time. and Otherwise, they'd have to sit and wait or watch the TV and try to time it to get here. And so we felt that was much easier. And then we'll continue until about lunch. Um, at that point in time, we'll stop budgets for uh, departments, and then we're going to go into debt and capital projects mm -hmm. because Normally we would do that on the second session, which would be February 9th, but with the budget hearing being March 4th, the early part of March, it really backs us up for the timing we need. If we are going to issue debt, there's hearings that have to be in place, uh, levy hearings that have to be in place, and we don't have a lot of time to do that. So we want to get through as much as we can today and have an idea about what we're going to want to do so that our uh, Spirit Financial can start to get that together along with our bond attorneys and make sure our documentation's in place in enough time. So we only have two meetings in February to get that done. Otherwise, we're trying to do it in the same meeting as the budget, and that can happen. It's just a little messier. So, so that's what the afternoon will do if you get through um, capital projects. That goes nice and smooth and easy, as I assume it will. Um, we can just say yes, and we'll move right back into the budget. But, uh, <laughs> we will go back into departmental budgets and get as far as we can. And then we do have this on as a subsidiary meeting for Monday night to continue if need be. And then, of course, February 9th, we will try to finalize whatever is left to be finalized. And so that's kind of how we're looking at going forward. Um, hopefully it's agreeable. Uh, if not, you'll have to let me know. But uh, with that, um, I know Jennifer's here. If she would just give us a very, very brief what we have in the budget, some of the assumptions we have in there. Because a lot of it is just to get you the information you need so we're not bogged down in the same thing each and every department. So you would briefly, Jennifer. Good morning. Just, it'll be very, very brief as instructed. Um, <laughs> See listen to you listen to it's gonna be good. A large portion of our budget is personnel costs. And uh, so I'm just gonna give you some assumptions that are going on with the personnel. Um, the health benefits were increased 10%. That's a good guesstimate. We'll know better in a few weeks when our IGHC group meets and determines what it actually will be. Uh, health, um, the city has two uni unions, the police union and the city unit. They both have a 2.7% increase in for wages. And that is also included for non-union mem members, a 2.7% increase. Uh, the FICA has not changed, so those rates will stay the same. And the IPERS for the regular employees will also stay the same. The employee's share for the police pension decreased 1.61% this year, which is good for the budget. Um, as far as uh, commercial and industrial ro um, rollback, or Backfill, that is not included in the budget. 
just because of the dynamics of we may get it, we may not get it. If we would get it, uh, it'd be a total of $213,000. So I don't know if, you know, it's not in the budget. So we'll go from there. And the, the backfill includes the general fund, the special fund, and the debt fund. That's all I have, very briefly. If there's anything else, we'll just go just along the way. Just to clarify, the, the backfill not being in there, it means we're counting on zero coming to the state. Right. Anything um, that would come in would just go into general fund. Yeah. Absolutely. If you recall last year's uh, state session, they had a bill right to the end that was going to eliminate the backfill, whether it was that year or the next year, and it just did not quite make it. But it's the, there's not been a substantial change at the state house either side, so I assume it's just going to be gone this year. If it's that close last year, it'll be something that'll be gone this year. I know the governor's initial budget shows it fully funded, but that doesn't mean a whole lot because she doesn't really set the budget. So. Um, it will impact us about $213,000. We have it in there and don't get it. Then we're short, we have to go and recover it. So we're gonna go with the assumption we're not gonna get it at all. And it hurts, we don't like that, but we don't really have a choice. It's one of the number of things we'll have in the budget that we don't really control, whether it's insurance or IPERS or we just don't. And backfill's a tough one. And that's gonna be felt by every school, county, city, across the state. And so uh, we just decided this year, based on last year's discussions, it was not really Good to just put it in. We know it's not going to be there in some form. You so mentioned IPERS, though, but Jenny just said IPERS didn't change, right? Yeah. Okay. Correct. So <laughs> that's what you'll see in most of the budgets. We will probably not touch on the personnel side of it unless there is an actual position increase, decrease, some change there. Otherwise, those are the same <clears throat> assumptions throughout the entire budget. Everybody has those across the board. Do you know if we got, did we get any of the backfill last year? Uh, we did get it last year. Okay. The whole 213th hour or whatever. It was. Well, that's so, the hard part of it. And we'll go down this road a little bit. All right. They capped the backfill in fiscal 17. <clears throat> so even though you're getting all that was capped years before, as you grow, that's less you are going to eventually get. So everything above that average or that line we had in 17, and we are a growing city, we are losing what we would have gotten had they not done it in the first place. But we've got what we would have gotten in 17, and that's what we would have received. So we didn't get it all in a sense. We got as much as we were going to get capped out. And so every year you grow, you get less and less of what you could have gotten had they not done this in the first place. Okay. So, so we did, but yet we kind of didn't. Um, and if your city is not growing, then you got a much worse situation. So we're very fortunate we are still growing. So that's helpful. Jen. <clears throat> I can't cite a specific instance right now, but as I went through some of the personnel budgets, but some of the insurance costs almost doubled from what they were. <clears throat> insurance costs, yes. uh, some probably were single and went to family. I know that was oh, a case okay. in my department and probably in several others too. All right. Well, that would explain it. Makes then, a big difference. I know it. Mm -hmm. I think one of them was five thousand or thereabouts, and it went to nine or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out. Okay, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we'll move forward then. Um, of Carla can throw up the first slide. We're going to jump through here. Um, city valuation. You always want to see it trending up. Uh, we were fortunate this year to go up between three and four percent, depending on what you include in that valuation. So uh, that helped us overall as far as uh, when it comes to your tax rate. And I know there's always a discussion about taxable valuation versus assessed valuation total. Um, when your house is assessed, you'll have a value established by the assessor's office of what it is worth. That is your 100% valuation. Now we use that to calculate the debt that we can take on, the debt levy itself. But nowhere else do you really use that, basically, except for calculating debt. And we'll touch on that a lot this afternoon, so I don't want to go give it all away to you. So hold on to that. Um, taxable valuation would be the assessment you received multiplied by the rollback that you're allowed to tax for. And that's where the rollback gets to be kind of tricky. So every year the state will go and establish a rollback for different categories of property, whether it's residential, agricultural, commercial, industrial, and now multi-residential, which came on three, four years ago. 
And that rollback is the percentage of tax you can actually apply towards that property. So it's, I was a little different in this. They do it like this, we should have changed it. But so if you have a $100,000 house, the rollback right now for residential is about 56%. So you can only tax against 56% of that value. The other is, you just can't. For industrial and commercial, it's about 90%. And then in ag, I'm trying to think, it's about 50, I had that too. Uh, let me just see if it's in here. It's about the same as residential. It's close to that, it's 50 some percent. And I can get that to you. I thought I brought that and I don't have it in my packet here. And multi-residential? Uh, that's down to 75%. That is decreasing every year until it becomes equal to residential. Mm -hmm. That'll be 20, 23, 24, somewhere in there, I believe. Uh, it started at 100 and went to 90 when it was still part of commercial and industrial. And when they broke it out separate, and what that is is your buildings that may have a business on the bottom, apartments in the top, or there's multiple apartments in a single building that becomes multi-residential. And so it's not treated as commercial industrial property like it used to be a few years ago. Now it has its own valuation, its own class, and so they were decreasing it about three, three and a quarter percent every year going forward. So if you were to gain value of 3%, you're still losing it, so you're taking it down 3.5% or so. So that part of it really hits college towns are very hard. There's a lot of multi-residential property in Iowa City, Ames, Cedar Falls. We have some uh, with the college. <clears throat> That's what starts to kind of hit you too. And that was never part of the rollback, or the rollback, sorry, I, the backfill. It's mm -hmm. never been backfilled, multi-residential. That's just lost. Mm -hmm. And that'll continue again until it gets down to 60% or in the high 50s. Um, that's where they think residential will then come as well and then they will marry each other. So um, so that's when you're looking at taxable valuation. That's what it is. It's much less than what our true value is throughout the city. It's only what you can tax against. And you know the hard part of it is, and we'll get into this a little more with water and sewer, we jump into that. As we talk about every year, there are a lot of entities that do not pay taxes. So that's always the question as well, is how much do you shift onto fees they do cover versus taxes that we would not pay? And you're looking at you know the hospital and your nonprofits and the city, the schools, the counties, the churches, none of them pay taxes. And that's how they're established. But that's what impacts us then when we tax for something versus we have fees that everybody pays. And so at times, that's why we do some of what we do. And we'll see more of that when we get to water, sewer, solid waste. So, okay. So as we get into valuation, we also look at how it mirrors the city tax rate. And Usually when you see the valuation go up, the levy rate will drop. Because again, you have more valuation to deal with, so you don't need as high a tax rate to uh, receive the same amount of funding you normally would. So when we get in a lot of the comparisons, which I simply don't like to do to other cities because we're not them, that's what you'll see. You may see a lower tax rate. Well, they have a lot higher valuation. It is a mirror parallel. That's just the way it is. So you're probably paying the same amount of tax. It just doesn't look like it on the front. Because if you have a house with a very high valuation, you'll have a lot less tax rate and vice versa. So even if you're in a city that looks like it's different, well, the value may be much higher. Or if the tax rate's much higher, it's because the valuation's a lot lower. It's not you know, magic here, it's just that's the way the formula works. It's gonna be one or the other, but in the end, just paying about the same. So that's why I don't get caught up on comparing to other cities, what they do, what they don't have. You can pick it apart any way you want, but in the end, it's going to be very similar. We all arrive at the number the same. It's just a matter of what you have to work with. So as you see, as the valuation goes up, rates usually go down. We've had an uptick lately because we have been taking on an aggressive debt schedule to try and get a lot of projects done. And uh, we have that same pattern in here this year, and you'll have to establish if you want to continue with that or pull that back or what you would like to accomplish. So, um, But that's what it looks like when you pick, compare uh, valuation tax rates. So if you would. And then the next one we always talk about is, you know, where do your taxes go in a sense? This is based on the most recent information we could find quickly for each of the areas. School system, city, county, uh, community college, Hawkeyes on tax bills, and the miscellaneous would be the assessor, a little bit of some state tax they put in there. Um, and so usually it's about 40, 40, 15, and then change. So it ebbs and flows each year depending on what the rates are. If we have a higher year, lower year, that's the most recent as to where it sits. So everybody talks about their bill and where it goes. That's kind of a breakout as of today, where it would go in your tax bill. 
James, on this uh, pie chart, does, who establishes the uh, percentages? Is that is that something the state decides or do? No, it, it's basically taking your tax bill and then determining how much tax went to each entity for that year. Yeah, that's I guess. how we arrived. I'm just curious how how we decided that Waverly gets 44 percent. Is your tax bill for last year? Say it was $100, $44 went to the city. But it's determined by each budget. Yep. Right? So Next year, that could be 39 yeah. All right. It that, depends on how that's, the rates that's go I mean. for each entity and when they add up. And we just took a percentage out of it, and that's what it looked like. So Okay. Very good. Thanks. That's not your tax bill. I use Mike. I just want you to know it wasn't. <laughs> so, go ahead, Carla. And the last one we'll jump into quick, and then we'll hop into uh, departments here, is this is kind of the size of each departmental budget. We stack them up against each other. Um, some of our larger ones that you would assume be the case, public works and streets, public safety, leisure services, water, sewer, solid waste, and then you start getting into uh, library, economic development, airports at 1%, uh, finance. So as your total budget looks out, that's kind of the percentages and how they break out based on the cost, the expenditures. Now it's not the net amount, some have revenue, some don't, that was truly the expenditures. And some we transfer to other departments, et cetera, Get away from all that to get even numbers. This is the true expenditures. And that's what it looked like. So, and some of them are summarized. Public safety would be police, fire, EMS, um, leisure services has a golf course and pool and everything. So they're categorized individually. It would have been a lot more slices of pie if we'd have done every single bit of it. So, in order for it to work, that's what we've got. And so you kind of see an overview of what uh, what you're going to be getting to in detail. I mean, is it correct to look at this and say about a thirty? Four thirty-five percent of this is supported by user fees. Yep, and the rest is by taxes. Absolutely. If your enterprise funds are about a third, and so everything else would be tax or offset by some revenue source. Okay. So, if there's any other questions? I'm glad to take them. Otherwise, we can jump into. Uh, so, a quick question: uh, When we had the uh, the valuations and the tax rate chart, mm -hmm. where we were looking at that slightly upturn trend in the last few years, um, how? So, so you were saying that that kind of that that upturn in the last few years that's because of our aggressive posture in terms of building projects. How much of that is also impacted by how much of the rollback? I mean, are we having to increase our tax rate to counteract the fact that we can tax against a lower percentage of property values? There is some of that. Yeah, when you factor that in, um, if you look at a year ago, we almost had negative growth because the rollback was so severe down in the residential and the ag. And so that does hamper us. And so you can either cut and cut and cut, and then we're losing services, or you can try to maintain and ride out that average of what it's going to be going forward. Um, so the city decided to still continue to try and improve infrastructure and go forward. So it caused it to kind of tick up a little bit as it flattened out. Because if you see those last years, it went flat. There was not an increase. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you got fine-tuned enough, you'd see a slight dip. And so we still went ahead with the infrastructure we wanted. And this year, there was a lot more infrastructure we've talked about. We'll show that to you this afternoon, what's included and what's not. And there's a whole lot that's not included. You can decide if you want to do as well. And so with that, with the backfill coming out, again, it's a $200,000 hit. Some of the other things that we've talked about, whether it be personnel positions or just again the debt itself, there is a slight uptick. Now, again, this is proposed in, certainly not final, um, but that's kind of what you're seeing. And you know, a lot of it is that people don't realize that the state has a tremendous impact on what happens to us. And a lot of those budgets down there, they may not like to hear us, but it's the truth. They'll balance that budget on the backs of local government time and time and time again. We can show you tons of examples of it. And that's just the way it is. We don't have anywhere to balance our budgets on except for the people that we have to tax. And that's the unfortunate side of it. Um, so when you get the rollback taken out, even though it was promised it was always going to be here, <laughs> How long did that last? About five, six years. That's about what the average was you figured it would be. And it'll be stripped and gone. Other things will continue to go like that. There'll be funding that's taken away. School, school system deal with it as much as anybody. You know, from the amount of money they should be receiving for their per pupil, that's taken away now going to other entities. And that's unfortunate too. But So we'll deal with what we can deal with. Um, we'll try and estimate the best we can. Again, taking the rollback out is the best thing we can, or the rollback. Got to stop saying it. The backfill mm -hmm. out. Must be all this sugar. I think it's kind of... <laughs> um, 
the backfill being taken out. You know, while I don't like it and it hurts us a little bit, going forward we'll be better for it because we're not depending on it. Mm -hmm. I do know cities that did that years ago and they would only then advance forward. They took that one hard year and they would only advance forward what they received the prior year. That's hard to do when you're still getting that money, you're trying to control taxes. We're going to take that bullet this year because odds are it probably won't be there. So we just want to jump ahead of it and just have to bear down and take that one just because it's what the state's going to do. So we just don't control that. So any other questions? All right, we will jump forward into your booklet. There are some nice comparative charts there. If you want to look at those, you sure can. We can talk about them all you want. But I would like to jump into then, starting off the police department budget. We'll have a uh, chief for sale come up and get us going. And again, I'll give kind of a brief overview of what they have in the budget, and then we'll uh, take questions and go from there. <coughs> chief. Board of Mayor and Council, thank you for the time and consideration of our budget this year for 2019-2020. Um, I'm just going to try to hit the highlights, as James mentioned. I will um, hit a couple things that maybe be that are changing. Uh, but if there's anything you see while we're stepping through the budget, please um, stop me, and we'll I answer those questions as quickly as we can. Uh, on the first page, you'll see our mission statement at the beginning of the budget. Um, and of course, we always strive to be a service-oriented public safety organization um, that's always dedicated to serving the citizens of Waverly. And bel below that is our organizational chart. So if you have any questions about our structure, you can um, ask about that. We are broken down into two divisions, a patrol division and an investigative division. And uh, currently we have 16 officers um, in our department, and which is about 1.6 officers per uh, thousand. And currently the state of Iowa average is 1.7, 1.8. So um, I always like to point out um, each year that we are um, just below the state average for a number of officers uh, for our capita. And as James mentioned, um, those are tough comparisons because every, every community is unique in their own way and have different needs, so, um, but, but we are currently below the state average. Um, during the past year, we had 8,939 calls for service, and that average is about 39 minutes um, per call. So officers are out on scene close to 4,900 uh, minutes. And then when they get done with those calls, uh, when they go back to the station, if it's something simple, it may be a 15 minute uh, paperwork process, or if it's um, an investigative, it could be uh, days, months, uh, and in some cases years, um, that the officer continue to work on a single call for service. So um, guys stay busy. Our, um, we are proud of our ability to handle uh, our calls of service. Currently, uh, we have um, our response time is 1.67, so 1 minute 67 seconds uh, from time of call to time of arrival. And now, that sounds pretty impressive, but that does include, if they happen to be at the center working on other paperwork and a call comes in, their response time is really fast. Um, if somebody needs to answer a call on, on the phone. So, any questions about numbers and, and where we stand as a department? And if not, we'll go on the next page, which is our activity cover sheet. Um, every department has um, one of these as well in their budget. I'll just quickly highlight the four different areas um, is the community relations, equipment, training, and uh, department policy. Those are kind of the areas that uh, we're going to touch on within the budget, and these kind of highlight a couple of the, the uh, bigger expenditures within the budget. Um, within the community relations, the, the four items listed um, support the strategic uh, strategic plan goal of enhanced community engagement uh, and communications. Last year, we had the ability through our programs to visit with over 4,000 uh, citizens. Uh, our department has been able to go out and speak, whether that be through the Citizens Academy, whether that be through uh, Lunch with Law program. So 4,000 um, citizens um, we were able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with, and it was great. Um, Last year we had a little bit of an issue with uh, numbers, so we were not able to offer the Citizens Police Academy, but I'm happy to say that our numbers are there this year, and we'll be starting that next month. So um, that's a, we're pretty happy about that. It's a great program. 
Under equipment, um, again, it supports the goal of sustaining services and updates infrastructure. Um, the, the major things are more towards the back of the line item of the vehicle and of the vehicles and our uh, mobile um, data terminals. We're on our phase of putting money aside. So that money you'll see through the loss program putting into capital equipment reserve. We do not have those expenditures this year as we're, we purchased last year. So we're on a three year rotation. So currently we're putting a third of those costs away and you'll see those come out through the loss fund. And through our training, um, again, we do a lot of our stuff in house and uh, so we'll just jump into page three where the, the meat of the budget is. And again, in every department, you're going to have um, structured the same with the revenues and expenditures. Um, at the top portion of the budget is our revenue, and our um, largest source comes from court fines and, and parking tickets. And the court fines is a portion of the um, of what we receive from the clerk's office for our citations that we write, and that's where that's where they come from. Um, we continue to adjust our revenue for different things under pecuniary uh, due to legislation changes um, that continues to tick down. Uh, under an on our expenditures, they're broken down into three different areas as well. That's personnel services, uh, services and commodities, and any capital um, vehicle and equipment purchases. In our personal services, as James and Jenny has touched on, a lot of that is locked in uh, currently with contracts. So that's our salaries, insurance, and our work comp expenditures. In our services com commodities, you'll see um, training, our vehicle maintenance, our fuel costs, um, our contributions to other agencies, that is our 27% um, shared cost to the law center that we do with the Brigham County Sheriff's Office. And that's the split that, um, that we have, have contracted with them. Um, under technology services, that is the line on that represents our portion of our IT contract um, and also additional tech support for our desktops, mobile computers, and server. If you notice, that's um, one of the line items that has increased um, compared to the previous years. And, and the majority of that is due to um, the IT and our maintenance agreements. Uh, those, as we get more committed and locked into um, uh, the tech world, we uh, become reliant on a lot of outside uh, services uh, that we don't have that in-house. So that's why you'll see some of those increases in our, in our technology uh, side line item. The next one is animal control. And then uh, under contract services, that's where we have um, more maintenance agreements with our advanced um, public safety, which is our APS system. That's the in-car um, computer. Uh, um, that's our voice command and our readback. And then also our arbitrator where our, um, our uh, video cameras in our cars. And then also our tasers, our warranties, and our replacement program is inside that line item. Uh, in operating supplies, that includes our clerical supplies and also where we budget for our ammunition for our uh, training and, and annual qualifications. And in capital vehicles, there's nothing in there, that, but that's where you would see the um, replacement for those vehicles. So, under the orders of James, I went through it quickly. <laughs> And very, I know I threw it very efficiently. I say that efficiently. <laughs> but um, if you'll notice, compared to the previous years, there has not in, and I always try to point to that in the areas that that we can control as directors in the service and commodities section. If you look at, um, from year to year, there has not been a lot of changes um, within that. Where you'll see it mostly, it is is, is above and below on that section. Um, so. Again, we're going to be here all day, and so if something pops up that you want to talk about, and um, otherwise I'll sit down and let Dennis get up here. Two real, hopefully, easy questions. Yeah. Um, with bringing the body cameras online, you read about some departments that struggle with how to manage the retention of that. Yeah. I mean, do you see at some point 
Did we fight it right, I guess, from storage to begin with, or is there going to be some cost to that? Down yeah, that, uh, that is something that, uh, and I think we're in, we're in a nice position, um, the way we've been able to partner uh, our server and some of our storage with the Sheriff's Department. And so uh, we have currently have a joint server where uh, a lot of our information and, and the Sheriff's Department's information goes. So. Yes, it, it will continue to be a problem and, um, you know, we, when we can split that and we can work with another government agency, it really helps us as a city decrease our costs. Um, but we are looking at different things, whether that be a cloud base uh, or, or we continue to uh, increase the size of our server. Um, the qualities of the, for, so for one, and you can imagine if, if we have an hour, um, investigation with uh, with the somebody with our patrol vehicles well all of a sudden two or three patrol officers show up as well they all are required to have their mobile cameras on so now you just added three or four more hours of digital uh, images that you have to retain so it it does you're right Dan it just continues to grow uh, the quality is amazing everything's in HD so that takes more space and uh, so <laughs> it is so, uh, so yes it and that is a, a thing that most law enforcement agencies are are uh, going to struggle with and are currently, especially ones in larger communities. And you keep the files forever? Um, it depends on the case. We have a retention um, policy, and so we can have a warning that maybe it stays for 30 days. Um, uh, misdemeanors stay for thir uh, I'm sorry, for a year, and then anything that goes beyond that, we'll, we'll adjust accordingly. <clears throat> and Rich, I just have a question about the money you collect for citations. Yeah. You said we only keep a portion of that. Where? We only receive a portion of it. Um, okay. So for every citation that is written, we only re receive a certain portion back. So you know, if it costs hundred dollars a ticket, you know, there's there's court um, fees and there's um, so we don't retain um, the full amount. Thing. Yeah. My last question, and may not be able to give us a, a real tight number, but again, your services extend out to those entities that don't pay taxes. Do you have any feel for your call for services that are to those nonprofit areas? Um, these are always difficult questions. Uh, I can tell you that that our single highest by address call for service is a non as a non paying um, but you know, I don't know if that tells the whole picture either. But uh, but yes, they um, non um, places that are not currently paying taxes do uh, take up a lot of our service. And again, yeah. I just want to maybe ask that or have you respond more for the public's awareness than anything. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that those services shouldn't be provided. But you sometimes get singled out as the highest part of the budget on the right. department. <coughs> There's reasons for that. And along that line, too, Rich, could you talk real briefly about um, mutual aid, uh, things that go on beyond the city limits as well? You know, it's part of why we use local option sales tax to do some of our equipment because it's not just within the city limits. Um, you, right. We, uh, with our mutual agree agreements with the sheriff's office and the communities, uh, we do respond. Um, yesterday was a, an example of where um, there was a mutual aid agreement, that, and uh, we responded with the sheriff's office and um, the police department for uh, somebody had a diabetic reaction that was coming into uh, from the east side of town, and so. So that started out in the county, but ended up in Waverly, and um, so yeah, those situations do occur um, often. So, given our proximity to the county line, how often are you going into Butler County? Into Butler County, not a ton. Okay. Yeah, not a ton. Okay. Any other right. questions for the chief? Thank you very much. Thanks, Rich. And just a quick interrupt, we do have uh, Mark Oliver here also from Bergen KDB, our IT provider. So I think it's real technical and weird. We're going to look to him to help us out with it. But, uh, we're always glad that you can attend this session to kind of answer any questions going forward with equipment or computer issues you may have. Hmm. So that being the case, we'll jump into fire department, Chief Happel. Good morning, everyone. I'll try and morning, keep my morning. remarks even more brief than Chief Purcell did. Um, everything in, on uh, 
The fire department side is pretty much status quo. Um, my budget doesn't change a lot from year to year. I don't have personnel costs that I have to worry about, things like that. The, uh, the, the insurance costs, et cetera, uh, are things that obviously we don't control. Things within my control, um, <clears throat> excuse me, or our control as far as replacement of trucks, et cetera. Uh, we've got a, a good system set up of 30 years on the trucks, except for uh, some of the higher use vehicles. And so uh, we kind of march along every year and, and not a lot changes. Um, we process about, as usual, about 100, 110 calls a year. Uh, that stays pretty uh, consistent from year to year. Of course, on drier years, that'll go up, and on wet years, that goes down uh, due to the grass fires, et cetera, that we uh, respond to. Um, our training is, is pretty much done in-house, with the exception of we do have a winter fire school that we do have firefighters attend. Uh, we're very lucky to have, I believe, we're up to seven uh, in-house state-certified instructors on the department, which is very, very unusual. Um, but I think our training program and the readiness of our firefighters reflect uh, the ability to do so much in-house and uh, to keep it going. Um, last year we voted uh, for you allowed us to get a new truck. That should be here. We're hoping uh, before the change of the budget, it's gonna be nip and tuck, but uh, it is online to get here and, and things are moving well. Uh, the two things on my budget that uh, probably jump out the most is on uh, the fire station. Our door system is now uh, 12 years old and it is failing rapidly and this, this system is what the firefighters use to get into the station. Um, there's a little computer board in each uh, door that you we punch our, our uh, code into to access the station and technology has surpassed uh, in 12 years what that system, uh, so we, can't get, we can't get parts for the system is, is the uh, short version of that. And so we need to replace that. That's about a $24,000 option. Currently are, we are Wi-Fi on that. <clears throat> and we will be changing that to a hardwired system uh, to allow us more flexibility. Um, I may have enough left over in this year's budget to start that process. Um, as if we can't get in, we can't go. Uh, so I may move that, be able to move that up into this year's budget, but uh, if that is not allowed, uh, I have budgeted that for next year. Uh, the other major thing, or not really major, but uh, additional thing that I have put in the budget, if you will uh, look at the capital um, campaign, or not capital campaign, um, other capital equipment, um, I have put in there for $4,000 for training structure and $4,500 for site improvements for that training structure. The fire department, as you know, has held two state conventions here, and with that money we have been uh, setting aside for different projects around the city, which we will be bringing forth here probably in the next two or three months, what we have decided to allocate our money towards. One of the items uh, is going to be training structure. We're hoping to put it right beside the fire station. Uh, we will also be going after grant money for this. Uh, this particular item will be in the $350,000 range, uh, which will be a great addition to our fire department. And also, I've talked with Chief Purcell, and there may be some advantages to the police department also in some tactical uh, practice on that also. So um, that is not a hard uh, budget item as of yet. I wanted to bring your attention to it because we will, we will be pushing forward on this uh, relatively quickly, especially if we start going after grants, things like that. Our intention is to fund it as much as possible outside of tax dollars, but uh, it will take some cooperation for land, et cetera, near the fire station with the council, and and uh, we'll see how it all goes down, down the road as we get to that point. So um, other than that, my budget, like I said, is, is uh, pretty much status quo from what I have had the last several years. If you have any questions whatsoever, I'd be glad to, to answer them for you. I guess I have a question about the training structure. What What is it going to look like and how it is it will, going to fit in with the Riverside Park plans? Um, the structure itself will be a two to three story um, uh, yeah, facility that will somewhat image um, a house 
and also a commercial structure combined. One level of it is single story, and part of it is, is a two story or three story, whatever we get to. Um, it will, the aesthetics of it will look a lot like what the station does as far as colors and, and uh, bringing it into that. Uh, we want it to look like a campus effect so that it doesn't stick out like a, a sore thumb by any means. So Danny, does the um, fire department own the land or are you gonna need to acquire it? The fire department do does not own any land over there. It's all city property. Uh, I have spoken with Tab, um, just getting the, uh, the word out there about what we would like to do. Uh, there's a lot of planning that goes into this on both sides. And so it isn't anything concrete at this point, but it is something that, uh, as Tab has indicated, in that area it's going to be in phase five of, of the park renovation. So we have a little time uh, to work forward. And, uh, yeah, we want to keep it local, close to the station if we can, because of, obviously, the accessibility and the ease of deploying and getting things. Uh, we're right next to the station, and it will just save a lot of time on our training side instead of running to a different location trying to set up out there we're right there we're only uh, we only do let's see our training usually runs about three to four hours um, when we when we have our training night so taking an hour hour and a half to set up and take things down obviously cuts into that so <clears throat> that's our thought are there um, uh, other advantages to having something like this? Uh, certainly the setup, I understand the time savings and all of that, but um, can you talk a little bit about the value added of having uh, this kind of uh, training structure? And would we be, you know, would we be ahead of the curve on that? Or would we be doing, are we behind the curve and catching up and having something like this? Or For a town our size, we would be ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, like I said, with our uh, the training instructors that we have in in the department, it would allow us um, some pretty neat uh, ability. Our, our aerial truck, you know, as you know, um, we utilize that, but not to the extent that we should be uh, in our training process. Simply because it. Um, some of the sites that we get on, for instance, we're working on the Miller House out by the airport. Well, when it was this fall, when we were out there working and working our uh, scenarios, it worked okay, except we kept losing the outriggers because the ground is soft. And so, obviously, those are things that we have to deal with, and it's good to do that. But sometimes you just want to be able to come in, set up run people through it and, you know, work out different scenarios. Um, the three-story ability would also give us some, some areas for commercial uh, application on the department. And uh, we don't get that practice a lot. And obviously we have commercial in town that are two and three-story, namely climbing the tower at Nestle's, uh, packing hose up the, the stairways, et cetera. And so it just opens up a whole new training area for us. Um, we would be able to probably bring other towns in. Um, not a money maker by any means, but it's just in the cooperation, working with other departments. We mutual aid, uh, just like the, the police department does, with other departments, and some kind, sometimes it's kind of nice to work with them beforehand, before you actually have a big incident, so everybody understands how things work. Um, yeah, it, it would just be a, a very neat benefit for our training side. Thanks. And how much land do you think you would need? Um, we need a patch of land approximately, just for namesake, uh, probably 100 by 100 feet. Do Nothing have large. Any sort of security around it, or fence we'd have around to, it. Or? We'd have to do some different security items. Um, not necessarily a fence. Um, it's just it, it's all in the planning process, so it's more of getting you aware of what we are thinking and where we are going, uh, or would like to go. Okay. Do you have any other questions for Chief Apple? 
Thank you, Danny. Good presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, well, next, then, we'll move into uh, our ambulance budget. Good morning. My name is Robin Chisholm. I'm the manager of the ambulance and the ED department at the hospital. This is Jody Gersh. She's our new CNO. She had come on board around August. So thank you for the opportunity for you guys' support for our ambulance service. We always genuinely appreciate having the city councils um, caring for our EMS service in our community. Last year, a year in review, we had about 1,890 total calls for the EMS service. 1,600 of those were where we transferred the patients. And the difference between those two numbers are examples of when we get canceled from going on a call, or if we go to, on fire scenes and do a fire assist, or just have a no transport or no patient found. The top three reasons that we transport our patients have been for the chest pain, Let's see, respiratory distress and um, abdominal pain. What was the first one? Chest pain. Mm -hmm. And can you give those numbers again? Yes, yep, let me find how much paper. Right. We had 201 calls for chest pain, 160 for abdominal pain, and 138 for respiratory distress. Mm -hmm. And what were the total call numbers again? The total transported was 1,605. Yeah, the total calls was 1,890. <coughs> Out of that volume, 1,501 came from the town of Waverly, which includes 911 and the hospital transfers. How far out do you go? As far as for 911 territory, our territory is surrounding Waverly and a little bit external in the community, but then we cover for the first responders of Plainfield, Janesville, and Shell Rock. So it's their territory, but we have a mutual aid agreement to provide their transport. Okay. The county contribution, I'm looking here at that they last yeah. for a long time. Is that on a per capita basis or how is that? It's just been a standing agreement. I can't actually articulate exactly where that number had come from in the past. It's just been kind of a standing amount that they've been contributing. So I'm not 100% sure. The 13,000. Again, I think it's great to have a local community hospital that has other services suffer. I think you guys are being stretched farther and farther into the county. It would be nice to maybe approach them for additional support. And I don't know if that's something James could help uh, so with or... Yeah. So in our budget, we had asked for just a little bit more of an increase in the fuel, and we with that we changed to a gas truck starting in August. So it has a little bit of a comparable gas mileage, but it just the cost of the fuel is just a little bit higher. So that was a $5,000 increase. And then we were over budget on our expenses of repairs. And Adam 3 has just had cost us $9,781 last year in repairs. And so we just wanted to be more on budget for this coming season. Any other questions? Do you get any county contribution from Butler County? We do not, nope. And our call volume for Butler County ended up being 115 total. And that includes when the EMS services in Butler County asked for our assistance as a paramedic service. So that doesn't mean that we did their primary transports. <clears throat> that mutual aid agreement. Yeah. So with the increase uh, for repair, you, you didn't see this as being kind of a one-off thing this year. You're saying that you think that that's a more realistic, regular Yes, unfortunately, figure. that truck's just been kind of a little bit of a sour truck that's required a little more expenses. It's, it's due to be replaced in 2021, so we have a couple more years yet. Mm -hmm. Each truck is on a three-year rotation. but We purchase a new truck every three years, but each truck is on a nine-year rotation, actually, of its lifetime. Mm -hmm. I think to Dan's point, as we are being stretched thinner and thinner, we are piling up more and more miles, and we may have to someday look at trimming that down more to seven or eight years, mm -hmm. because as you get to that seventh, eighth, ninth year, there are some serious issues when you hit that 200-some thousand mile on an ambulance. Um, it's 
Yeah, it's interesting, but we may have to start to trim that down. We do have funding in for the next one, mm -hmm. which has been giving us trouble. So um, again, it's just the nature where we are is people cut back other areas, we're asked to pick up that difference, and thankfully they can, but it has an impact. So how many miles do you think we put on a vehicle? We put on about 100, well, not about 30 to 40,000 yep. per year. We do long distance transfers to Mayo, the University, Des Moines occasionally. Um, mental health transfers, we try to use outside services to keep our trucks in town and local, but every so often we'll have to do a long distance transfer to Council Bluffs mm -hmm. um, yeah. just out of situations for the patient care and patient you know, get to Kip the next Lady facility. And Jim Sheedy has spent a lot of time in the last couple of years trying to get uh, the EMS mm -hmm. as an essential service. Is there any update? Well, very good question. The whole state's kind of going through a restructure right now of the EMS service, and so they have proposed law changes that will be coming out. It's all in a draft form right now. They're asking for any type of services that have 100 calls or less to actually join with another service, and so we don't have a clear example of what that will look like. So if there's a one service, if there's three services and they each do 50 calls each, can they join together to be one service? Or does a f bigger facility have to absorb and help out those smaller facilities? It's still in proposed rules right now, so we're all kind of anxiously <coughs> awaiting what will happen at the state level with that, but um, we expect changes later this year. Mm -hmm. But is there any traction to having it become an essential service? You know, there's been uh, a couple of counties that have Done entertained um, those votes to, to do that. Um, I, I think there's more discussion now that's happening than there ever has been in the past. This is purely my opinion, but I, I believe that these proposed rule changes um, at the state level are really preparing um, that type of work moving forward. Yes, sir. The follow-up question is the state's pretty good about making rules, but not funding the rules that they make. So um, it'll be interesting to see where that ends up. Yeah. yeah. We all are. <laughs> I think you're looking at it right here. In all seriousness, a couple counties have uh, gone ahead and they do fund EMS. I think a Sooth Calhoun. Um, so I spent a year with Kip and, and these fine ladies in this whole group trying to figure out what can we do. And it is a tremendous shortage financially in our county, Butler. Mm -hmm. There's only a handful throughout the area that can still support a unit or a crash car, anything. Mm -hmm. A lot of the cities that used to, they're all volunteer, and you're seeing that mm -hmm. fail to where you can't. Yeah. So you may be a lot further away from EMS service than you think you are mm -hmm. at times, and that's scary. But that's what you're seeing is that epidemic, and the numbers are staggering when you look at it countywide, what it would take. And some have adopted it. Some counties have went ahead and done it, and they tax across the whole county. But it's very few that have done that. So mm -hmm. be curious up, what that does to the state when they change that, if they do. I was up in Mason City last weekend doing some firefighter certification and talked to one of their paramedics. And they travel 40 minutes sometimes just to get to the patient. And then they have a 40-minute travel back because there is no other mm -hmm. EMS. All the first responders, all the for uh, profit have just gone out of that area. And to, to think yeah. that you're sitting there waiting 40 minutes for help from a family member is in distress. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. certainly the trend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm glad that's not the trend here in Waverly. We you are know. too. No. We are too. And sometimes our trucks are being asked to haul for different hospitals. And just as a like FYI, we make sure that we have 911 covered in our community. And we do an assessment within the hospital before we would send one of our trucks out to another hospital to help out another patient. So we keep vigilantly watch over watch our 911 response and how duty many, to our uh, service. Uh, excuse me. How, how many ambulances do we have, and do you think it's the right number for us? At our hospital, our our base. We yep. have three. We have we do staffing for two, and then we have the third out because we do a, a lot of um, PM maintenance. Every 100 hours, the trucks go into the shop, so we use that third one pretty routinely in the sense that we have one in the shop. Would we in the future have to potentially look at how to help out our communities? That's a possibility, and that's a possibility as a, we might have to readdress and. Are you, are you having incidences where you have calls for um, 
an ambulance and there just isn't one available right now? That does occasionally happen, and that's because both trucks are already on scenes, either doing a 911. So if a truck goes on a long distance transfer, that's four to six hours turnaround while it's gone to the U or gone to Mayo. The other truck sits in waiting for 911 calls. That truck can get a 911 call, and then that patient has to go to Allen or Covenant. We don't do long distance 911 responses. So that only would be going to Allen or Covenant or our own facility. And then there's a third call that does come out. So occasionally there is that hole where we just don't have enough trucks to be able to cover all them calls. And then the dispatchers will call, go through their protocols and call the outside services to help out for the third call. So that third truck is not necessarily able to be staffed with an on-call crew? What we do with the third truck in times is when we, if we have two long distance transfers out of the healthcare, then we will call and see if there's any other staff that could be gotcha. either waiting at home with internal in town people, so that's a quick response, or come into the hospital and we call it a transport truck yeah. then. So we put a transport truck crew on the road and then staff the third one for the 911. And we do monitor the frequency for that, and you know, we're continuously assessing if there is a need to continue to staff that. But really, at this point, that really hasn't been a need to staff for three. Mm -hmm. And are you having any trouble staffing? We are. We, we do. Um, we, we've had, I think we're experiencing now some of the challenges that are being experienced across the state. I mean, there's a, a statewide and a nationwide shortage of paramedics. Um, so... We've been, um, so far, I mean, we've been able to continue to staff as, as necessary um, with the resources that we have, but I, I think this is gonna continue to be an ongoing ongoing issue. Um, there just aren't a lot of people going into the into that profession, and um, so there's a, a bigger, bigger problem <laughs> uh, out there. And we've started utilizing some of the nursing staff in the ER just yeah. at that capacity, because we have the similar trainings to be running as RN exempts and helping out in the ambulance. So they're in that training phase to have another pool to be able to use. If the ER is slower, I can come out to be a nurse in the ER and let that nurse go and help out in the trucks. And we had pretty great response by the nursing departments mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I've got two which hopefully quick questions. Um, the, the line item in the budget for uh, vehicle maintenance, if, if my understanding is that vehicles are maintained at the city garage. Yes. Okay, yeah. so is that a transfer then to the whatever department that is at the city so that would show up as a revenue on a, on a different sheet? If you look at the, those two lines, the mm -hmm. second one says maintenance equipment ES. Right. That's ours, equipment services. Okay. So that's the amount that we send in where they get all changes or routine maintenance. If it's something bigger, that's the above line. That's one we can't take on in our actual area. So yeah, when you look at the uh, equipment services budget that Mike will go through in a little bit, you'll see the billing out of labor and parts, and this is part of what shows in there. Yep. Okay, that's what I was thinking. And I guess the second thing, when you're talking about making long distance uh, ambulance runs, um, it, isn't that a fee for service? Don't don't you get paid by somebody, an insurance company mm -hmm. or somebody for that? Mm -hmm. Yes, the hospital does. Okay, so that basically goes into the hospital revenues, not what you have listed here as correct. revenues. Okay. Yes, correct. It goes into yep. the hospital debt because what's your <laughs> what's your say, average reimbursement for what it costs to send an ambulance correct. out? Well, it, it's dependent on the payer. Yeah. Um, so most follow Medicare rates, which don't necessarily even cover the cost. It's we get reimbursed often less than the cost that it takes. Right, retains. yeah. No, that, that's so what there my is understanding a huge revenue. was, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, you know, one of these guys that looks at sheets, and I'm saying, okay, I know there's a revenue item here somewhere. I wonder where it went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you look at the wear and tear, that vehicle, the overhead, the salary, the service, it does not cover close to that. No, so I'm, I'm quite We sure. take it, they take it. And that's the thing, as you go forward, this will be the area that you're going to see the biggest change in. Mm -hmm. We can become a regional mm -hmm. issue. It could be real interesting as a right. starting to take hold in the state house now some changes that may occur and again will the funding be there or not if it is i'm sure it'll be promised forever <laughs> <laughs> and five years later here we are <laughs> sorry i was kind of cheap i can't help it that's what it is um, yeah, that's right. what it is so yeah that's unfortunately what you're seeing now we're not covering costs the way it is mm -hmm. and it truly is an epidemic so heidi is so high and from the hospital is has referred to that various times that the amount of revenue actually received over what should be is is way less than half. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it doesn't cover the cost. No, yeah. and that's why we appreciate your guys' support and help because it takes 
for our community to be safe and have 911 services. It takes a team, and we appreciate that. Well, I'm sure that a budget hearing <clears throat> probably isn't the place to say this, but I really appreciate that you're there, and I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you very much. We well, and just team. the amount of time it must take to <laughs> keep track of the calls and make sure that you've got a, a rig available yes. and the staff. 24-7. Where is everybody, right? Correct. When are they coming back from Mayo? It's complicated. Yes. So It's yes. quite complex, but very yeah. fluid, and we have a great team of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Robin's one of those who do a very nice job with managing that mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions for Robin? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right. Now we're going to jump into Mike. We're going to go through the public works admin, a few other areas. So this is the first half of Mike's budgets, and the second half will come a bit later. So did you indicate to Mike to make it brief? <laughs> I did. Yeah. <laughs> brief is a relative term, <laughs> so it may seem brief, but uh, uh oh. <laughs> Let me get up for a second. So let's sit there and sit there. Get our circle. Pass it down. I'd rather get up and pass them out this way, but sit here all day. No idea. No. Okay, intercept it later. I don't know if he needs a copy of it. Okay. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, we need to have a stretch, we need to have a stretch period. You know, this is twice as thick as my entire debt packet, I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I did, so. <laughs> So we've got five divisions that we're going to uh, cover within Public Works. This is about half that we'll, we'll deal with. Public Works Administration, Engineering, uh, Equipment Services, Streets, and Airport. And uh, so um, in the handout here, this gives you kind of a, uh, hopefully an easier to read, more user-friendly summary of it. Um, I'm gonna throw, Place this. You got the colored version here. It's kind of color coded. It gives the various divisions as well as our superintendent staffing uh, structure. Uh, within Public Works, we have 28 full time employees. We have four se part time seasonal at the yard waste facility, four permanent part time at the recycling center, and then uh, we have um, uh, typically higher, uh, I believe, three seasonal and summer help uh, for the summer. In addition, we also have uh, a retired engineer uh, that helps out, uh, helps backfill in the, in the engineering department on various projects um, uh, with the design or with the project inspection uh, during the summer months. So. So Public Works Administration is, is the first one that's up. Uh, it's two people. 95% of, of the budget is labor. Uh, we have about $14,000 that is for IT services. We have no control over that. We're told the number to plug in. Uh, so um, there's um, not a lot going into it other than labor. Uh, Public Works Administration, um, again, we're tasked with uh, managing and overseeing uh, the entire Public Works Department. Uh, we do the long-range strategic planning and assessment for the public infrastructure. Uh, we do um, a lot of public awareness, communication through the newsletter, notifications, and project open houses. We also uh, coordinate with state and federal agencies, uh, do grant writing, and administer uh, contracts that are, are both uh, with consultants and contractors alike. Do 
<laughs> so, um, and this is the budget. And then, uh, if you want to do the account detail sheet. You can. So then this gives you the breakout of, of um, you know, there's, uh, you know, the big item here is the tech service expense for uh, the, the city hall computer server and the like. We um, allocate our time to uh, various capital projects. So like, uh, think of the Bremer Avenue project or the, the wastewater treatment facility project. Uh, as we incur time uh, administering those projects, we are in effect charging our time to those projects. Uh, the portion of our time and expenses that are not able to be allocated against capital projects are split three ways between water, sewer, and solid waste. So that, un, um, that amounts to about $80,000 uh, in this budget that will be uh, charged against water, or charged to uh, the water fund, uh, the sewer fund, and the solid waste fund. And when we get to those enterprise funds, we'll, we'll, we'll show where that shows up. Uh, there are, I believe, six divisions or six departments within the city that charge a portion of their budget to those enterprise funds. And again, we'll cover that when we get to those, those uh, departments and enterprise funds. Questions? So that's why you can get away with saying there's a net uh, department ex operation expense of zero because you're basically taking it, right? Charging other departments. <clears throat> yeah. um, there is only one department within public works that has any property tax support, and that's equipment services, uh, and a small part of the airport. And we'll we'll discuss that here shortly. Uh, one of the things that I want to uh, bring out is in regards to our community. Um, I skipped over this, I was gonna start out with this. So these are the population trends uh, going back uh, to 1900 for, um, we, we grabbed um, some communities that were, were kind of similar to Waverly, uh, but uh, what we see here is Waverly continues to steadily grow while some other communities have, have kind of faltered, flatlined, or have decreased in, in uh, population. There are 947 cities in the state of Iowa that are incorporated. Of those, 490 are less than 500 in population, okay? Waverly's 2010 census population was 9,874, which makes us the 39th largest city in the state of Iowa. Um, I'm projecting that the 2020 census will put Waverly's population at about 10,500 based off of uh, the new housing stock apartments that are coming, continue to come online. Uh, that will, um, that census count will uh, impact our FY 21-22 budget. So it takes about a year after the census, year and a half before it starts to show up in your in your budgets. That becomes important when we start talking about road use tax allocations. Uh, in addition to our uh, census population, we have uh, anywhere between 1,400 and 1,600 Wartburg students. Uh, most of those do not show up in our census, so we are actually functioning of a community that is, is maybe another 1,000 to 1,500 in, in size. Right. So, Mike, do uh, college towns typically count the student enrollment as part of their population, or do they always list them with an asterisk? We don't get to decide. The students get to decide where they um, have their place of residence uh, in regards to the census. So, um, like I said, most are not going to show up in our census, even though we, we encourage that. So you're saying most students are going to say, I, I really live in New Hampton or Des Moines or something. They live with mom and dad. <laughs> so now there are, my daughter was yeah. a Warburg student, so it didn't really matter. She was going to be in, 
included in Waverly's population one way or another. Um, engineering division is, is the next one. And so we have uh, three full-time staff within the engineering division. We have uh, two engineering techs and um, a, a, a secretary. Um, I don't know if that's acceptable terminology anymore, administrative assistant. Um, but uh, uh, she does um, a lot of the mailings as well as um, uh, a lot of the administrative stuff um, that is, is even somewhat outside of, of the engineering. And I think in a year from now, we're going to have a discussion about pulling her in under Public Works Administration so that we can allocate a portion of her um, salary to the Solid Waste Department because she uh, receives a lot of calls and does a lot of work as it relates to people that uh, may want uh, temporary dumpsters or special collections or uh, uh, are signing up for containers and those types of things. So that, that's about a year away, but traditionally, historically, that administrative person has been assigned to the engineering division. And um, uh, we, this is also where we have um, a, a permanent uh, part-time uh, retired engineer that comes in and helps us uh, as needed. So he doesn't have any official or set hours. Uh, we work together, uh, assign him projects where he's able to help out, provide assistance, and that uh, also carries over into the summer with the, the project inspection. That's been extremely beneficial for us. Uh, he's uh, committed to being here through the 2019 summer, um, but again, he's retired, so uh, at some point he may decide enough is enough and, um, and become a full-time retiree. But uh, he's been very helpful and beneficial. So uh, I used to be able to say that uh, within the engineering department we could uh, break our projects into ones that we uh, design, administer, and inspect in-house. Um, we would then have about a third of the projects where we'd have uh, consultants do the design work but we would do the inspection administration in-house. And then on, on the other, uh, the extreme side is, is very complex, very time-consuming technical projects where we would have the consultant do the design and the project administration. So we think of like the Cedar River Parkway or the wastewater treatment facility. Uh, kind of that one in between uh, would be like Cedar Lane. Uh, we hire a consultant to do the design work, but we anticipate doing the project inspection administration in-house. Again, we are going to uh, assign our, our time to those projects as, as we are in, involved on those projects. And uh, so again, <clears throat> uh, we have, uh, you'll see in the budget where uh, it's an allocation to the project, so we are actually billing our time to those projects, almost like you, a consultant would, would do it in that respect. The portion of their um, wages and time that we are not able to assign to a specific project, uh, we then split 50-50 between water and sewer. Okay. So, Mike, Mike, can you give uh, give us <clears throat> an example of a project where the city manages it all together, the design and the inspection? Bituminous seal coating, slurry seal, sidewalk program. Um, those are ones that we, we do in-house from beginning to end. Um, page two. So if you can zoom in, we put it down to the bottom here. I want to see right here. So you're, you're no, I want to, I want. You want over here? I want to be able to see over right here. here. So you'll see that uh, um, we're, um, we've had, we've been as high as uh, 60, 70,000 on, on allocating our time to projects. Uh, we're budgeting about 50,000, so the balance of that, 100, about 135,000 will be assigned to water, 135,000 to sewer. Okay. So we get involved in like uh, development projects. 
uh, new sub subdivisions or those types of things. We, we are inspecting the infrastructure being installed, but we are not recovering any of our, of, of our time. So we assign it uh, to the water and sewer divisions. Questions? So it looks like there's been a significant jump from say 2016, 2017, compared to the last couple of years. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the allocation of water and sewer kind of as my guideline. Yeah. Is that just our aggressive infrastructure projects or what else might be? No, that's showing up down, down here. And this is um, Jenny or James, if you want to describe what was going on here. Uh, so I see, uh, so a lot of the difference may have been the city was picking up the difference and now it's being... If you if you go to the first page up here under uh, personnel costs, there are three items that have a 112 account number that's in bold. So FICA, IPERS, and group insurance. Mm -hmm. And those were being pulled out and uh, assigned to employee benefits, which shows up as as uh, a property tax general fund expenditure. So. That's absolutely right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that was not, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it, it, it shows, it comes out of the special revenue fund for employee benefits and it showed here it, and Mike does not take that out of, in the end, it is paid out of here and not out of the employee benefits because it's taken off from the employee benefits then. And that isn't what we were doing before? Okay. It, 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 it occurred in 1718. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't being done before and we're not doing it going forward. So. Mm -hmm. um, Again, those will all be covered by uh, enterprise funds or, or allocation to projects. When you look at the water and sewer funds and you look at the traditional use of them, they are to encapsulate everything that is related to water and sewer, and that would include employee benefits. So at the time we were accounting for it, you know, we had it that all employee benefits are going to go into the employee benefit fund. Well, in theory, it should go into the water fund, sewer fund, because that's the people that do the water and sewer. And so it was an accounting difference of how you do it. We decided that this is probably going to be the more proper way to do it going forward. So that's the reason there's a irregularity there. So Mike, the breakdown of the, the funds there, would you say that's how your time is allocated? I mean, do you spend a third of your time that you focus on public works in each of those departments and then a smaller proportion of your time doing engineering? Or how would you say your responsibilities are broken down? It, that it sense? varies tremendously. And uh, so we, we get into this time of year, uh, probably 50% of my day for probably two months maybe related to um, budget preparation and, and, and management and planning uh, in those respects, as well as my, my office manager. Um, it, it varies depending on what time of year it is. Um, so uh, again, we get into get involved in, in uh, spending, uh, uh, again, at different times throughout the year. Uh, getting involved on on development projects, and, and none of that is is time that's recoverable. So, where where do you assign it to? Um, so, in public works admin, we split it three ways between water, sewer, solid waste. Uh, those are um, we we don't we don't split any of out to road use tax. Okay, and yet there is a fair amount of our time that is street related, but we do not um, allocate it that way. So this is, a lot of this has been, uh, it's been done this way for many, many decades. Uh, we have made some 
some adjustments. Uh, it was six years ago that we uh, stopped assigning a portion of it to to the uh, the general fund. So um, we we simply said let's let's assign it to the enterprise funds. Is it? Exactly a third, third, third. No, uh, you'll see that other divisions, they may assign 6%, 7%, 9% uh, to an enterprise fund. Those are kind of best guesses as to, yes, they are certainly involved, like the accounting department. They take care, ter care of all the purchase orders and, and paying of the bills for the water, sewer, and solid waste division. So it, it's very appropriate for them to assign a portion of their costs to these enterprise funds. Uh, we think the percentages um, on average from year to year are probably in the ballpark. It's kind of what we discussed early on. It's either going to be through fees or through taxes. And which way do you want to have it show? Either way, one of those two are going to absorb it. And so you try to allocate the best that you can. So a lot of it is, we know we're going to do about this much of project work, and then the balance is formulated as best you can get it. So we know it's not that fine-tuned, but it's about the best cut you can make on it. Any other questions on engineering? We'll jump into general infrastructure. Um, so a big part of general infrastructure maintenance is, is uh, where we see uh, the street lighting. It's a pass-through from Waverly Utilities. Um, it's approximately $275,000, $280,000 a year. Uh, it's basically just a pass-through, so whatever the expense is, that's what they will, will show up as the revenue. So then we get down to... Um, the other major items in here are going to be the. Um, I gotta get the right. Uh, electric for street uh, traffic signals, entrance signs, and then also uh, uh, we get down to the very bottom here under contract services. We have the USGS river gauge uh, that we uh, share the cost in, and then uh, the maintenance supplies and some uh, routine maintenance work on the inflatable dam. And one item that is, is new this year is interdepartmental charges for um, vegetation management, and um, this is where it's going to get a little confused, maybe a little, maybe a lot confusing and, and complex here because uh, when we get to the road use tax uh, budget, you'll only see one revenue source, road use tax receipts. That is the only uh, revenue source that I guess can legally be shown in, in the road use tax budget. So. Um, if you look up above under general infrastructure maintenance revenues, we have uh, uh, interest income from the reserve, the cash reserves in road use tax. That interest income shows up here, not in the road use tax, as well as um, the contract we have to do the snow removal on Bremer Avenue and 4th Street Southwest. When the DOT pays us for, for those uh, services, uh, that is uh, being deposited here uh, as a revenue. Uh, fuel taxes, uh, state fuel tax reimbursements. So all the uh, fuel that the street vehicles use, it shows up as an expense in road use tax, but when we get reimbursed for those state fuel taxes, the revenue is put into the general infrastructure maintenance. So um, sale of assets, if we sell a vehicle, a, a, a street vehicle, again, those revenues cannot go into the road use tax budget. They show up here in the general infrastructure maintenance. So if we add all of those up, it should equal 
the interdepartmental charge that is being transferred to vegetation management. Okay. So <clears throat> the street department is helping support the Department of Vegetation Management because they have now taken over all the roadside vegetation mowing and maintenance. Uh, they have also taken over um, responsibility for the trees and the boulevards. Now, we certainly help out during the winter time, but uh, the Vegetation Management Division has been tasked with those so that our staff, our resources, like during the summer, can focus more on streets rather than mowing uh, roadsides, okay? So this is how that, um, a portion of that support is, is being um, budgeted. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions later on about how this all works. Again, I, I can help, or James or Jenny in Oh, Mike can help. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of the little candy hearts, we need a bottle of aspirin. <laughs> <laughs> These aren't the candy hearts. Your detail sheet here, um, again, one of the uh, big ones here is like miscellaneous contracts. Uh, these detail, account detail sheets really kind of help explain some of those line items because there, there may be half a dozen or more things that, that are, are part of that total that you see on that. And this helps explain that. Mm -hmm. Real quick question on the river gauge. I know yes. that like when uh, TV stations and that will put river flood stages out, they don't use Waverly. And is that because of the, the dam and not being reliable, that type of thing? It, 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 it gets... The, the National Weather Service, I, I think we're to the point where we could, and that the, the National, working with the National Weather Service, we, we could start having those, those discussions with them. Um, the thing that's challenging is that when, when, we, when we start to flood, where do we start to flood? And that, that's where it, it's a lot of communication that has to take place. And, and I think that we have enough history, we have enough comfort level that we can now look at having that discussion with the National Weather Service um, and that uh, they are able to, to forecast um, Waverly's uh, river level above the dam uh, as uh, where the gauge is and, and do that reliably. I think that we have that comfort level, I think they have that comfort level um, the impact area is going to be southeast. Uh, the area that's going to be affected at first is going to be 7th Avenue southeast. It is occasionally get questioned on why we continue to pay the fees yeah. for that. I, to me, it's, we would lose a lot uh, locally if we didn't have that. So it, it's well worth the, f the fee to, to give us the local intel that we need. And I, I, I think it provides tremendous value. Um, I look at it literally daily because for me it's a quick reference to see uh, our river level stable. Um, to you know, it helps me in in understanding is is the dam functioning the way it's supposed to be on a daily basis. I know there are a lot of recreational users that use the site because it gives the temperature of the water as well as the velocity of the water. So there are benefits that are used daily that have nothing to do with flooding. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next one, equipment services. Okay. So before you jump in, we had talked about um, taking a very brief break at 10 o'clock and then jumping into Heritage Day's Senior Center and the Chamber so we can get them in and out. And then what we can pick up uh, right when Mike left off, the equipment services after we address those two. So, uh, that be acceptable, sir. About a five minute break to just stretch. All right, thank you, sir. Good work. 10 05, 10 06. Get back and we'll jump into Heritage Days and see you soon.
Please in the back, or it's maybe easier to click online to get to that. But um, do you know what color it is? Orange. Uh, we'll say salmon. Yeah. Something okay. like that. I'm not really good with my gray. color wheel. It's coral. Coral. It's oh, got it. It's orange. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, we should mention. Apparently, there's some problems with the video. So Pete Lampy just stopped in to tell the video person that the colors are pretty apparently brown and you we're can't see things psychedelic. On. All the audio is good, but the video nerd. has problems. So they're going to work on that. That's all right. I like that. It's really Look at this cosmic. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll jump right in. Uh, first up would be the senior center. You know, we have represented here. I'm going to chat with you for a minute about the senior center request. Thank you for asking. You bet. You bet. You want me to tell you who I am? I do. Okay. My name is Cindy Campbell, and I'm the president of the Waverly Senior Center. Outstanding. And so at the Senior Center, you request funds from the city itself. What do those funds go to? What are the operations that you kind of use for? We use most of the funds that come from the city for operations uh, to help defer costs for utilities, phone, uh, internet, uh, minor repairs, uh, the, the kind of operational experience, uh, expenses that a lot of times you cannot get grant money for. Okay. Snow removal. So I have Just the pleasure of being the city council liaison to the senior center board, and they have a very active volunteer board. They use that center for a lot of different activities, outreach to seniors, social activities, meals on wheels, um, and they're now partnering with other nonprofits to raise money. So it's an impressive board. Um, they keep good track of their finances and uh, put a lot of hours of labor into making the senior center more accessible and more visible in the community. So I think it's a very good investment of our dollars and they have not asked for any increase in funding for several years, so. Uh, and we are having an opportunity, the, it's still kind of in the works, but as we try to step away from the concept that we are an old folks home, uh, we actually have an opportunity where we think we have a Boy Scout troop coming in to use our workshop our woodworking yeah. shop. So we're kind of finishing up the details on that, but looking not just to focus specifically on seniors, although that is our primary, looking for ways that seniors can reach out to others in the community and different age groups. Well, Cindy, I, I want to second what uh, Ann said. Uh, is is the center facility, a, is that a, a city facility or do you own your own building? And are We you own our own building. It's yep. a nonprofit, but it is supported by the city. A number of years ago when I was on city council, it was struggling very, very badly. And they had approached city council to uh, see about some support funding, which at the time uh, Mayor Ackerman said that needed to be done, but you you had to have a council person serve on the board for a year to kind of get the feel of it. And um, so, and then the response back from city at that time was, well, you're not doing any fundraising. That's what you need to do is to get actively going with that. And so we uh, did two or three of them that were very successful. And now we have a very, uh, as Ann was saying, a very uh, interested and active board. And, and we write several grants and we have a good committee for that as well. That's what I was going to say. I was given the opportunity to be the liaison my first year on the council, and uh, it was a struggling organization. So you've done a, a great turnaround in six, seven years, and it's one of those hidden gems in the community that's starting to shine. So. No, we really credit the city, uh, the the money that they helped us with and went ahead and, and uh, put us in as a line item in their budget made a big difference. That was substantial, and this will be as well. Cindy, do you want to say something about the cafe, too, the 506 Cafe? Well, the 506 Cafe will celebrate its second year in April and has uh, really blossomed. It has done very, very well. We are going into a second round of uh, uh, collaboration with friends of the family. They will be joining us for February, March, and April. And then the Waverly Lions Club will be for May, June, and July. And we have another group that's uh, contacted us for beyond that. So that's been very, very good because it also... Um, 
we have a great facility in which to do that, good parking, and it is helping other nonprofits, so we also feel like we're, we're giving back to the community with that. And that is also for all age groups. And so it's the first Tuesday of every, every month. We take January off, so our next one's coming up here soon. Okay. Any other questions, comments from the council? Outstanding. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, next we'll uh, jump into uh, Heritage Days. I know we have a couple of uh, representatives there as well. Yeah, come on up, introduce themselves. You do have a pretty extensive letter from um, uh, Darwin and uh, Jess Hamilton that kind of outlines the fair to sell for the, or, or the heritage days, the process, the things they've done, the fundraising, et cetera. And so uh, if you want to get in, introduce yourselves and we'll have conversations. Hi, my name is Julie Knipe and I am the treasurer for Waverly Heritage Days. And this uh, is Dave Knipe. He handles all of the, um, I don't know, Beverages. Beverages. <laughs> My favorite guy, right? Sure. Favorite guy. And I'm only here by default because Darwin had a funeral today and Jessica had a hockey tournament in Dubuque, so I'll do my best. To you got the best of the deals, though, I think, coming here. So, so I'm also the request the, is uh, I'm, for $6,000, yep. um, a slight increase from last year. And if you look at the um, collections of donations, sponsorships, it's kind of part of the funding they get. So, uh, Council, if you have comments, questions. Thank yeah, you I'm a liaison as well. to this committee. I have to say this is the hardest working committee group I have ever seen. Um, they run a lean operation, and they work all year round to plan Heritage Days and make it um, for the most part, a free event for the community. Um, and uh, they've asked for a slight increase this year. Mainly that's due to the cost of a generator to provide electricity power for the bigger stage. Um, also looking at improving um, uh, fireworks displays and just making it a more variety uh, of events for all ages. So I think it's a a deserved increase in funding. It brings in a lot of people from out of town and, and heard nothing but compliments last year about the event. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. Do you know how long it's been since we increased our donation? Gosh, do you know? It's been steady at 5000 It's for been 5000 for years. a number of years. As a matter of fact, the last time we came was when it went from like two or 3000 to 5000 I don't, I think 2014-ish. Mm -hmm. And we are always doing things to try to bring in more money. One of the things we started several years ago was the color run, and that has grown progressively every year. Last year, our attendance was 300 people for that. So that's bringing people again to town. We're also looking at adding another fundraiser possibly this spring. They do the can collection. Um, that's successful too. And then they're, you know, out seeking donations. The, yes. the local businesses are very supportive. Couldn't be done without them. And then private individuals as well. So, yeah. And I think the, the improvements, you know, to the stage, the setup last year um, made the bands that performed last year want to come back. They were very impressed with that setup. Um, that the band lineup this year, I think, is identical pretty much to pretty last close. year. Pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. Yeah. And we had, you know, got feedback that people wanted more food vendors, more variety. That was increased last year. We but had people come just to try out the new food vendors. Yeah. So that was really nice. So I think it's been a really successful venture. It's a, it's a fun group of people to work with. Is the uh, is the can collection a significant part of income, or is it uh, kind of an auxiliary effort? It's an auxiliary effort, but it does bring in you know anywhere to, from five. It can bring five to eight hundred dollars a month in. So oh. that's nothing to sneeze at. Those are yeah. more activities. So. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to keep everything free for the public. I mean, we've talked about charging people to come to the concerts, but once you start charging, you limit the people who can attend, mm -hmm. and we don't want to do that if we can avoid it. So. Probably should charge for the beverages, though. <laughs> Obviously, that is that is a true statement. <laughs> Mike, we were so close. We were so close, to, so close. Well, the other people that are so helpful are the city staff. Yes. You know, leisure services, public works, the law enforcement. Um, you know, they're very helpful, and, and uh, the event couldn't go on without no. their assistance, too. It would be too much work for the volunteers. Yeah. So. 
Okay. Other comments, questions? Just tackle what's been said that it is a great event and uh, glad that the cooperation between the city and, and your group is, is positive and yes. hope that it keep, continues. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then the uh, other group we have here, we have uh, Travis Tolliver, the executive director of the chamber. You gotta hunt for this one a little bit. Um, you have to go through the TIF packet, pass the gray paper, and into the, uh, what did we just set? Coral. coral. Thank you, coral paper as well, and that will be where the chamber starts. The request itself is in the hotel motel tax budget, and so we'll hit that as we go through that particular one, but the packet materials in the coral portion of the TIF category, even though it's not TIF funded, so. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, gee, after hearing that, I want to put a can receptacle out by the chamber office. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Just to be respectful of your time, I'm going to, uh, oh, by the way, I'm Travis Tolliver. I'm the executive director for the Chamber of Commerce and Main Street program. I uh, want to thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council, City staff for, for having me here this morning. Uh, just to be respectful of your time, I want to go through some highlights from 2018 and then talk a little bit about what's coming up in 2019. So uh, in 2018, probably the most notable accomplishment that we uh, worked on was working with the city and the DOT, WHKS, and Skyline to finish the road project um, and it um, was was an uh, interesting two years um, but I'm happy to say that we had a hundred percent business retention we didn't have some businesses that closed or relocated but they weren't solely because of the, the road project and in fact we actually increased businesses uh, you'll see there that uh, I listed a few partially picked boutique catalyst yoga studio the butcher block pokies and the mixing bowl to name a few and these are all along Bremer Avenue so they were all affected at one point or another by the road project, so that was um, a great achievement. Uh, the Chamber assisted all businesses along Bremer Avenue with regards to the road project, not just Chamber members. We felt that that was worthy because this is a great big project and we wanted to make sure that everybody had assistance. We partnered with Downtown Professionals Network again to bring in a, a workshop to help businesses prepare for the second half of the, of the, the project and uh, these are professionals that know about road construction and how to uh, keep businesses uh, thriving and surviving during a, a time like that. Uh, we also employed uh, our business liaison, Paula Stevenson, who worked with uh, all um, uh, businesses and building owners with regards to the project. She was a great uh, mediator between uh, the DOT, between WHKS, Skyline. Uh, she was really that point person that we really needed to have throughout the community, and, and your extra dollars in the last couple of years have, have helped with, with her assistance. We also invested in wayfinding signage uh, that was not provided by the DOT to make sure that people uh, found their way around and was able to park. Uh, was able to uh, find their way to the, the businesses that were uh, being affected by the road project. And finally, uh, we added additional marketing and advertising efforts to, uh, to the city to make sure that people uh, were still wanting to come to Waverly to shop, to eat, uh, and to, to play. So uh, definitely the most notable of uh, 2018. Uh, after that, I uh, wanted to let you know too that the, the Chamber's Board uh, did unanimously approve uh, funding our uh, annual facade improvement grant. Uh, we have upped this, uh, this amount from 2000 to 4000 two years ago uh, to make sure that we were able to provide enough money for businesses that wanted to do more work on their building facades. And um, I think also too towards the last half of the, the year, uh, working with city staff and Echo Development in order to be able to acquire a, a Main Street Iowa Challenge Grant for $75,000 towards the Waverly Palace Theater Project, uh, which you know will include two theaters, a food and beverage concept on the lower level, and then upper story, we have 12 living units. Uh, so adding more urban living to our downtown environment. On the Main Street side of things, uh, I always like to give these statistics every year. We have 138 Main Street District businesses, 37% uh, of which are retail, 42% of which are service-based, and 21% are food and beverage. There are 251 full-time employees and 322 part-time employees in the district. That makes a total of 573 employees, making Waverly's Main Street District the largest employer in the community. 
Approximately 347 residents live within the Main Street District, and we have a total taxable building value of just over 14 million. Our 2019 action plans, uh, we want to uh, basically finish the road construction project, uh, put a capstone on it by completing a streetscape project. I'm not gonna steal too much of Bill's thunder uh, with that, but uh, to let you know that it's uh, really important that we that we look into uh, investing the last part of our street. Uh, right now, you know, the road looks great. It's uh, It's got uh, everything fixed underneath, but right now it's really naked without the trees and the planters and the, the bench trash receptacles, those kinds of things. And so we're looking to uh, continue those efforts to finish off that project. Uh, also, too, uh, the Chamber's 2019 initiative is starting to implement the process of wayfinding throughout the entire community. Uh, this has been on the city's to-do list, I think, for several years now. And uh, we are actually going to take uh, in initiatives to start making that happen. So uh, really excited about that. And then um, looking at also, too, our design committee is going to be looking at adopting some design guidelines for our downtown district. This will be guidelines that building owners and business owners can take a look at and see what our vision is for a, I am, uh, an ideal looking downtown, historic downtown district. Uh, again, these would be guidelines. They wouldn't be uh, standards. And we just hope that people would take a look at them and, want to, and when they want to invest in their building or their facade, that they would take a look and see what we'd be thinking about as far as an ideal uh, design for them. Uh, obviously working with Echo Development and continuing that effort to make sure that the Waverly Palace Theater project continues to, um, to be worked on and, and hopefully completed soon. And then enhancing our Main Street District uh, by partnering with the Qantas Club. We're going to be looking at uh, getting Santa a new house in Coleman Park, which will be great. Uh, also working with city staff to uh, take a look at South Riverside Park. Mm -hmm. And then uh, working with Cohen Esri to, uh, for the completion and the promoting of the Waverly Historic Lofts in the old CUNA building. Our strategic initiatives, again, we, uh, uh, we want to just keep looking at uh, the return on investment for our members, uh, adding value to, to their membership, uh, finding different ways that we can do that, uh, continuing to promote Waverly as, promote Waverly as a destination uh, for recreation, dining, shopping, and living, uh, working on small business economic development in tandem with uh, the city's economic development uh, department. Uh, we're obviously increasing volunteer participation through our boards and committee members, maintaining financial, stable, efficient fiscal management, and continuing to promote all aspects of the city and the Chamber of Commerce and educating the public on what we do. We host a lot of community events that add to the quality of life uh, to Waverly. Some of those are Art, art Walk, Concerts in Corman, Coleman, excuse me, Ridiculous Days, Fall Fest, and Christmas Greetings on Main. We also offer an extensive amount of member uh, opportunities for people to connect and learn uh, with Learn Over Lunch, Waverly Connected, Chamber After Hours, and our uh, Chamber Annual Awards Celebration and Golf Outing. Our Vines and Stein Fall Fundraiser continue, both the Golf Outing and the Fundraiser continue to be great efforts of uh, income for us. And then, uh, um, lastly, just with the, uh, the unrelenting support of the Chamber, and I, I just want to say thank you very much for your extra um, dollars for the last two years um, with regards to our request. Uh, those, those dollars did go to help, I think, uh, help maintain a strong business community during, during the road project. And so you'll look and see that our um, request has gone back down uh, to 45000 uh, This constitutes 25000 of which uh, the city is contractually obligated to fund the Main Street program through IE EDA and Main Street, Iowa. 10,000 of it goes to reflect the, the city's uh, membership with the chamber uh, to keep the, the supporting our operations and, and our existing programs. And then 10,000 of it goes to uh, support the tourism efforts that we do on behalf of the city. Speaking of tourism, uh, you'll see there your 2018 tourism information and accomplishments. Uh, with hospitality packets, we had 7,179 welcome bags and hospitality packets that went, th uh, that went through uh, our, our office, and that was an increase of 53 packets from 2017. Our visitor relocation packets uh, in 2018, we had a monthly average of 48 uh, that were sent out, and this is fairly consistent with what we've had in years past. Our visitor guides and brochures, we had uh, distributed over 20,176 visitor guides and brochures, uh, and this was an increase of 78 guides and brochures as compared to 2017. Bus tours and groups, 
Uh, we gained eight bus tours and groups this year, in 2000, or last year in 2018, and we are continuing to try to see how we can make more tours come through Waverly. And finally, advertising, uh, we were able to track 504 direct requests uh, from this year's uh, Eastern Iowa Visitor's Guide advertisement, along with other publications, which was up from 2017. And with um, in-depth social media campaign, uh, an increase in that, we've uh, had over 998,500 people in our region who had an opportunity to view or hear chamber advertisements and consider visiting Waverly to shop, dine, and stimulate our economy. After that, I've included the tourism work plan. And you can take a look at that. It's uh, a uh, roughly the, the same plan that you received last year. Just keep increasing the numbers as we can with hospitality packets, visitor relocation packets, visitor guides and brochures, our bus tours, and all of our printing and co-op advertising. And now I'll entertain any questions you might have. Charles, could you remind me what the boundaries are on the main street? Yeah, good question. So it's on, I, did, I believe it's 5th Street on the west side to fourth, to 7th Street on the east side. No, sorry, let me have said that backwards. 5th Street on the east side, 7th Street on the west side. And just a couple of blocks north and south of it. Yes, thank you, Bill. <laughs> The main street also includes the, the rail trail bridge as well, so going up first and then cutting back through the rail trail bridge, so that falls in the historic district. Sorry, Dan. Maybe just a, a question or an idea. Uh, we appreciate, or I appreciate seeing the funding request go down because, again, that was seen as a one-time or a couple-year contribution. I'm just wondering, I, I know there's continued discussions about facade improvement. I'm wondering if there's a possibility to roll that 5,000 into some type of match, some way for the city to help with some facade improvements in the downtown. That type of thing. We've got a pretty good size help plan uh, coming up this afternoon. We are going to look to to have a pretty substantial chunk of facade improvement, at least asked for by the city to assist in that, mm -hmm. basically any matching program as well. Um, I know the chamber's done it for a number of years, and we're hoping to amplify that okay. significantly. Because there are a lot of buildings that, you know, they really want to do a dramatic overhaul of their outside, but even four or 5,000 may not do it. Right. And they are cornerstone places that would really benefit from that, and really kind of change that, that focus in the entire downtown. So we're going to look at that as how it folds into everything else with Streetscape and all the other projects and see if the council can or cannot fund something like that. But we will certainly talk about that request this afternoon. There's no a lot of effort went into making back doors accessible between uh -huh. sprucing them up, alley work, that type of thing. So uh, that, you know, again, with parking being in the rear of the building, it just seems like a natural fit if we can help with those type of things. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll say, because I'm not going to be here when it's presented, though, that the, the option that's going to be presented uh, would really help uh, businesses, like James said, be able to, to do a lot more effort than what we're able to afford. The $4,000 that we offer every year gets split up between you know, three or four businesses each year. So you can imagine uh, how that kind of breaks off. And it's, it's not much, but at least it helps. But the, the program that's going to be presented uh, later on today or, or whenever is going to uh, possibly help dramatically change uh, the face of downtown. Travis, in your uh, <clears throat> conversations with the uh, um, merchants along Bremer Avenue, mm -hmm. what have you heard about how they have fared in the midst of all of the Bremer Avenue confusion, which evidently is over now, but uh, have we had any casualties? Are people bouncing back okay, do you think? Yeah, no casualties, and nobody died during the process from what I, what I know. Um, just a, a informal questioning, no real uh, scientific data or anything like that. The average uh, business owner was telling me that they lost anywhere between 10 to 30 percent of business during the road construction project. Obviously, that depends on their location and how long they were affected by the project. Um, um, but that seems to be the average just talking with folks on the street. Mm -hmm. So not near, I mean, it's, it's, it's not good, but it's not nearly as bad as, say, in larger markets that lose anywhere between 50 to 70 percent of business during a, a, a similar project. So I did talk to one merchant right in the middle of the construction, and he said, yeah, this is really hard, but 
it's going to be worth it. Mm. And that seemed to be the consensus throughout town was that we were all focused on the on the end prize and what that was going to be and look like. And now here it is. So I think we need to be looking forward, though, again, uh, with a bridge yep. in a couple of years. Yep. So it's not over. <laughs> and do yep. everything we can to uh, help the businesses and support them. Absolutely. And we'll be working on that very mm -hmm. soon, for sure. You know, we've been spending some time talking about branding for Waverly. How is that working with your office? What do you have going on there with regard to the city of Waverly branding? Sure. Process? So um, I, I've been uh, a part of the uh, the Ambridge meetings along with Bill and Connie, and working with them to make sure that everything's you know flowing on the same page. And I think our idea is is to get some kind of branding effort and materials that could be used across the community. So not just with the chamber for tourism efforts and whatnot, but uh, any organization. That that wanted to help promote uh, Waverly. Certainly our businesses who are trying to recruit skilled workers to, to our community uh, would have access to all that uh, material. So I, I'm really excited to see where it goes. So is it true that we're going to be branding ourselves as Waverly, your happy place? <laughs> uh, I don't think that's been determined yet, has it, Bill? <laughs> I don't think so. But it is a happy place. I will say. <laughs> Do you have any estimates on when the historic loft, loft project will be finished or when the theater? The yeah, the historic the loft's uh, about a year, I think. Yeah, it'll be next year. Yeah. And then uh, the Palace Theater, my understanding is that they're going to start working on it here pretty soon. I know that the day after Christmas greetings on Main, they were in there doing some uh, excavating of uh, the, the project to see kind of where things were located and stuff. So they were kind of tearing things up in there. But um, yeah, it, hopefully it will be starting soon. And that could be anywhere between a year and a year and a half. At least they have the grant money for two years. So I know it's got to be done by September 21st of 2020. Could we get someone to take down that Merry Christmas sign and put up a Happy Valentine's Day sign? <laughs> I know, and I was the one that put those up there, uh, so I should probably take them down. <laughs> I just want to wait for it to stop snowing first. <laughs> Travis, I know that during your presentation and, and other communications, it appears that Chamber works primarily with downtown within the boundaries that you established from 5th to 7th or whatever it is. Well, you certainly don't ignore the outlying areas, I hope. No, and let me let me let me correct you. So when when Edie, when uh, Ann asked about the Main Street District, uh, that that's what I was defining was the the right. boundaries of the Main Street District. But the chamber is a community wide chamber. We want to support every business throughout the entire community. Although we do have downtown responsibilities through the Main Street program, every town that has a healthy downtown is a strong community, and so we want to make sure that we support both of those. Okay. And the Main Street parameters were defined when we joined Main Street, right? That's correct. In, in fact, I think they've increased twice. Mm -hmm. uh, this was before I came. But uh, it was a much smaller area, and then it's increased as the, the town has increased. So, uh, And then talking with uh, Rachel, it uh, looks like we might be looking at increasing it again just to take a look at some of the um, lots on the uh, the west side that want to be developed uh, that she's taking a look at and we might be even looking at uh, expanding that on that side so and if that's a uniqueness having the chamber and the main street mm -hmm. one organization sometimes people use the wrong label for right their mm -hmm. right and we were one of the very first communities to combine our chamber main street program and um luckily for me i don't know any difference so i think it works out really well um but there's uh there are times though when i see the advantages of having two separate organizations to be able to help better define that but i think we do a good job of trying to educate the community that we are we're trying to do the work of both downtown and the entire community Any other questions, comments, anything for Travis? It's just impressive that the determination of the business owners to mm -hmm. not close up shop, given what they've been through. So, absolutely, it's impressive. Well, you know, and a lot of business owners too told me that uh, they've been wanting this for such a long time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, to be able to, I think, mentally prepare for it and know that it was coming, and at some point it did, that they were really excited about the opportunity for it to happen. And they knew it was going to be coming out on the other side, which is going to be a beautiful street. Very good. Thank you, Travis. Great. Thank you.
Oh, and I, I forgot to mention too that in front of you, I gave you your um, chamber uh, and Main Street uh, business directories, and then uh, that's published every year. Uh, and then the the other publication is the Waverly uh, Visitors Guide, and that is published every two years. And so that's a new one there in front of you as compared to last year. And those are uh, some of the materials that we send out in relocation packets and visitors packets and whatnot. So I wanted you to be able to have an opportunity to look through those too. So. Very good. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> okay. We'll uh, now jump back into uh, the rest of Mike's first half of the budgets. Um, we'll get into uh, equipment services. And I'll kick that off. Shane, uh, maybe real quick. Yes, I, I know it's going through whatever color pages we just identified these to be that there was a request from the historic preservation. Do you want to hit that now? Or? Um, Come in later. Yeah, we don't have a representative here. I know Bill sits on that committee. Um, if, we, if we catch it later, that's fine. We, we can probably catch it later. It's a small request from them, a uh, historic preservation. Um, we'll, we'll catch that a little later then. If they had a representative, we definitely would have done that. But they just didn't have someone come in. So. Okay, yeah, well, yeah, Bill can tackle it when he does economic development. Okay. development. Thank you, Lou. All right, Mike, we're going to jump into equipment services. Yeah, so um, equipment services division, we have two employees uh, within that department. Um, and uh, what I like to do is uh, provide photos showing, contrasting what their facilities looked like before we moved out to the new place. And so um, this is the one that I, I have in the presentation here. So this is at the, the old facility. Uh, it kind of has the appearance of being kind of dingy and dark and and stuff. And I've got another one that I found later on. It's like, that's the one I should use. It's where they're working on ambulance. And because of the height restrictions in the building and stuff, they basically had to use a creeper to, to go underneath it. And so contrast the old facility with our new facility. And let's see, it's in here somewhere. Now th this is just one fourth of the shop at the new facility. So uh, they have the ability to take our largest piece of equipment, which is the uh, platform uh, truck uh, at the fire station, uh, 78,000 pound lift uh, that they can um, put the vehicle up on and they can walk right underneath it. And it's uh, very bright, well lit, a much, much better work environment. So uh, equipment services, two mechanics, as I said, we have over 140 pieces of motorized equipment. So this does not include trailers um, and, and mowers and such. This is motorized equipment. So anywhere from fire engines to garbage trucks, um, like we got over here, to dump trucks, pickups, police vehicles, ambulances, uh, a little bit of everything. Um, additionally, this year, we started doing routine maintenance on uh, some pieces of equipment for Waverly Utilities. This would not have been possible in the older facility, but with the new facility and uh, uh, the space that we have, uh, they asked us if we would uh, be able to take over just some routine maintenance work for them on their vehicles, like doing oil changes and inspections, uh, those types of things. And so on a, on a trial basis, we we started doing that, um, I think Brian was about six six months ago, or three, four, four to six months ago, we started started doing that. I think that's, that's worked out well. Do we charge for that? Yes, we do. Uh, equipment services, bills out for... Uh, their work as well as the equipment. You'll see in the budget that we buy about $100,000 a year in, in parts and supplies. And that is uh, functions almost like a pass-through. Some of them are stock items that, that we simply re replace, like oil filters and those types of things. But uh, for the most part, it's a pass-through. We have about $100,000 in, in parts that we bill out to the various departments, whether that's streets, solid waste, um, 
water, police, fire, ambulance, whatever it is. Additionally, we also uh, bill out for their labor. The remaining balance is then um, uh, shows up as a general fund expenditure. So that is a, a property tax support item. It is, is literally the only division within public works that receives property tax uh, uh, support for the operation. Kind of makes sense. Uh, we take care of police, fire, ambulance, parks, so there's a lot of uh, equipment that is, is outside an enterprise fund. Uh, we do have one uh, piece of equipment that is in the budget is to replace their their pickup truck uh, that they have. It is a 2011 vehicle, and that will be uh, the plan or proposal is to uh, transfer that to the street department, and the street department will um, uh, get rid of the old uh, paint truck that they have. So. When we get into doing our uh, painting operations, so you think of crosswalks, stop bars, those types of things, we like to use an older pickup because um, oftentimes um, if we throw down a template for uh, like a pedestrian crossing symbol or something like that, they then hang hang the, the template back on the side of the pickup so there may be wet paint on it. That's why we don't like to have a brand new pickup. So what we like to do is find a, a, a pickup that's maybe about eight years old in another department and transfer it over. So in this situation, it's the pickup from equipment services that we're proposing to move over into the street department and then equipment services would be getting uh, a brand new pickup. Okay. So, Mike, how many uh, vehicles does uh, equipment services have at any given time? I mean, obviously they have one well, pickup, but well, they have one pickup themselves, but they they take care of and service 140 pieces of equipment. Okay, so they don't really own a lot of equipment themselves. They they don't own any of it. It's in effect, it, it's city equipment. Uh, it is assigned to the various divisions acquired through those department budgets, um, and. Uh, we have some other departments that do some routine maintenance, but they also provide technical service as needed. For instance, uh, golf course parks may do some, some routine mower maintenance, um, but if there are issues that, that uh, come up mechanically, then, then we will uh, provide that support for them. So on, on the second page here down at the bottom, you see the allocation for labor, allocation for parts. Uh, we see, uh, uh, you'll see in water, sewer, solid w waste, and streets, they each do a flat transfer of $10,000, so the total is $40,000 um, of, of just a, a flat transfer. In addition, they, they then are also billed for parts and labor. So the uh, de net department expenditure is $133,000 this year, and that, that is um, through property taxes. Questions? Okay, move on to the road use tax. So the next uh, department we're looking at is road use tax. This is a chart I like to show. Now this one you have to kind of read from right to left. Uh, the most current year is on your left, 1718. And what this shows is, is our uh, snowfall events. This, uh, the website is down in the lower left. It's uh, usclimatedata.com. And this uh, uh, information is compiled for uh, the Waterloo area. That is the closest uh, city that has uh, uh, data uh, for snowfall events. So I think this is probably pretty representative for, for Waverly as well. And so, you know, I always like to ask, well, how many six inch snowfalls do we get in a year? And a lot of people say, oh, four or five. Well, historically, we, we average less than one. 
So last year, last spring was kind of the anomaly. But uh, from this, what we can see is that uh, typically um, we have uh, snowfall events that are uh, about five a year that are less than six inches, or excuse me, um, greater than three inches, um, about five a year that are greater than three inches. Um, the vast majority of our snowfall events, measurable snowfall events, are less than an inch. So um, I think like today is probably going to be one of those days. Uh, you get dusting and snow, it is measurable, maybe it's a tenth, two tenths. Uh, that's the majority of our events that we, we respond to. So this is helpful in deciding, well, how do we size our fleet? What, what uh, type of events do we uh, need to be able to uh, manage and work on? So um, uh, again, you can also say, well, we have about 10 snowfall events that are greater than one inch each year. So again, just uh, helpful information that we use for sizing our, our fleet. Okay, so um, that's helpful information. The other one that we like to track is, um, you know, we talked about uh, the population trend in Waverly. So this is telling us what's happening population-wise. The other charts that we like to uh, keep track of is what's happening to our infrastructure. And so uh, this one that you're, you're getting shows how uh, over the past 22, 23 years, uh, the water, sewer, and street infrastructure has grown. So we have about a 20% increase in the miles of street that we are maintaining. That is almost exclusively from new subdivisions. 20% since... What compared 96. to what? Excuse me? 20 percent higher compared to? So in 1996, you see we had about 55 of miles of streets that we were maintaining, and now uh, we're up to about 66, 67. The, the only new streets that the city has added have been the Cedar River Parkway. Okay. Otherwise, all the growth in the miles of streets has come from new residential subdivisions. Um, when we get to the water and sewer utilities, I'm going to refer you back to this because we have 40% growth in the miles of sewer and 45% in the miles of water main that we have within the community. So, um, but we're talking about streets and road use tax right now. So, um, we'll have Carla on uh, the road use tax budget. So like that. And I want to draw your attention to the very top line, which is the revenues. And as Jenny was indicating earlier, that the very top line here, the only revenue source coming into this account is shown as state receipts. Okay? That's the only revenue coming in. Take you all the way over to the right-hand side. And... Our revenue that is 100% from the state. We have no control over this revenue stream. It is based on population and it is an allocation per capita. And so you'll see that in FY20, um, they're estimating $121.50 per capita. Okay. In FY21, they're predicting a little bit higher and a little bit higher yet in FY22. Now, I mentioned earlier that we're predicting that Waverly is going to see a change in our census, uh, a positive change. And so we, we show that here in FY22 that our population uh, calculation for our road use tax revenues are going to probably be using a population closer to 10,500. You'll see that then in the revenues, how they jump from 
uh, 1.209,000 up to 1,291,000. So uh, Waverly is, again, very fortunate in that respect, but it's also needed because as our population is growing, the miles of streets is growing because of the new subdivisions. Okay. Mike, in the state receipts, 2018-19 was 1260 The proposed 1920 is $70,000 less. Yes. Back to where it was in 1819. Okay. What's the reasoning? When we budget, we use the information that comes from the Iowa League. We are now uh, six months in, into the, the fiscal year 1819. Six months in, you should be, say, at 50%. We're at 58% of our revenue. Because these are um, budget estimates, and actual road use tax receipts are based on, on sales or uh, fuel tax revenues. So, in reality, the numbers they put out there are careful, and we actually tend to do better than their, their forecast. So, again, for budget purposes, in 1819, uh, we were at 1,199,000, but the revenues that we're actually receiving from them project us at one point. 1,260,000. But based off of the Iowa League forecast for FY20, we're back to about 1,200,000. Okay. The state will do a multi year projection of where they think road use tax fund's going to go, and they reset that every year. So even the numbers we see today, next year they may say, no, 21's going to be 121 now still. As you see the adjustment, you get to more fuel efficiency, your electric car someday, it will impact this at some point. But they do reset it and readjust it. As Mike said, we can go off what they tell us so we don't get a little anxious about we're thinking to get a bunch more, we're going to plan for it. We go off the numbers they give us, that's the best measure we have. And if it's a little extra, we put it in our fund balance and we're able to utilize it next year knowing that we have a little additional for other equipment. But that's the best we can go off is what the league will provide us, and it will shift every year. So mm -hmm. four years ago, fiscal 21 may have been a different number than they're showing now because things change, et cetera, as they move forward. But then it looks like, I mean, then it looks like at least for this one year, and I don't know if that's a historical trend, we project actually then at this point in time higher than the right. number that we started yep, with budget. trending that way yeah but again in the end it may fall off yeah. the cycles and that's kind of the hard part and then it's a matter of when we receive it too so but no it's that's the best we can do is know what we know versus what we hope or we think might happen because it does cycle is it received in one lump sum or throughout the year monthly, monthly. It's, it's received monthly based off of actual Receipts. driver consumption yep statewide uh, fuel tax that is then allocated based on a, a formula. This isn't doesn't have anything specific to do with Waverly. Correct. This is statewide fuel tax that the state then that, allocates. That, that's correct. So what they do is they take um, the amount of revenue they receive, divide it by the population, and and then distribute it to each community based off of on your population. That, that population and, is and that's why month to month is going to vary depending on how much revenue they sure. get in. Right. Does the population is based on the census. decennial census? Yes. So that's why every that's time right that through. census comes through, it's a nice So we want to make sure we have everybody fills Counted. out their census form and sends it back. This is why the students, if we can. <laughs> if we can. Yeah. Right, because it's $120 per person right. every year, year after year. So if you want to name your cat and start sending a mail. <laughs> <laughs> Not advocating, so, but if you'd like to do that, it'd be very nice. So, so if we get all of these Wartburg students to declare Waverly to be their resident, it's going to help the city uh, financially, right? Well, this, this this is why the census is a very big deal, and it's not just about Wartburg; it's also about Bartles and and yeah, right. making sure that um, you know people have 
uh, you know, are saying Waverly is their place of residence. That's so, the, so the population shift year to year doesn't affect this. It's just until the next census, then you find out what you're going to get the next time. Low and sales tax also impacted by the census. So but it is that, a very big issue for us financially and a couple major funds that we utilize. So then that figure is going to apply for 10 years. Yes. Now, now you can, if you're growing very rapidly, there are some communities that will pay to do a special census count maybe right. after five years. If you're looking at a couple hundred additional people or, or you know, a few hundred, is it worth it, not worth it, you know? That's tough. If you're a Waukee, though, and you're looking at thousands here, that you want to make sure you capture that. And so that's, again, it's possible, but we don't go through the effort knowing it's you know, 100, 200, something like that. Now, the census isn't tied to where they're registered to vote or where their driver's license yes. is. Is it? I mean, do they have to be registered where they... Well, it affects your ability to vote in the Waverly election. If you're in the ward. census? The wards change according to the census. The wards right, right, the wards change. But I mean, like, as an individual, if you're like a college student here, and you census here, but you can still be registered to vote back home, is that correct? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, aren't those kind of totally independent processes? I'm not sure about that. I, I think so. I don't. Okay. You have to vote where you're declared, because that's where they see Right. That's what technically, I think you're supposed to have the same. Yeah. But so I don't think okay. they could vote here yeah. if they're technically registered yeah. at home. But, but I mean, in the, in the census. Yeah, if they chose this as their residence in the census, they then there could vote here, but they can't vote at home. Right. Oh, I know it's, it's so, one or the other. Right. So they could, yes, say okay. this is where I'm going to be. And then when they get out of college, they can say, nope, now I'm at home now, okay. and I'm going to change that. But that wouldn't be in the census unless you're mm -hmm. in college for 10 years, I guess. You could do but that. You have, to, you have to update your registration yeah. so that you're registered to vote wherever your residence is. So actually, the, the process is something like state aid to public schools. Is that right? The census goes down, you so get less yeah. less money. Yeah. Schools is a yearly thing. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, one of the things I want to draw your attention to is on the right-hand side where it says 5% of state road use tax received minus the revenues in the general fund maintenance. So uh, this is the interdepartmental charge from from road use tax going towards vegetation management. So we're going to take uh, what we what we did is we we did an analysis of how much effort was going into roadside vegetation management. Uh, mowing and maintaining our rural ditches and roadsides. Uh, uh, tree trimming, those types of things. What what equipment did we have assigned to those functions? Bucket truck, tractor, pull behind mower. Uh, how much uh, time and effort personnel-wise goes into those functions? What do we have for operational expenses, uh, fuel, maintenance, depreciation on the equipment? And what we came up with is uh, the 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 road, what road use tax personnel had been doing and, and the equipment for, for that function was about $60,000 a year. So that is 5% of $1.2 million, okay, went towards that function. Personnel, equipment, and, and operational expenses. Those functions are now going to be addressed by the Division of Vegetation Management. They're going to take care of the roadside mowing of, of the shoulders and ditches, as well as doing the, the routine tree trimming to make sure we have, uh, uh, I think it's like 15, 16 feet of clearance above the roadway. They're going to take care of those functions for us. So what, we've, what we're doing here is we're taking $60,000. You go back to the um, general infrastructure maintenance, we said there was about $40,000 of revenue coming back in. Some of it was a part of a DOT maintenance contract. Some of it was 
uh, fuel tax, state fuel tax receipts or sale of assets coming back in. So we take the 60,000 minus those expenses and then we're going to come up with this expense right here. So this year it's about $19,000. So 60,000 minus the 40 gives us the 19. Uh, next year, it's uh, 60,000 minus uh, 35 in the general infrastructure maintenance, and that's how we come up with about 25,000 here. When we get to the new census numbers and the changes here, it's now going to be 5%. It's 5% of whatever the, set, the state uh, receipts are. Okay, that's how we've set it up. It's just 5% of whatever the road use tax fund receipts are. That's our contribution towards that function. Where do we get that 5% from? Is that based on our past or is that still? Yes, I just. Or, well, as opposed to the state says this is how much you get to spend on this. No. No. Okay. What we did is, is we went right. through okay. and we determined what equipment was being used for this, how much, um, you know, what was the value of that equipment, what's the depreciation schedule, what is the fuel and, and the maintenance. We, do and we have to worry time. about recalibrating that 10, 20 years down the road? Or how long are we going to be able to use this 5% I, number? I think it ought to be reviewed every five years. Okay. Okay. Because we have to legitimately be able to demonstrate mm -hmm. it's a reasonable number. You, you can't come in and say we're going to, we're going to take six hundred thousand dollars and give it to vegetation management or give it to the parks department. Okay, you have to have a reasonable number that okay. can be determined. I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask a mathematician's question: Is this uh, rounded off to the nearest percent, or how accurate is that number computed? Or, I mean, because 5% looks like a pretty conveniently rounded number. Yeah. Is it like really 5.2% or something? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, why well, say it, it, it yeah, okay. it's, it's a, it's he wanted more. <laughs> number. Okay. You could sit like, with Mike at lunch do? and discuss all this. You well, know? I mean, it, yeah. kind of a number is, is, is this something that was computed or was it something negotiated? So No, it was, oh, it was. You figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> so you start with the so 1.2 million. You start with the 1.2 million. You look at how much labor, equipment, etc., goes yeah. to roadside stuff. It, it was. It, it was turned out to be five percent. Sort of. Close to it right? was objectively okay. justified. Though. Justified. Okay. Um, tabs people determine how much time and effort they had been putting into it. We had uh, equipment services provide maintenance records on the equipment. Uh, we have um, uh, purchase or replacement pricing on equipment. And it is it is a little bit of a moving target, and, sure. and it's not going to be nailed down to, no, it's 5.2%. Okay. It, it's we think 5% is a reasonable number. We think it's a number that can be supported with, with some data. But from year to year, it, it, it's going to vary a little bit. Yeah. And not to muddy this more, but this is dependent upon the position they're looking to add and the equipment with it. Because without that, we have one individual. They can't do the tree trimming by themselves. They can't do much by themselves. So a lot of this is going to depend upon the other part of the vegetation management when we get to a TAPS presentation, because if that doesn't occur, then this may not be necessary because we only have, like I said, one person. And they're limited in what they can and can't do with the things that we're being assigned to them. So, so this, is a, this, this, is, this is assuming additional. Second person. That's yeah. how I'd have to read it, because yeah. I don't know that we oh, commit okay. extra funds to, to an adding, individual. This is assuming adding a person. Okay. Is that fair to say? Right. I mean, it. we'd love to have more money there as well, but again, with one body, it's going to be difficult to accomplish. Some of the things we're talking about, the tree trimming, and one person can only do so much safely, and that's yeah. where you have to borrow from other departments. Because so these numbers are based on hiring that. Additional. Some of it is, I think. Some. I don't necessarily 100 percent. And again, that's where you look at the importance of, and you'll see it in Tab's presentation. I don't want to belabor this, but when you see what's been accomplished with one person, the things we like to increase and go on as we add more and more responsibility to that area, we have to invest in that to make it continue. So well. Okay, so you have this chart here. Flip to the very last one. 
um, because this is, I think, relevant to this discussion here. I see James looking at his watch. Um, <laughs> Checking, sir's but watch coming eventually. This is over the past 40 years within public works. You know, I talked about 28 full-time employees and, and the like. Staffing numbers haven't changed. Okay, infrastructure has. So, you know, we have more streets to maintain. Um, so something's got to give here. And we've had this vegetation management discussion now going on five, six years. The discussion started about the time Bill arrived. And, and um, we were starting to formulate a lot of this. And a lot of this kind of hinged on, on um, kind of the progression of various things like the new public services center and, and those types of things and core services study and analysis and trying to figure out where where is most efficient to put various resources um, together and, and how to package that. And this is kind of the culmination of that, that if we're going to continue to only have five people in the street department and yet the community is continuing to grow, Vegetation management has been one of the areas that has has really kind of been a struggle, and it's it's maybe a better core service for the parks department staff to deal with, and allow the street department to focus more and more on on maintaining the streets and alleys and, and those types of things. Okay. Um, equipment. Um, moving along here. Uh, equipment purchases. You know. Um, don't average out every year. So this is a heavy year for equipment purchases. We're showing, uh, you know, last the last couple of years, uh, a year ago it was 55, 56,000 in equipment purchases. This year, 34. But now we're getting hit with a lot of equipment aging out at the same time. Not all equipment has the same life cycle. Some has... Um, a six-year life cycle. Others has uh, a 12 or 15-year life cycle. So you can't necessarily space everything out. So you average 150 or 200 thousand dollars a year. You're going to have peaks and valleys in your equipment replacement program. So this. Uh, so how we address that is we have um, we we try to. Uh, set some funds aside into equipment reserve on those uh, light years and then uh, we have cash reserves available for when we have big equipment purchases as is being indicated with 393,000. Okay. So Mike, do you, do you have enough in reserves to cover an amount like $393,000? Yes. So you go down to the very bottom here and this, this current year, we're projecting that uh, the total cash reserves will be 811,000, but next year, be, or this, this, the year that we're budgeting, we're actually going to have net funds of a minus 370,000, which is going to take our cash reserves down to 439,000, okay? So this is, you know, just like we talk about the general fund having cash reserves equal to the, James, is it six months or 12 months or? Uh, three months, 25%. 20, yeah. yeah, so you have to have operating capital yep. because you don't have expenditures that average out <laughs> 8% a month for the entire year. They come in peaks and valleys. So um, that's why we carry uh, a cash reserve. We have a target of, actually we don't, show, I don't think this one actually shows, yeah, 20 shows a target of 20 to 30% is, is our operating capital that we like to have um, because of equipment purchases or because of like say um, uh, a project that comes up. Uh, our our expenditures may not be uniform throughout the year, but our revenues tend to be fairly uniform in this this um, this department or this division. Okay. 
I mean, it, just thinking, uh, knowing that there's a second phase of the public works building, is this a fund that we could allocate funds into a capital reserve for that next phase of the project, or does all these funds have to be used on road equipment? That type of thing? Road use tax pretty much has to be on road use and also purposes. The parking the vehicles that we're using to maintain. In so, so Dan, if you look down. If you look down at the bottom here, it says transfer to projects. Mm -hmm. It's got 50, uh, let me see, um, fit, yeah, 50,000 and 150,000. Uh, those, those were transfers that did go to the Public Services Center. To pay for the current no, to be set the aside future. for the future okay. expansion. It's a small enough portion. We can do some of that. We have to care for how much because right. you can't just keep transfer, transfer, transfer because it's whole. Just footage. thinking if I'm assuming in the next three to five years we'll start having discussions on that next phase. Is it worth putting twenty, twenty-five thousand as a designated? Reserve and just start building that fund a little bit. We'll actually hit that this afternoon. Yeah. That's one of the the next couple of years we, that may get started. We don't think road use tax can support that effort anymore. Okay. Uh, we do have funds from solid waste and the water division that are still shown as continue to be transferred for that project. Okay. It's tough because it really is footprint, footage, value. We got to really be careful yeah. with that. And so, um, but yeah, we do some much you can to prevent from eating taxes. So just to piggyback on that, what, what do we think the next unit out there is going to cost us? Three million. We, we have about a million set aside already for that. Yep. Like we'll go through that in good, good detail. <laughs> round numbers with lots of zeros. It's scary <laughs> once in a while. Yeah. It's not a decimal thing. It's there. there. <laughs> Do you want to touch any equipment briefly, Mike? Do you have photos or anything on that you're rolling through? For, uh, I, um, so as far as capital equipment, uh, we have a dump truck. Uh, we have three tractors. One of them we're phasing out. And so we're, we're reducing from three tractors to two tractors. Uh, one of those will be uh, reassigned to vegetation management. Okay, um, and then we're proposing to replace the skid loader with a small uh, wheel loader. So, so think of like a front end loader, but a much much smaller version of that. Um, and then where it says bucket truck, scratch that. It's supposed to be a forklift. Yeah, not bucket truck. The bucket truck is is uh, we're doing a. Uh, we're getting a, a hand-me-down from Waverly Utilities this year, and we're buying it. But um, it's kind of kind of like the equipment services pickup going to be a paint truck. You know, it kind of ladders on down. We're able to do that with Waverly Utilities and one of their bucket trucks. Just can't justify with the need we have, limited as it is for a new bucket truck ourselves. Probably like a adequate. Yeah. Probably like a quarter million dollars for a new one. So the item I asked you was four bucks. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The proposed 155 horsepower tractor is that's to replace one that you're phasing out, or what's that one used for? That that's one, not the one with the big mowing arm on it, is it? So the one that has the arm is is um, the white tractor, and that's the only thing that it's used for. That's the one that we're phasing out. It's a 1980 tractor. It's only used with the boom mower. The replacement tractor will be figured, configured with the new boom mower. We're buying the tractor. Vegetation management is getting the boom mower for it. We're sharing the tractor because that one will also be used for compost turning at the yard waste facility. We need one with some horsepower and a creeper gear on it for uh, turning compost. So we need horsepower, we need the creeper gear, and we need 
um, weight and counterbalance for that mowing arm that extends out there. Deb's got a nice photo of the one that we kind of have and use, and it's you can see the age, yeah. <laughs> but the counterweights are what's amazing, so it does not tip, and that mower is clear out there. It's something to see. So, so the tractor listed is shared with vegetation management to be shared with them. Well, I think the uh, the citizens should be impressed with the uh, creative way that you're repurposing used equipment. I'm glad to see that. We we don't want single purpose equipment. We want equipment that is, is multifunctional. Um, you know, we, we want to work smarter, more efficiently. Uh, we we have limited space available. We don't we we don't want more and more equipment. But this also does mean that we have to be very timely in in the replacement of this equipment, um, so that we we replace it before we start incurring significant uh, maintenance costs. Um, we inform them that also this impact will also be have a snowblower during the wintertime, so it's used all year round. Yeah. So we 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 actually have two snowblowers. We have the big workhorse that goes in front of. Um, the, like the front end loader. Uh, and then we have a smaller one, which is kind of our backup one, but like right now it's getting utilized quite a bit when we have these heavier snowfall events and that, that works with the tractor. I know we we continue to have discussions and develop a program to rehabilitate residential streets. Right. Can this fund be a source of revenue or this is strictly Plowing snow, that type of thing. We, we, this is where we fund uh, about half of the, the seal coat and slurry seal program out of. We do about $200,000 a year. Uh, again, we're somewhat limited on, um, we have no control over the revenue stream as far as you know, fuel taxes and stuff, so we're at the mercy of the state. Um, and we supplement. Uh, with local option sales tax, so we we combined are doing on average about two hundred thousand a year in um, seal coating and slurry sealing of our streets. The answer is yes, Dan. We can use it for that. It's can it financially take it? That's the hardest part with what we're utilizing already. If we could free up funding for it, it could go towards that. It is an eligible expense on a road use tax. And I know. Creativity, as Mike said, is, is helpful, but using local option sales tax for seal coating versus rehabilitating with new streets, you kind of have to beg the question of that best way to go with some of that. Dan, typically our greatest opportunity to free up some of these funds for that is with the new census count. Because we're, we're, we're going to see a pop in our, in our revenue, but then by the time you get to year eight, nine, ten, you're not seeing any additional right. revenue, and yet your inflationary Cost expenses keep, keep coming up to that. And that's, we're at the end of the 10-year cycle here, and so we're getting really thin on this. And we've been having to supplement more and more with some local option sales tax dollars to backfill our gap. Again, understandable, it's just. Yep. Yeah. And we can have that discussion even further when we get into local option, kind of see what is and isn't available, what we have in that, and so, but no, this is possibility. As we get that increase in census, can we start to pull pieces of that too? So, I don't disagree. Questions in road use tax? We'll jump into airport quickly. So that can get through the library before we break for lunch. And then we'll jump in the afternoon after that. So this is a chart I, I really like to show. Um, this again is about a 20 year, uh, 20 year chart, 20 year projection. And um, the, the, the plane's not crashing, it's, it's on a glide approach. It's coming in on a really nice approach path here. But it is flying extremely low. Yeah. <laughs> Some other planes might be flying higher. You could cut that camera up here. <laughs> and the, the landing that we're heading for is zero tax support for routine operations and maintenance at the airport. Okay, and what this is showing is, you know, we, we talk about the, the, the tax rate of being about $14.50. Of that $14.50, right now, about two cents 
goes towards support of the operation and maintenance of the airport. In two years, we're forecasting it's going to be down to 1%, and, and we think within maybe five years, it will be at zero. Okay? So that's, that's a great position to be in for, for a community like Waverly. Uh, we have um, new management. Uh, we have a new FBO out at the airport uh, that we're very excited about, that they're, uh, it's um, Sweeter Aircraft Services is the FBO, and they are also managing the grounds and facilities uh, for the city as well out there. Uh, Sweeter Aircraft Services came up from Waterloo. Uh, it is a family-owned business. They have uh, a succession plan uh, with their adult children that I think are going to continue operations for many, many years into the future. Uh, they, they do uh, aircraft maintenance, but the thing that really sets them apart is they do avionics. So they do um, you know, all your control systems within the airport, your altitude, your GPS systems, uh, they, they do avionics. And I think that they're, I think one of only two, two companies in the state of Iowa that provide those services for general aviation aircraft. So um, uh, they're just in the process of getting settled in. Uh, that began in November. Uh, so we're about three months into this and they have now I think uh, made that final move where all of their uh, services are now coming out of the Waverly uh, Airport facility. So, um, do you have the. Okay, so, this uh, sheet, it's, it's going to show on the top part, it's going to show our revenues coming in, it's um, uh, hangar rent uh, from. Uh, we have uh, 11 T hangers, we have six uh, slightly larger hangers, and then we have the bulk hanger. The FBO rents the bulk hanger from the city. And, and so we have about 20, 22 to 23 uh, aircraft based at the Waverly facility. Um, Mike, see. I know sometimes we've talked about, it doesn't look like there's any increase in the rent given the proposed income from it. Is that right? For uh, the airport commission, because we, we went through uh, a reconstruction of the airport runway, and now we're going to go through the extension of the runway, uh, the airport commission's recommendation is to hold uh, uh, rents flat until after completion of the project in the spring of 2020. So when we start looking at the uh, 2021 budget, uh, the airport commission is going to be proposing uh, rent increases at that time. It, it's, they felt it's very hard to, to go to tenants and say, we're going to raise your rent while we're remodeling, rebuilding the runway type of thing. Uh, so getting down below, we have uh, the expenditures. Uh, the biggest one is, is for the airport manager and FBO, and, and where it says airport manager, it's airport manager and FBO. Uh, the manager uh, functions, they, they are paid about $10,000 a year and about $40,000 a year for the FBO uh, services. So, um, up above, you'll see the general fund transfer here. That these numbers um, are projected to decline, and maybe by FY uh, the FY 21-22 budget, we may be down to zero uh, support from the general fund. And is that because of increased revenues from the airport or FAA money, or why is it going to drop to zero? Well. Um, I, I think that when we get into the 21-22, tw that's where we're going to see see um, some increased revenue side, but we've also seen some uh, lower expenses uh, with the new FBO coming in. When we went out for uh, proposals, we, we asked that 
companies interested in providing those services provide uh, a level of expectation on the compensation. So um, they have a very uh, good, thriving business, and so uh, they were willing to accept uh, lower compensation uh, for serving as our fixed-based operator at the airport. And I know, I know, Mike, that the city does snow removal out at the airport. Yes. Uh, do, uh, does the uh, vegetation management also then do all the mowing out there? Or is that the airport manager that does that? Well, let me go back to the snow removal. We, we basically do um, the snow removal with large equipment. But as far as getting in close to the building, doing it around the airport hangar doors or the, 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 the airport um, uh, uh, facility out there, uh, the airport manager uh, receives compensation for, for doing assisting with that snow removal. When it comes to uh, vegetation management out there, uh, we do we have a couple different levels of care and maintenance out there. We have some areas that are, are basically mowed weekly, and uh, those are contracted um, and taken care of by by um, public grounds, uh, vegetation management, public grounds type things. Uh, we also have other areas that are. Uh, we have a farmer come in and they cut and bale it for hay. So we, we have a, a couple different levels of, of uh, maintenance out there at the facility. Okay. Is that the amount that's listed for grounds maintenance? In, in the, the expense budget? Uh, yeah. I would assume that, that, that the snow removal and those transfers would be in here somewhere? Yes, yeah. so if you go to the uh, account detail report uh, under grounds maintenance, uh, yes, you'll see uh, 2,500 uh, uh, snow removal allowance of 2,750, and that's that's paid to the uh, airport manager. And so the the jump uh, from from uh, this year to next year is primarily for that last item of grading and seating. Oh yes, yes, because uh, uh, well through through the engineering division we will take care of, of contracting uh, with a grading contractor to go out there and regrade it it's just over time on the south side of the building it, it drains back into the building and so what we want to do is reshape it so that the ground slopes away from the building for better drainage i guess my, my question mike wasn't what we were paying for the, the uh, airport manager for snow removal. I guess my question was, is there an item in here as a transfer between departments for the, the city's snow removal on the runways, or whatever part the, the city is doing? No. Okay. No, that's a, a, a road use tax type function. Okay. Yeah. Mike, refresh my memory. When we changed FPOs, we also talked about making provisions for a new avionics room. Did we do that, or is that still in the process? It'll show up as a capital improvement project. Okay. So it's it's proposed, um, but it's it's outside of the the normal operation okay. maintenance budget that we have. It's being treated as a capital project. We'll hit that this afternoon. Very good, thank you. Mike, could you comment on the fiber connection and the shared funding for that? Yeah, so um, there, there's an issue with having good internet out at the facility. And um, this is uh, uh, basic, basically it's far enough, it's rural enough that we, we can't get traditional internet service through Mediacom or, or um, CenturyLink. And so uh, what they've been, the previous FBO and, and Sweeter is, is now being faced with is having to go to uh, um, basically, a, at one time it was a satellite provider, but there's insufficient speed out there. And so trying to, uh, operate a, a business out there as well as uh, do fuel sales 
Uh, the FBO is responsible for the fuel sales, and so you get credit card transactions and stuff, and we don't have uh, reliable enough internet service for those. And so a couple of years ago, we started looking at, at uh, what it would take to have a more reliable system extended out there. So Waverly Utilities is, is uh, expecting um, the city and or the school system to cover the cost of, of extending um, the infrastructure out to the airport. So we've had discussions with uh, the school system about providing um, a fiber connection out to the bus barn and then extending it out to the airport. And I think that that's about a $16,000 total expense. 17, it looks or like. Or 17, is that what it is? Yeah. <clears throat> and the city's portion of that, I think, is it, let's say six? Six, six thousand. yeah. 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 The school and has funding mm -hmm. for that. Yep. And the school has applied for and received their grant yep. for their portion okay. to extend from the terminal block on the curve uh, west of the public works building to the bus barn. And then our portion is from the bus barn to there. I just received word early in the week, I think it was, that yep. the school had gotten their, their grant money to do that. So that will happen in the spring. Mm -hmm. It will definitely increase the advantage for the airport because they will now be available to have 24-hour uh, fuel sales. Yeah. And, and the pump, uh, right. Things. Yeah. So yeah. it's going to be a worthwhile investment for everyone. And the school can do a lot more things. They've been after it. They've tried to figure it out because they can do some things with their buses that now that they couldn't before. So. Okay. Any other questions on the airport, Mike? Okay. Thanks, Mike. Now we will jump to library. And then after library, we will break for lunch. So all that's standing between you and some food. <laughs> no pressure, Sarah. No pressure, Sarah. No pressure, no pressure. Hello. I will be very quick. Note that they're got junior cooks down at the library right now. So what's that? You got the junior cooks going on. Yeah. Like, yeah. The Teen Iron Chef event is today. Oh, maybe we should be eating this. <laughs> <laughs> we can pack them up. I mean, because because I'm here, I I couldn't volunteer to be a taste tester today. So mm. that's that's all right. Okay, well, uh, I'll just run through things pretty quickly. I've got about four items that I wanted to highlight as we go through this. Um, you'll see on the um, flow chart of our of our staff and that that we do have the county as part of um, part of our upper level. Uh, we do have a about $65,000 a year that comes in from the county. The lion's share of our budget comes from the city's general fund. Um, our meeting with the county supervisors is tomorrow, and that's the Bremer County Library Association that we we are together basically as an association for the sole purpose of contracting. Um, so that's, that's a pretty steady, um, steady source of income. Um, so about 65000 The other revenue sources, um, the one I wanted to highlight was library fines. I remember, um, so I've been the director since 2005, and it must have been at that time that I think the, the revenue from fines and fees was somewhere around $17,000. Um, not so long ago, 16, 17, it was 11,000. Um, now the number is more like 8,000. And I think there's a few things that have affected that over the years. And I, I think that's a good thing, ultimately, that those, that those fines have gone down. Um, 
I think one of those most recent developments is that our system will send out automatic um, overdue, overdue reminders, or before it becomes an overdue, it will send out a reminder to people via email automatically three days ahead of when their items are due and say, remember to renew or you have your items coming due. So I think that prevents a lot. Um, we've been doing a lot of studying over the past um, year about libraries that have been going fine free. And you may have even heard some of this in national news media sources because it's libraries like, not just these, but I mean libraries even like the New York Public Library have chosen to go fine free with all their children's materials. Some, some libraries choose to separate it out and do that. Um, this was an idea that was really pushed by one of our staff members who felt very strongly about it. And um, I've been since talking to um, Susan Henricks at the um, Carnegie South Public Library at Dubuque. And they've just finished a six month study there of going find free. And she's done a very detailed analysis of how many overdues did we have between zero and seven days when we had fines and when we didn't have fines. How many overdues did we have between seven and 14 days when we had fines and when we didn't have fines? And she is convinced that, um, as are many others in this line of work, that the fines don't actually change behavior in the short term. It really isn't about the 10 cents a day per item that gets people to return them on time. Um, and so, um, what, with the, what, what could happen, and the board has, has yet to give final approval. Like I said, we've been talking about it for a long time, but this new information has um, come from Dubuque now. Um, and I think maybe as early as next month's meeting, you know, they'll make a decision on whether to do a trial period or to, to go with it for a longer period. Um, but I think, uh, I really believe that it could work. It's, and when I talk to other librarians too, it really comes down to access. You know, you're trying to remove barriers for people to have access to materials, especially kids who don't have control necessarily over when they get to the library to return things. And we're we're already very. Um, forgiving around school class visits and things like that. When the class comes late, we try to jump in and take care of all the fines. But what I wanted to emphasize is that um, there still will be billing for lost and damaged items, and that always comes at 60 days, and that won't change. So in the end, the items still have to come back or be billed. Um, Sarah, is it, it's my understanding that the libraries, um, the sort of the leaders in this who have done this, they, I, I, is this correct? It's my understanding that um, while they don't fine, they remove access. In other words, you can't check out a book then if you have an overdue book. Yes, that's what Dubuque explained to me, and she felt that that was even a more powerful motivator than the fine was to say, um, if you have something overdue, you have to bring it back or renew it if you still have that option because mm -hmm. renewals are limited. Um, you have to bring it back before you can check anything else out. Mm -hmm. So you, do, you don't get yeah. fined in money, but yeah. yeah. So I think that that's important too. So you'll notice in the revenues that you know we're predicting, um, and this this is you know just an educated guess based from trying to look at our numbers and see how much per year do we bring in that's completely fine, how much do we bring in that's lost and damaged. Um, we're guessing our revenue from that source is going to be more like four thousand instead of the eight or nine thousand. Um, fortunately, we're not in the position of like a Dubuque where they take in $66,000 a year in fines and fees, and so for them to cut out that much revenue, they that's gonna hurt a little, quite a lot more. So so that's that's what I've put into the budget, assuming that the, that the board, it looking like they might approve it, if they don't, we'll bring in more than we thought. So. All right, so that was one item I wanted to point out. Um, our personnel budget, not a whole lot has changed with it at all. All the positions are the same. Many of our staff members are have reached um, the fifth step uh, 
on their pay scale. There are still a few that are that are climbing that, but our our personnel budget ends up at a 3.5 percent increase overall, and it represents um, two thirds of our overall budget. So personnel really does drive our whole budget. The services and commodities section. Um, this section actually was a decrease, and that came down to the uh, consultant and professional line, line 6490. Um, this year, we have spent about $17,000 on professional library consultants that had led us through our strategic planning, which we just finished up. Um, the board just approved the high-level goals at the last meeting, and now the staff will start um, fleshing out the more detailed work plan. So we're getting very close. Um, we're getting excited. We still did keep some consultant money in for next year in case that there would be another step that we would want them to con continue on for us, um, particularly in the space analysis section. They did some of that for us, um, but there are some more um, structured observations that, that they could do and possibly some design planning if we want to um, just put an idea out there um, based on needs that we've observed, um, things that people have said, and so we know what costs might be and what we would be what we would be talking about. So uh, then to capital expenditures, this one um, somewhat these are these are. Um, there's a lot of options that we could spend furniture and fixture money on, capital equipment. We have some ideas. In fact, I did bring some pictures. A lot of these are would be coming out of the strategic plan because we've talked about a number of a number of items. Wait, can I just put that? So this one is, I mean, it, it probably doesn't look that foreign to anybody, but this is a self-checkout station at a public library. Um, the new downtown Cedar Rapids Public Library has stations like this. Um, they can be put together pretty inexpensively. It may not end up costing all that much, but that one thing that came out of our strategic planning was this is probably a really important thing for us to look at um, just from, especially from the sake of privacy, you know, and not only convenience for some people who like to do it this way, and we know that we'll, we'll be um, continuing to check out for other folks who enjoy the conversation, you know, that they have, but there are lots of people who really don't want or need that conversation as they check out their items, and this would be a way for them to do that. It's a world we're in. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and you know, truthfully, I can think of a lot of um, items in a lot of situations where, um, you know, that might mean somebody will check out a book that they wouldn't have brought to the front desk anyway. Even though, as staff, I mean, we know that um, we don't talk about what people check out, but it's still the privacy would be good. So that's one thing, um, and, and we know that we're calling them um, staff assist assisted, or um, there seems like there's another term the consultants use. We know that there will be some assistance needed, you know, at some level. That's your kiosk you're talking about. Yeah, there, yeah, there are ones that um, implement RFID technology, but um, we were talk the consultants were saying, you know, unless you have a half a million circulations a year, which we do not. Ours is more around 150,000. The RFID technology is probably not not um, going to pay off. So. so, Sarah, for dummies, uh, tell us what an RFID means. So, it's radio frequency identification, and so there is a marker inside. It would mean remarking all of the library items because we don't currently have that system. Um, and it makes some things easy, like checkout. All you would have to do is slide your items across the counter and they'd be checked out. Some libraries have this. I'm trying to think. Cedar Falls Public might, Iowa City, some of the bigger libraries. Does um, Des Moines have it? They might. Um, I'm not sure. Another thing that becomes very easy is inventory, because all you have to do is walk down the aisles you know, with, with a 
something and um, <laughs> some kind of wand. That's what I was going to say. Some kind of wand. And, uh, it's kind of like we're low jacking our books and we know where they're at. All yeah. Somebody's walking out with it. <clears throat> yeah. So there would be some benefits, but probably that's not going to be something that we're going to spend. Um, some simpler things that came out of um, the discussions around um, the strategic planning are things like face-out shelving, which we've always known. Um, I mean, that's been out there for a long time. Some of the basic marketing practices that um, your books will go out more often if you have face-out shelving, not only in the children's area, but in the adult areas as well. So, and that kind of goes along with, this is a whole nother conversation, but, um, you know, the idea, we do weed every year, weed books out, and that's required by the State Library of Iowa. There's a certain percentage that uh, 3% a year of your collection, which is roughly, um, you know, the amount you bring in in a year as far as new collection items. Um, you know, the consultants look at your collection and they figure a turnover rate for items. And if it's strangely low in some areas, then they suggest things like this. Um, mm -hmm. Our library is known for having a fantastic um, children's picture book um, materials. We've got a lot of them, and that might be part of the issue, is that we've got a lot of them. They're shelved this way, the normal way, and so many of them probably don't get seen. You know, we have um, fiction that um, maybe doesn't get checked out very often because we've got so much of it that we added a fifth shelf that um, I bet if we had RFID, we could run our wand across the top and see that the turnover rate on top is a lot lower than the ones that are at eye level. So anyway, a number of shelving ideas like that that we'll be exploring. Well, I noticed you have a section that says this book could go away forever. <laughs> Do you want to check it out? Oh, sort of thing. that may you be know. a display that the librarians have put out. Yeah. That's one thing that we find that's so interesting is that um, uh, books that... It, it seems like as soon as you take them off the shelf, they become of interest. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And uh, I'll vouch for that because you know when we weed books, um, they either go to the friend's room for sale and they have limited space, or they get recycled. And so I have to admit that you know when when you see books in the recycling bin and you think, mm -hmm. well, I'd give a dollar for that to the friends group. You know, I mean, I think it's the it's a matter of, um, again, just having it out and visible and in a display of some sort, face out, so. So they just get recycled, the books? If they're not, you, if they're not sold, to, oh. if they're not sold. And there are some things that we've been talking about in the past, if we could find the right volunteer, I think, to work with the friends group, there's, organizations like Better World Books that you can work yeah. with to have them take care of the reselling. Um, I've bought books like that on Amazon before just for myself from organizations like that. So hopefully in the future we'll move to that. Uh, so our capital um, expenditure total is 18005 proposed. Um, and there just aren't a whole lot of other changes. It's really a pretty, pretty flat budget other than that. Um, trying to think. I think I covered, I think I covered everything I meant to say. So Sarah, as a result of your strategic planning sessions, mm -hmm. if you discover and accept that you need to revamp some spaces and things. I see nothing in the budget for remodeling, reconstruction, or whatever. No. Is, or, is there outside funds for that? That's a very good question. Um, yeah, we have. We really have no idea right now if we um, if we will be doing anything or not. It's. Um, if, if something was to be done, it seems like a natural step forward would be to consider enclosing the patios on the west side right. of the library because they already are under roof and it, it's within the current footprint of the building. And it actually was architecturally designed that way mm -hmm. to be an easy add-on. And some of the feedback we got was... Um, 
the request for quiet space. And um, you, you all have probably seen um, the Capital One card commercial with Jennifer Garner in it that's on TV. And they, uh, she's telling something to the librarian that the librarian gets very excited about it and screams out in the library and then everybody then everybody looks annoyingly at her because it's supposed to be quiet. And so we all laugh at that because we know where that comes from. But the truth is that our library is really not like that. And it's um, we've got children's programs going on. We've got um, kids there after school. We've got um, there's just a lot going on. And every once in a while, we have someone probably more often, probably there are people who don't say anything about it. But we have folks who really would like some quiet space, and so that was one one request that came out. Um, How much is the outdoor space used now? I would say the the north patio is used more than the south patio. As far as we even do some of our own programming out there, um, the outdoor space. Um, outside of that on the west is used quite a lot because the gardens are there and there's a lot of walk-through traffic mm -hmm. from preschoolers yeah. and parents. And mm -hmm. But in answer to your question about where that money would come from, so the library has the Waverly Public Library Foundation, which was created shortly after the building was built in 1998. And the, the seed money for that was an estate gift. It seems like there were two estate gifts. One was May Rose Lane. And there was another one. And they just happened to come right at the end of the building project when the project was finishing in the black. Um, and so some of that money was used the beginning beginning of the landscaping on the, on the west side. The rest of it was the seed money for the foundation, which has grown. Today, the entire foundation is some, somewhere very close to $250,000, half of which is in an endowment, which is relatively new, two or three years new. Um, with the Community Foundation of Northeast Iowa. So there are some vehicles put in place for um, nothing of the probably caliber that we would need. But I do have a lot of hope that if we did identify a project like that, that there would be a lot of private money that would come. Um, and I say that partly because 20 years ago when the building was built, a third of the money that paid for that building was private. So, um, and I think there, I think that would happen. So, when it, when we get to that place, then we can set some goals. Is there um, no place in the existing structure that you could carve out for more quiet space? Well, that's one of the things we're going to be exploring. Is um, pretty much pretty much our study rooms are used to the max. Um, our meeting rooms are often used, and they are our program rooms for children's programming. So, um, but there are some movable, move, movable things, acoustic tiles, um, movable shelving, movable walls to do kind of transition, mm -hmm. transitionary type of things. And those might be the kinds of things we could spend capital, a little bit of capital funds on to, to get us by for a while. That would help. If you decide to go forward to you, it's kind of what we talked about early on. You do have money in for possible space design, space needs, mm -hmm. the architectural piece of it, possibly even the bidding, consulting estimates. That would set you up maybe for the next year to get into the construction mm -hmm. phase of it. So there's a little bit of money to assist in that going forward if they decide to. And then we would take a look at it along with private and support. How would it be accomplished? How much are we really talking about? And you'd probably go forward, but it'd probably be a little wild in that process, mm -hmm. architecturally getting input. What would you need to do? So there is a little bit of funding in there for that. Okay. So how many people do you serve, and how many people do you think live in Waverly, and how many come from other towns? Uh, that that number I'd have to look up again as far as how many patrons we have from rural Bremer County, how many we have from outside, um, because we do serve. Um, what, what the State Library would call open access patrons from Black Hawk County and all over Iowa. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I'd have to look up those numbers for you, because you can measure it. I, we, we don't have that data as far as visits. We know that we have about 50 people per hour on average that visit the library over all the hours that were open. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, 
as far as circulations, the county circulations are maybe a quarter of our circulations, and the open access circulations are maybe another quarter. So roughly, you know, you might be talking 50%, 25, 25. I'll have to I'll have to confirm that. Sarah, um, back a couple years ago when we were working with a consultant to do energy audits, yeah. conservation, it seemed like there was quite a few things either done or planned, but when I look at your energy budget, it continues to go up <laughs> quite sizably. So do we not complete some things that we should have? Or? Um, well, I think, I'm trying to think how it came in exactly last year, 1718, 47,000. I was trying to, I don't know how we're going to come in this year. I've left it, I've left it pretty flat at 55 because we didn't know how the new lighting, we have replaced a lot of our LED lighting. The position that we're in right now is that um, in many cases, just the way we chose to do it at the time was that maybe um, trying to match the same number of lumens, maybe we took out so many incandescent bulbs and then replaced, say we replaced four with two LEDs or something. And now I think all that stuff is kind of shaking out and we're saying uh, it's a little darker than we thought it was and that's causing a problem. And so when newer LEDs are available for those above lighting, because we put in the biggest LED we could at the time, mm -hmm. we're gonna have to replace those and get a brighter one because it's too dark. Um, the motion detectors that we've got in place are largely successful, but we're finding that if somebody goes to the far end and sits down to read the newspaper, unless they're <laughs> flapping their arms, the light might go out on them. Or I'll just find delays and like I'll walk out of my office in the dark and I'll have to walk not that I, not that I need the light to walk, but um, you know it'll be quite a while before that flips on. So we've got some adjusting to do, and maybe some adding back of of more lights that that will still last longer and hopefully still be more energy efficient. But I just don't know if we've got it all figured out yet. I'd say through that grant process, I think we identified a lot of potential projects, but then again, comes down to funding. So I just want to make sure we haven't lost track of some cost yes. savings. And I think Shane Potus um, is on that and knows that we still have some staff areas and he, he kind of knows what areas we've done and where where are, we're going next. Okay. The library seemed to have the biggest payback op opportunities. Yeah. So. Yes. We're still continuing to fund about 25000 a year in those programs on top of what rebates we get on doing them. And so we uh, will be meeting eventually with Shane and the uh, person from, uh, I can't think of the company now, um, to identify where are we, where have we done, how did it go. So we will still be addressing a lot of that going forward. Franklin Energy, thank you. Okay. Any more questions or anything for Sarah, the library? Very good. Thank you thank for an excellent presentation, thank sir. You. Thank you. Just uh, uh, a comment. Like, sir, we would break for lunch. Oh, no, one quick comment yes, about sir. the library. I've been either on the board or liaison to the library for a while. And I got to say, I'm really impressed with not only the staff, but particularly with our librarian. I think we have a really good one in our city. You can pay me later, sir. <laughs> <laughs> on a 30 minute break? Is that long enough? Absolutely, sir. I think Let's break 30 minutes for lunch. Okay.
We'll reconvene the budget session of Waverly City Council, City Administration. Looks like Mr. Dab Ray is up with leisure services. This is Dab's Correct. final budget, his farewell tour budget, so let's just say, say just say yes to everything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Make him feel good at least today and we can work it out later. But yeah, Tep, you want to jump into uh, Sure, Leisure yeah, Services is Leisure Services Administration, Vegetation Management, Civic Center, Golf Course, Cemetery, Pro Shop, Parks, and Pool. And if uh, my uh, cover uh, is representative of last year's pool staff t-shirt that I didn't know anything about, uh, it, it's the 50th birthday of the swimming pool in 2017. So uh, I thought that would be an appropriate uh, sheet. <laughs> Fantabulous. I uh, um, I will say that that as opposed to about everybody else, there's a lot of personnel changes in my budget. Um, there's an unnamed director there, uh, and then we have uh, we're proposing a full-time pro shop manager and a full-time vegetation management person. So we'll be talking about those later on. We'll be going through all these, um, probably through the sheets, but basically administration is succession planning. Uh, mostly uh, I've been trying to update manuals and tell people how to do things and show people how to do grants and that sort of thing. So there's a smooth transition. Um, I am going to retire on May 13th is my last day. Uh, and so I'll be retired on May 14th. And uh, but I've already indicated that I'm willing to give my new cell phone number to a limited number of people. <laughs> <laughs> and that I would be available for uh, help if, if needed. Uh, I, I think uh, Human Resources is looking at possibly getting going on this as soon as possible so that uh, there might be some, some uh, overlap that I'll be able to help the new person uh, with some things. But I'll, I, won't, I won't leave you hanging. Uh, in terms of parks, uh, uh, Lots of things, future of fair and improvements in the parkland, um, work with Central Business District and Streetscape. Uh, and that's really important because it's got to look good, but it's got, also got to be maintainable. So we have been involved with those meetings. Um, uh, Paul, Paul Chevelle is here, he's a public grounds maintenance uh, person, so uh, superintendent. So uh, he'll be listening to me as well. And if there's any questions I can answer, I'm going to look at him. Uh, Maintenance routes, integration of, of cemetery and vegetation management staff uh, with the parks, uh, parking lot hard services is what we want to try to do. Prairie Park development we'll talk about, and a new pickup in the parks. Um, so, uh, go ahead and yeah, put that on the first one. <coughs> In administration, we uh, um, uh, there's a new person in, under salaries and wages, so they won't be at the top of the scale like I am. And uh, there is some additional uh, uh, health insurance benefits uh, for the new person and, and myself for the next year. And otherwise, it's uh, pretty straightforward. The $9,700 is our share of the Bergen uh, bill for the uh, the contract uh, for IT work over the, the entire city. Okay. Yeah. Nothing there. And that's kind of the basis of leader services admin. I don't know if you have any questions on that one. Again, it's kind of straightforward. I just wondered why um, wages and salaries were going down. Uh, we're anticipating the new person will be uh, at the first step, or I'm at the top so step. Your replacement. You right. Okay. That's if you want to replace that position. <laughs> so parks, like I said, um, uh, we're looking at a parking lot hard surfacing <coughs> program. Some of the parks uh, have gravel lots we'd like to do. The north end of Coleman Park and uh, Red Cedar Park, and uh, there's about four other locations we want to do, and we're working with public services on that. 
Prairie Park is a kind of an interesting thing. Uh, the neighbors at Prairie Park, which is uh, where the fire uh, convention was, they went out and picked up cans and bottles uh, after the fire convention. They got about $2,500. So they're going to put some that money and some more money together and maybe write some grants. And we've budgeted a little bit for it. But they want to add a basketball slab and a, a uh, medium-sized shelter there uh, to make their park uh, better. Right now, there's a play unit and swings, but uh, they want to put some stuff in there. They have lots of neighborhood stuff there, and, and uh, uh, I think that will uh, be a positive thing for that neighborhood. The other thing uh, that we've got is I had individuals who come in and talk to me last fall that said, that said they would be willing to give thirty to fifty thousand dollars to us to build a walking path, a hard surface walking path in the dog park. So we've been in contact with him, uh, trying to uh, see how he would like to do it. Uh, we got his ideas. We're putting plans and specs together to bid that out, and we will uh, hopefully have a nice walking path. The other thing we're trying to do is leverage that donation to get some more donations for like benches and more uh, um, agility equipment for the dog park. Uh, we're my national magazine had dog parks on the front of their uh, magazine uh, last month. That there's uh, the big thing right now is develop dog parks because because a third of the people in the world have dogs. So so I think that's going to be a, an important thing. We we can almost become a regional dog park because of the size and if we have the enhancements in it. So anyway, Tab, we, yes. Before you move on, you have an expense of thirty thousand for improvements to the dog park. But this private donation does not show up anywhere. So it's in the revenues. You see these sixty thousand dollars. Oh, okay. Donation park park. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, this isn't directly related, but at the um, <clears throat> assessors meeting the other day, um, one of the supervisors, I think maybe maybe it was Dewey. Um, uh, said that Intercog has some monies available for uh, sidewalks and um, trail trails um, for small towns if we still qualify. You may already know about all this. Yeah, uh, okay. you have to be under ten thousand, and it's a uh, under ten thousand. Yeah. Well, wouldn't, aren't we still? We, we still are. Chance. Yes, we are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. But uh, we are looking at that as well. Other uh, okay. types of of uh, funding sources for walkways and trails and that sort of thing. One of the things we're doing right now is we're working with um, uh, Wellmark to do a, a, a healthy type of analysis for the city. Uh, the Waffle Group is working with them. And one of the things we're going to do this, this May is to do a walking survey analysis of, of the um, trails and, and sidewalks and that sort of thing in the community. We're supposed to show them good places, and we're supposed to show them places we need to have challenges with. So Mike and I are working on that to try to get a good good representation. It'll be about a three-hour thing on, a, on a, a May morning sometime. Could you update us on the foundation for the, the park foundation, whatever the, the nonprofit we've set up? Yeah, I kind of dropped the ball on that. Um, we had some, uh, I made connections with the banks. I've not done any personal connections. We do have money in the in the uh, flexible fund uh, that we can pull out when we have a project. Um, but right now, uh, we don't have a permanent endowment type foundation. Uh, that's something we can still work on. But I assume this temporary one is where the, the Park Park and the Prairie Park funds are going to sit there until they're being used? Well, we're not going to do that because we can't have access to it for a little while yet, and okay. we won't get those done. Okay. So uh, we have the money we have in there right now is the park dedication money that we got from Omni Subdivision right. for the trail work. So when okay. we get that going, then we can pull that out with interest. Okay. You does the prairie planning at Prairie Park? Been restored since the convention, or is it that has been? not. That we we told them at the beginning that it's, uh, it's best to do prairies in the spring, so I, I think they're going to be working on that uh, uh, coming up here. And we've given them our seed mix and everything else we had up there, so uh, they should be prepared. Okay. okay. Um, let's 
So we do have a uh, pickup um, proposed in this budget. Uh, basically, it's a This was a hand-me-down uh, that's a um, 19, or 2007 F-150. It's 12 years old and, and has some rust and some issues with it, so we're proposing a new pickup. Um, we talked about uh, um, the other capital improvements. One of the things we're proposing is to... Does that truck get traded out, or does that go to a different part of the organization? Yeah, we're going to give that to the cemetery because the cemetery doesn't have anything uh, except for one ton to just run errands, that sort of thing. Uh, and then, uh, since we own the Little League now, uh, we're looking at starting to replace bleachers at the Little League. We um, have done all the bleachers and brought them up to, spe to standards at the fairgrounds. So these are not in standard right now, so we're hoping that we can start a rotation of doing one or two a year. We're proposing one this year to do um, at the Little League. We're also looking at see if we can retrofit the existing ones because the aluminum's all good, uh, but they don't have the, the uh, railings around the outside and along the back, which is, is required now. And where is, where is this? Which the field? Little League. Is it Kiwanis Park? Yeah, Kiwanis yeah. Park. <coughs> I, I thought it was interesting. Mike showed his before and after. This is my before uh, Parks shop. It's not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got pictures of oh, the, the pickup was next to the after. That's where we are now. <laughs> we went from 1930 to 1950. Mm. <laughs> uh, but this is showing what our next uh, phase is, and we'll talk about capital, capital projects later on, but this is the, where the shelter will go for this, this project. And uh, here's the graphics of it. So we're doing the, um, uh, the exchange building right now. Uh, plans and specs are out. We get them back in a couple weeks, and we'll bring the, the bids to council for you to approve, and then we're hoping to have that done by early June. Uh, and then uh, uh, next phase would be the, the shelter. Uh, and then uh, eventually, like, like the chief said, phase five was going to be the spray pad. So on that diagram, where would that structure fire tower thing go? About on the spray pad. The splash pad, it'd be right on top of that. Yeah. Oh. Or if you move it further to the west, it would be on top of the building we're about to remodel. That's where 100 foot comes out that we're talking about. Well, so how would that work? Uh, that's a good question. It would be an either or. Yep. Much. Apparently. We'd <laughs> <laughs> have a ready made sprinkling system. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. It's great fire control. Civic Center, is that next? Cemetery is next. Cemetery. Good if we did be buried there. It's good thinking. It's already late. Cemetery personal costs are about even. Um, Catholic equipment, we want to replace our 60 inch zero turn mower. We want to replace it with a 72 inch. We think we can cut some time off our mowing, obviously, by having a bigger piece of equipment. Um, capital improvement is a um, some curb work. It's something we've done for several years. This And the curb work that we have replaces either broken or non-existent curb and helps divert water away from the going over the, the graves and that sort of thing. Which section is this uh, work going to be? In section F, and that's, that's as you go in the main road, before you turn right to go into the new section, section F is on the right. Okay. And tab 
have, when people buy plots at this point, are they required to put in flat stones, or can they have raised headstones? It depends on what kind of lot you buy. You, we have monument lots and we have flush lots. So it's your choice. You can buy, pay a little bit less, buy a flush lot, yeah. or you can pay a little bit more and buy a monument lot. We try to have them all consistent, uh, you know, so there's not monument flush, monument flush, mm -hmm. monument flush. So, Tab, I'm looking at the objectives. What what would be the advantage of having a dedicated area for cremains? I know lots of cemeteries you just bury them wherever they wherever you've got a plot. We're, we're just about at 50% cremain burials now, and uh, maybe we could uh, have a little bit smaller lots mm -hmm. that we could have a couple people buried on mm -hmm. rather than the full size ones. Just something that some cemeteries we're looking at. Uh, are now we're looking at, and we kind of were talking about that as well. There are some areas we could do that that aren't really conducive to a um, a full grave space. Okay. It's limited real estate. Try and get that density in there. <laughs> yeah. We haven't uh, we haven't approached the burying people vertically yet. What? Vertically. <laughs> 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 trying to be a stand <laughs> <laughs> that didn't fly, did it? Move on. <laughs> this is this is section F right here, and the, the newer curves ends right here, and we go around the corner here. Here's a picture of the mower. I'm gonna flip that down. <laughs> looks better that way. <clears throat> oh, it looks brand new. And uh, yeah, it's got several thousand hours on it already. And then um, while we were working on painting the shop building, we found out that the, the uh, foundation of the shop building was, was uh, it doesn't have any footings underneath it and it's kind of bowing the wall out. So we're looking at potentially replacing the shop building. It's along the, it's along the street side where it's bowing out. It's getting a little questionable as yeah. to the structure ability of it. It's not good. So in capital uh, improvements, we have about 80 grand for a new shop building. It doesn't have to be anything spe uh, spectacular or anything like that. It's more function than not. And, and really, uh, it, there's not much going on there right now uh, because we have a permanent part-time person and his hours are, are abbreviated over the winter. But it's really, really busy the nine months of the growing season. Uh, I've got people going in and out of there and that sort of thing. <coughs> So the uh, the shop building is shop building is adjacent to the fairgrounds. No, this is at the cemetery. Oh, the cemetery. There, there's a house, and then the shop building, and then there's a store, a newer storage building, right, right by the street. So you're talking about taking it down, building right. a new structure yeah. there. Yeah. And is the mower going to get handed over to another department, or is no, it done? That'll be that'll be trade in. Trade in. We really don't use zero turn mowers in the rest of the uh, areas because number one, we use our out front mowers year round. Mike was talking about versatility of equipment. We either have a brush or a snow blower on this time of year, and we mow the rest of the rest of the year with it. And zero turns, you can't do that. Uh, they're more for flexibility for turning and that sort of thing. Like going around monuments and, and that kind of stuff. That $80,000, that, that's not in the budget. Is that going to be under capital somewhere? Or? Right, it's in the capital. Yeah. Capital yeah. improvement fund. We get in the capital funds later mm -hmm. on. You'll see. Okay. We looked at possibly lifting this structure and trying to put a foundation underneath. And you, it's probably more than half of the cost of a new one. So it, when you're talking to age, it just, and we don't know how that would come up structurally either. So mm -hmm. yeah, here. doing something new was actually probably more efficient, maybe even cheaper in the long run. So. For more on the full building style, probably. Most likely. We've got a couple of estimates. And so I don't think that floods, but it gets real, it gets islandish. Right. Times. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Golf course, there really isn't anything different in here except for um, this is the year that we replace equipment. What we've been doing is is um, every three years we, we buy several pieces of equipment and then we, we put the payment out uh, over the th next three years. So, so um, we have consistent budgeting. That helps out a lot. Um, so this year we actually have five pieces of equipment we want to replace. Um, a uh, sprayer, a fairway mower, an aerifier, a utility vehicle, and a greens mower. 
and they're all replacement. There's nothing new in there. <coughs> They all have multiple years old and multiple thousand hours on them. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really worked out well that we borrow money to um, buy these. We get them all at once. A lot of times we get good prices because we buy multiple pieces of equipment. And then we stretch the payments out. So this, this year we're anticipating about $50,000 of payment for, for equipment. It's right here. Otherwise, in minor equipment, we're trying, this is a new piece of equipment. It's a um, uh, sweep and fill. Uh, what happens is, is uh, we have a, a old, old type of method of after we airify greens, uh, we chop them up and then drag it all in where this, this basically breaks up the plugs that we they pull out of the greens and put and fills them in right away because it's got a, a brush thing that, that uh, works real well with that. The other, the other thing would be um, uh, we use this brush to brush up the greens so we don't have to mow or roll uh, for like big events. You brush them, you stand up the grass, grass, um, uh, the grass and it puts really well then. So it's better to have this type rather than put equipment on it. So it, it's a dual purpose type piece of equipment. It's about 4,500 bucks, it's under minor equipment. Hmm. New, it's kind of new technology. Okay. Oh, sure. <clears throat> the golf course and the pro shop, as a combined golf course operation, has been, uh, well, the entire department is, is um, uh, basically paid for by property taxes. We do generate some revenue in the pool and the golf course and those types of things. However, the golf course, like similar community golf courses, have been losing golfers. This past year, we were about nine to 11% less golf played. Uh, we got numbers from Waterloo and Sierra Falls and they were worse than that. Uh, so as a result, our revenues have not been hitting our marks. We are, um, uh, projecting this next year to be uh, about $230,000 of tax support for the golf course operation. Uh, one of the things we're proposing is to have a full-time person at the pro shop so that they would be able to put together a marketing plan, a um, some sort of, of uh, events so that we can maybe start attracting the golfers back uh, as well as teaching new golfers more than what he has time to do right now because right now he's a seasonal employee. Uh, this would be full time with benefits and that sort of thing so that would be a, uh, a, a pretty good jump in money. Uh, we, we are hoping that uh, we give him about three years and have some benchmarks that he has it each year so that we can see some progress. Um, get more on the social media and, and maybe some, some agreements with other courses <coughs> to have uh, like uh, a hotel motel packages and things like that. Uh, but uh, we gotta do something to stop the bleeding. So this is what we're proposing. This would be in lieu of this last year where it was kind of a 50-50 between the country club and the pro shop. And right. I'm assuming that didn't work out as well as we hoped or? We were kind of looking at this as, you know, as you've looked at the history of the subsidy in the course, and it has grown and grown and grown and it continues to grow and grow. We understand the industry itself is kind of coming down a little bit. But we really, with part-time people, don't have the ability to actually market this, to actually go and put packages together, to actually make this course more available to the public, et cetera. We are competing with another course in town that became public as well and has a different funding source than we do. And at some point, you know, this is one of the larger assets we have in the city. You have to make a decision. Do you, is there a threshold where we stop putting money into it or are we okay to just continue every year to increase how much we're putting into it? 
we could we've talked about do we not mow as often do we not manicure it as much well that affects the playability and then that makes it not any more attractive to play either it kind of hurts itself you know, we've looked at all these different options and the one thing we wanted to try was can we put a full-time person in for one to three years i don't care if it's a contract or just a year to year as we go to try and curb this this bleeding in this course and how much money we're putting into it. So at some point in time, it happens to all courses. I'm not gonna say it's gonna happen here, but you have to look at, do we need an 18, two of them in town? Do we need a nine? Do we need one at all? And those are the horrible conversations I don't even wanna have. But it's, if it gets up to 300,000 in taxes, is that where you look at it? You know, that's kind of an individual assessment each you would have to make, but we wanted to try and invest a little into it to see if we could get a whole lot more out of it. Um, and that's where the discussion went and the pitch went. Because, yes, we did have a 50-50 arrangement with the Country Club last year, same individual doing it. I don't know how well it went for them. Uh, I think it was okay for us. But, again, their time is there as well. We can't really get anything additional other than their managing pro shop. That's all they can do. We almost wanted our own pro ownership because most 18 whole courses in our area have full-time pros, and that's what they're doing in the off-season. That's what they're doing in the middle. They're giving lessons. They're looking at marketing packages. They're putting together restaurant deals for trying to bring people in. None of that's happening for us. We don't have the staffing to do it. And so since we already had a part-time out there, we're really filling the other half of that in to try and make this go. Um, so just something I wanted to pitch to you. You council certainly can decide if you want to try that or not. We can go back to where we were before and just have the subsidy a little less, maybe 20000 is what it is less. It's still over 200000 this year. Or we can attempt to try and, I guess, try to curb it. We're just looking for some kind of an answer because it's just getting more and more. I mean, if we're already beating the odds of, you know, uh, courses. I mean, have a have a um, lesser rate of decline than than some of the other courses in the Cedar Valley. Um, I mean, how realistic is it to assume we can do, or, or or yeah, not to assume, but to think there's a reasonable chance we can do more? Well, I don't know if you pull out the rounds the fire convention brought in. How much worse does that make us look? That put in how many rounds probably? Two thousand. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. We were propped up this year because mm -hmm. of that. It would have been a lot worse. Yeah. So we are probably closer to where these other courses are, mm -hmm. and they have full-time pros trying to market. We are in competition, whether it's Warley Cedar Falls right. here locally. It is competition that we're not even competing in. And nationally, we're not there's a to, trend uh, downward yeah. for golf as well, right? Yeah. But we don't have any marketing at all, really, to speak mm -hmm. of, other than the basic, hey, we have a great course, come play it. And so, again, just an attempt to try and curb it. Um, I mean, then we always have the biggest <clears throat> competition, Mother Nature. And yep. I don't think she was real nice to us this year. No, when it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we invest that way, I would think we'd need to have some very, <clears throat> very clear um, <clears throat> goals. Goals, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you look at the numbers among the Golf Commission and the numbers of kids who came out for the junior program was dramatically up because of the effort that, that Jordan put in. And so... And that was part-time when he could. Yeah. <clears throat> if we're seriously talking about a marketing position for the city, is some of that fall under there? Also, I've had lengthy conversations with Travis to promote package deals with what Waverly has to offer and, mm -hmm. and the restaurants and the hotels, motels, and, and uh, don't know if it's part of their strategy or not. But, uh. and, I, and I understand that, and I don't disagree with it. I guess I like to control our own fate, and I hate to rely on somebody else to do it for us yeah. no, when I they understand. have time. Yeah. And that's where I sit with it, because sometimes we don't get what we'd like to get out of that. We at least control our own destiny with this, and if we're not performing, that's it, we're done. I can't really do that with some other entity, and that's the hardest part. But as far as the <clears throat> communication director, yeah, we're going to have to have a very long discussion about that. That is not in the budget anywhere because we have no idea how much, what they're going to do. We don't know what their goals are going to be, and we have no idea what that's going to be. We can theorize, surely pile on do this for us. Uh, can they? I, I don't know. I really don't know how they're going to do that, or is it a chamber issue? Um, all we can do is try and factor in what we think golf by itself could try and do with our assistance. The other issues, we'll have to see if it blends or not. Uh, again, I don't know. We just wanted to entertain it for you to consider. What's, what's what, the dollar amount to? The difference is about 20000 or so between 
having this person or putting them back to right. part time and we go status quo and you just have extra money or kicking in another chunk above and beyond. So I know it's a sensitive issue, but I mean have we done any kind of <clears throat> study or research or analysis on what the dynamic is between the two courses in terms of you know I don't think we are they symbiotic or competition. Well the yeah. pros the pros work together to do the youth, youth program. program right. Right. And that was very successful. Right. That's but, one area of And we had some people that went over to their uh, driving range, but that's by on the buy side now. What? But do we know what effect I guess what I'm saying is have we tried to analyze study it all yeah, to <coughs> analyze it what you know, what if what effect has that had on the on our public golf course. I, I think them going public last year was a pretty good uh, chunk out of our rounds, and uh, they're still going to be public because they have new owners. Uh, however, I, I don't know if they're going to have the incentives like they had last year. Uh, we definitely saw the subsidy jump when they went public, mm -hmm. yeah. and it wasn't on the expense side was there, but the revenue side showed a bit of it too. We, we've seen that dip <coughs> so. Uh, whether it levels out or not, I, I don't know. Again, they have a whole different funding mechanism than we do. Ours is property taxes. And right, or is there, is there a way to be creative in a partnership that would be a win-win? I mean, I don't know. Has, has there been any further discussion with the country club about the relationship we have with them and revenue streams that they control that we don't have access to, alcohol sales, et cetera? We have not. Um, or even anything with them to help on the marketing side of the golf course to bring people in. I've not had that discussion. I don't know if we. I mean, if we, if we have a outing, we're talking to them about the food and that sort of thing. So uh, there is a relationship there. There's got to be, but we haven't really done anything regarding. But not uh, trying to stem the future bleeding plan. Of the golf course. No. Well, I think they're bleeding as well. <clears throat> Are there models for this being done successfully, where municipal courses are, you know, reversing the trend at all, and how they're doing that? Not necessarily in Iowa, but other places. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, everybody's different when you look at how many mm -hmm. courses are around you in the competition. Lots uh, of we're yeah. behind the ball, so to speak, because we're an 18-hole public course without a pro, right. full time. Right. We're already behind that. So most of the other ones that we do compete with, they have a full-time pro and other staff on site all the time. We have a part-time pro and a part-time manager. That's that's what we have. That's our whole staff for this course. So again, it gets to where if we want to compete in that level, we have to get to that level. And we are not at that level. Or we can continue to just put money in as a subsidy and go. And that's kind of the premise of what we brought it to you for is we didn't want to just keep throw money and want to give you an option is to to consider. And again, you certainly don't have to do it by any means. We just talked about it and thought it was an option. Well, Otherwise, we just keep putting I'm money in and because I play golf, but I think that uh, you have to get kids interested. It's like any sport. You have to get kids interested, and you need a practice facility, right. really, especially in a climate like ours. And, and uh, I know that's part of the conversation, too, but I think from a safety standpoint, you know, fewer kids are playing some sports because they're dangerous and and uh, golf is something you can play from 4 to 94 and above, right? So. right? Well, I would like to see the impact of kind of the youth golf programs mm -hmm. that have been started. Does Do we get to see more people playing mm -hmm. long term because of that? Mm -hmm. um. Well, it appears am I correct that the difference between what we have now and going with full-time pro is about $20,000. Yeah. It's just an absolute small drop in the whole picture. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we'd like to try it for a year, mm -hmm. if you would. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We can certainly do something else. But for the money, we'll find it somewhere else if we have to. But it's a concern. Mm -hmm. But well, I, I don't know what else to do yeah. with it. It's, it's it definitely an climbing. asset that our city has to have yeah. two nice golf courses. And the people who do find out about our course and come play it love it. 
And so maybe we can bring you some uh, measurable goals we can try and get to and certain benchmarks to try and hit. And if it doesn't go, it doesn't go. Yeah, I would I, I would agree with that, and I agree with what the mayor just said too. That you know certainly the the relatively small amount just is worth it. But I would say for more than a year. I mean, I I, I would think that it will to give it a fair shot. You would need at least. Two, if not three, we and, and at have three. and yeah, and have measurements uh, along the way that are real. I mean, realistic. It's stretching toward progress. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you go three years, at least if a pro that would come on board would feel much better mm, knowing yeah. that he had yeah. a chance in three years. Yeah. three years rather yeah. than at yeah. the end of a year. I could very well yeah. be out of a job. Right. And with yeah. Jordan, who we currently have as our pro, I know he would be interested in, and I'm sure we are helping him through pro school as part of his agreement because we mm -hmm. don't pay him mm -hmm. as much as others may. So we tried to get that to keep somebody here consistently because yeah. we've had trouble in the past switching out pros every yeah. other year. Every So consistency would be good. Uh, we can write something up as far as measurables, let you input as well on that if you want to try to go through and, and give it possibly three years. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily a contractual thing, or we could do that too with an out clause, but certainly think about that if you would and provide some feedback and whatever you'd like to do, we'll certainly do. We just didn't want to sit by and just keep putting more money and hoping. To me, if Jordan is interested in this, that's a big plus because sure he, he has shown <coughs> the potential to improve the relationships and get more kids in there. Absolutely. Um, you, know, you never want to design a position for a person, but I, I think now would be an opportune time if he's interested to make the move and see what happens. And we've talked about it for a few years since I got here looking at the subsidy, what are we going to do, and it has progressively gotten worse and it's to the point where if we're going to do this and he's still here, he's interested, he's got a few years yet to get to where he would go somewhere else potentially anyway, maybe this is when we try to make a move on it. And again, if it doesn't go, we have some hard decisions to make after a couple of years or so on what this course is going to look like. I think everybody's made good comments about it. I, I can't disagree. I'm just curious where, how would, how and where would we identify the needed twenty thousand dollars? Where would it come from? Uh, right now, it'd be in taxes. Mm -hmm. Is this that's something that proposed. is this something that's been discussed by the, the Gulf Commission, and, and are they on board with it? If it has been. Or is um, this not in their? Just the chair. I, I talked to him about it. Uh, we have not talked to the Golf Commission. Well, yes, we have. We, re we reviewed the budget the completely budget with them. That's right. Okay. A um, couple of comments. To to oh, be I'm one. sorry. I would look to that group to maybe put the stipulations around it. More okay. Than I don't know that I'm in a position to add value to that where they would be. We can certainly do that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We can do that. A couple comments. Uh, in the existing budget now, we did put a little bit more money in, so he would start April 1st uh, as a full time. And uh, the other thing, uh, and reference uh, practice facility, we are actively looking at uh, either a outside practice facility or an inside practice facility. In fact, we have our golf course super or golf course architect that did the work on the past couple of projects. He said he would come down to our next commission meeting with some sketches for nothing, just to get get some ideas. So we, we really think that uh, since the practice facility is going to be gone here pretty soon, if it's not already, we need to look at ourselves, either have a have a inside uh, electronic game type simulator thing, uh, a multiple one, or if we can put a practice facility on the fairgrounds after the fairgrounds moves out. It may not be full size, but it'd be better to have someone be able to warm up a little bit beforehand. Okay. I appreciate the discussion. Thank you, Council. So do I. Thank you. <coughs> In the swimming pool. There really isn't much different here. Um, we got a new circulation pump, uh, and we want to track that to make sure it's working well. Uh, but uh, otherwise, it's just general operation. You know, chemicals and staff hasn't changed much over the years. Um, and, uh, you know, revenues, it's all weather dependent. If we have a really warm mid, late May into 
June, we sell lots of season tickets. Mm -hmm. If it's rainy and cold and crappy, we don't sell season tickets. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> just, that's just the way it is. Yeah, pre-sell them in the hot August. Yeah, I'm glad we don't have any major repairs. Pre-sell them in the hot or August or for the next year. Anything. Yeah. There was one of the years. Yeah. <laughs> we usually have some repair or something. We don't have any of that this time. So. Yeah, I know one of the energy saving things that was looked at was the chemical pool cover. Right. That's we still use that. And they have, and we were still seeing that. some benefit, yes. Mm -hmm. How does that work exactly? It's a, it's a one molecule thick uh, chemical compound that he, keeps the heat in. Huh. It's in the water though, right? Yeah, it's in the water. See, you, you don't, don't blank it. That's green amazing. after you jump in or anything like that. No. <laughs> you don't turn green after you jump in. Or you don't. <laughs> so, you know, no. But you do have to continue to add, it, add to it. It's, it's dosed at the beginning and then you add a little bit about every day. We did see the, less evaporation, less heat. I mean, it's, that's what it does. It stopped that apparently. It was a cool so. product when we looked at oh, some wow. of it. I know we. Oh, sorry. No, yeah. go ahead. And I know we talked about this a, f a few years ago, um, and you know, had a little bit of a longer view. But I, I feel like we need a real plan about the pool. Um, when are we gonna? When are we gonna do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of it's contingent upon when the uh, when the fair moves out, when the upgrade of the whole park could be. Because I think we've talked about it before. I know Tim few years ago. Yeah. Uh, do we have an overall Memorial Park plan? And I know that falls into it, and that's kind of what we're sitting on. I mean, it, I don't know when to really engage somebody to do that when we're uncertain when that may even be able to happen. Uh, but we'd have a, probably a large 30,000 foot view of what it could look like. Yeah. But we don't have a really architecturally designed, we didn't put the money out for that yet. No, Just, no, and, and I understand that, but yeah, it's another frustration. <laughs> but it's once that park can be developed, that's something that yep. will be done, looked at, a lot of public input, a lot of yep. okay. what are we missing, what do we need. And, all right. Yeah, I was kind of hoping for the Tab Ray Memorial Pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> we were just talking about that. About that. Yeah. It's, it's not the memorial too late. part. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 you're not a going in the yeah, cemetery. Right. <laughs> you could chair the commission, Tab, in your new role as a retiree. As a uh, volunteer, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, we ready to move on to Civic Center? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. To, to Edie's point, should we just start moving forward a little bit with it? Because again, we've basically encouraged the fair to be ready to do something different by 2021. Mm -hmm. Even if Champions Ridge would not move forward, I think we would still want to encourage them to look for something different just because of their growth, the impact to the neighborhood. So I would, it seems like maybe we could take a few initial steps to get down to 10,000 feet? Uh, I think it's certainly possible. I think one of the issues we've talked about that we look at is it may not even be the pool as much as the diamonds that are still there themselves. So I'm not saying it, but I mean, it's say for some reason the project doesn't go through. What do we do with those diamonds? Do they stay there? Do they go? That has a big bearing on what that pool looks like. Are we going to move it? Are we going to expand it? Can we with what's there? Can we reconfigure the entire thing? And by taking the buildings out on the uh, west side, that's not as much of an issue. We can take those out, put our golf shop there. I mean, that can all get configured, but it really comes down to the diamonds that are still there. Do we keep all three? Do we go down to two? And that you won't know until the project is or isn't going to go, because when if it doesn't, what do those diamonds do? Where do they go? It is really that chain reaction of years of advance looking. We can certainly get somebody to draft up a possibility or two. Uh, if, if the focus is on the pool and... In the kingdom, right? Get that nailed down. You can always start moving the pieces around it after that. You know, if but the there was stays. talk, do you move the pool to where the diamond is? Do you change the configuration completely? And that's if so. That, we're assuming we stick it in the same spot. Seems like that's what I'm trying to get. We we can certainly do it. Seems Absolutely. like I ought to do an overall plan 
in that area instead of piecemealing it. Maybe do it in phases, construct it in phases, but have a grand plan. So, you know, aquatic space. Well, you talk to someone that you maybe more fine tuned possibility of what these could look like in different scenarios. I mean, we could certainly investigate the cost. Of we we've that. got a drawing of a lazy river complex to the west of the existing pool, right. and then have either redone or a completely new pool in its existing position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, we've you know we've kind of waited this long, um, and you know, hopefully, we'll know more in March. Uh, at we least can a get little, some costing though. Let's at least look and see what it would yeah. cost to get some renditions of some possible full park plans, knowing certain things that this will definitely be the case. This, we're not quite sure, and, and maybe we can look at what that would be. Talk to AHTS or someone that's sending some good local work for us. See if they could really draft up just some options. Because has there been, I mean, be. has Leisure Services Commission talked about all the components you want in Memorial Park? We've done very generally. We have a, okay. we did a, like I said, 10,000 foot plan. I've got my office of, of spaces that, that could possibly happen. And we ha just have a list of what we brain ch brainstormed of things that could be in there. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, Kids Kingdom, you know, mm -hmm. there's 26 things out of standard there. Do we repair it or do we move it or do we put something new in? You know, just things like that. Um, and, and, uh, do we so we don't really have anything solid. Right. You know? I'm just thinking about festivals like Heritage Days that rely on that space. And right. yeah. depending yeah. on where the fairgrounds goes, might not be able to have it at the fairgrounds. Right. So and that's part of, I guess, they would have to consider open space. What the yeah. Right. Right. The all inclusive or side. Community where we're trying building, to head with like things. the 4-H building serves as. But you do know. you get a kids' kingdom? It's all inclusive now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is right. that the next yeah. phase? How big does that need to be? So yeah, all good things that we've been talking about mm -hmm. is just putting it all in one spot is again it's like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. yeah. what well, can go and it where. is like you said, domino too. Uh, yeah. That's another reason yep. we just need to get moving. Yeah. But we'll talk to HDS or something and see about some costing and what it would be to get some renditions done of what that overall could look like with different scenarios. We can certainly do that. Civic Center? Civic Center. The Civic Center uh, is, uh, we've got a quarter of a full-time person there and a permanent part-time custodian in personnel. Uh, the big things in here are the capital, They're, they're under uh, furniture and fixtures. We've got uh, handicapped door buttons. The buttons we have out here on these doors are original with the building. We want to get the larger stainless steel kind where people can see them. The buttons are getting kind of unresponsive. And this will be a wireless system. We have a wireless system here now, but this will be an upgraded wireless system. Uh, the drinking fountain, uh, we'd like to have a bottle filler on that. That's also original equipment. Um, he goes down there and fills his bottle about every day, so oh, exactly. we, need, we need one of those. We'll call it the, the Bronner Station. Uh, <laughs> we don't need to be naming any more things in the building. Just... And then these chairs out here are kind of bad shape. They're, the, you can see some of the foam on some of the chairs. There's some stains that haven't come up. So we're looking at replacing the uh, audience chairs out here. Um, and then under building improvements, we have um, the uh, tuck pointing is a, a routine maintenance thing that we do every six or seven years of the building. And then uh, we've, we've struggled from the beginning with the cooling tower that's lower than the, the HVAC system, so we've had to prime the pump all the time. So this there's a, the money to raise the cooling tower up so we don't have to prime it. It stays, uh, stays prime. tuck pointing? Tuck point is more is, around the brickwork. Yeah. It cracks around the bricks, it's taking the mortar out and redoing it so it doesn't get water behind and pop right. the brick. Anne has never lived in a brick house. I guess not, nor had a fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> I have not had a fireplace. Okay, any questions on Civic Center? I think your last one's a big one then, vegetation yeah. management. <laughs> Vegetation management, the model has always been two full-time people in this new division. We hired one full-time person last year. I've got my pictures here. Before and afters. Yeah, I got. These were on the bulletin board for a while. If you hadn't had a chance to take a look at them, it's pretty dramatic what 
one there's person has done. This is down by the golf course. This is um, looking across the street to uh, the Little League. Uh, did some work along the riverbank there. 29th Avenue Southeast. Riverview Park, which is uh, um, off of uh, Hickory Heights, is that right? Yeah. East Bremer Avenue, uh, visibility of the sign and the walkway. 39th Street Southeast. And then uh, this is what Mike was talking about. This is the existing tractor mm -hmm. and the arm mower which is capital equipment. We're buying the arm mower and they're buying the tractor and moving the tractor over to us. So as he explained, we'll be doing those. This has been just an outstanding piece of equipment to maintain the trail, maintain ditches and all that sort of thing. And uh, they're pretty costly. Uh, we're looking at one just a little bit bigger than this. Um, and uh, obviously we need counterweights and that sort of thing on the tractor. But uh, that's the capital for it. What year is that in it? Mm -hmm. Is it an 80? This is the one that's being phased out. Okay. So the replacement tractor yeah. for this is primarily going to be a, a public services tractor, but they're going to borrow it to use the on Right. Yeah. The other tractor gets transferred to vegetation management. That's got the pull behind mowers on it and stuff. That will be very permanent. But the replacement one is going to be for composting and more time it's used with a snowblower, and then it's also got the on But the big thing in this one is another full time person. Uh, basically, um, we're unable to do key core duties without using employees from parks or public works. Uh, many times tasks like trimming and cutting trees, prairie maintenance, spraying, stump removal, right-of-way mowing cannot be done safely or efficiently with only one person. Adding another employee will prevent the division from becoming to a halt whenever the manager needs to attend a meeting or a conference or is away at work or away from work. Um, and then, uh, so that's got another person in there. The, um, you can see what we did with one person and one seasonal person, so we're thinking we can actually make some real progress with a second. Uh, the other thing in here is a um, minor equipment. We are looking at a mule type vehicle that is uh, off-road, four-wheel drive. Uh, it's it's like a uh, recreational vehicle, but it's, it's more for um, uh, work. Uh, we're going to write a grant. One of the benefits of becoming uh, integrated roadside vegetation management uh, 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 qualified community is we can write grants for equipment. So we're going to write a grant for this piece of equipment. If we don't get it, then we don't, won't, won't buy it. So, uh, but we think this would be really handy to work on the areas that, uh, like detention basins and, and those types of things. Uh, we got stuck four times last year with a pickup. We don't think we can get stuck with this. So that's not in the budget itself as it sits. It will only be entered into if the grant is successful and we would amend it in then at the time. I know this is probably a very tangential comment and, you know, with 9,800 people or whatever it is in Waverly, you've probably got 9,800 opinions about this, but, um, I, you know, my, 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 I only gulp a little bit. I, I'm, in general, I think I'm supportive of this position, except that I hope it doesn't mean we're going to just buzz everything off. <laughs> Um, you know, some of your p pictures here, to me, the before looks better than the after. Um, and, you know, so I, I just hope, uh, you know, I hope it doesn't become sort of, uh, you know, an efficient... Slash and burn. Yes, yeah, slash, right, slash and burn. Well, they burn all the time. Well, I was going to ask is, that because... Th this is basically cutting down weeds and uh, noxious type things. Okay. Uh, and we, our plan is to start like putting... Trees, trees, and, trees and bushes. Trees. Yeah. <laughs> they're cedars. They, they're, yeah. they're cedars. Yeah. Yeah. They're cedars. Tabs on his way out. <laughs> I, I can comment. Oh, yes. Okay, oh, good. Oh, yes, please do. Because, Paul, please, please yeah. tell Paul, us you're replanting some stuff. Okay, okay. All right, so there are a few areas. And you are? I am Paul Chevelle, public grounds. 
superintendent. There you go. So there has been some comments back and forth I've heard on uh, some particular areas. Things kind of got cut back a little too far. There was a little rough cut. Want to know, like you saw the cedar tree, some people have mentioned, hey, why are those uh, getting taken down? Well, first, first off, a lot of these areas we haven't been able to touch ever. Uh, Public Works wasn't able to get to them. Uh, they were doing just the safety mows along along the ditches. So uh, we've been able to get into a few now with uh, Eric and get to some of that stuff. Some of these cedar trees, they depending on how you look at well, a weed is a plant that's out of place. Mm -hmm. Cedar trees are gorgeous. I love cedar trees. It's the only native conifer to Iowa. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe white pines way up northeast, but basically that's it. It invites a lot of wildlife right to the roadsides. It gets invasive. It starts uh, multiplying. Next thing you know, you've got solid cedar. So kind of to touch on the cedar, people see them getting mowed off or cut off. That's, that's what we're dealing with. Uh, a good example of that is when you're headed in or out of town to the south, where they planted a lot of deciduous trees and stuff on the interchange. Mm -hmm. If you drive by there, look, solid cedars. So, and that's just going to be a cedar forest, and that's okay there, but none of that was really intended. That's how invasive they can be. And when I say invasive, I don't want to say it's a bad plant, because it's not, but it's got to be in the right spot. Part of our, our uh, integrated roadside vegetation management, that's what we applied for, what, 18 months ago or, or so? Part of that is um, implementing plans and, and ways of doing things. You know, you got a lot of talks about water qualities and what are you doing with the runoffs and, and all this. We've got retention, detentions, we've got uh, some rollish type ditches that are drainage for tiles for farm fields. We have all that. And instead of just letting it be, it's time we start uh, paying attention to what's going on there. What plant material can we put in that's going to help filter that stuff, that's going to be, uh, you know, going to do well. We've got different noxious weeds that are starting to come into a lot of our ditches with the, the poison hemlock and uh, a few Sounds others. Like the yellow werewolves or something. So yeah, there's, there's, there is, there's a lot of stuff happening that you, you drive by, you see yellow flowers, and it, <laughs> it looks beautiful, but it's actually invasive and taking over everything. And some of that's the wildlife that does go through there doesn't like, and it's not really doing much as far as filtering any water, slowing down the water so it's not dumping into our rivers and streams faster. So I don't know. And it's not going to be let's clear cut everything, spray it all down, and go to all bluegrass. No, we're not doing that. That's not what we want to do. Exact opposite. What you might notice at first is something like that might have to happen in order to get the right plants in the right place. It's a lot of talks of native plants blue stems, native forbs, pollinators. I mean, these are the big things. We're trying to get back to where we were 80, 90 years ago before all we did was manicure our lawns. That's and helpful. we want to I get that, better. all yeah. that. We feel better, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I, I can no, Another no, one I want to mention is, yeah. you know, we've got reap stuff that, we've got reap grants and other stuff. You know, and we're trying to, we never really had a management program for that. So a lot of that's where a second person can really come into play. We can manage these mm -hmm. things that Mike's got grants for, that we've developed Red, Red Cedar Park that used to be a dump, and then we get all this mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. But now it's time to we got to take care of it to keep it keep it nicer. It's, so is there room I, for like, partnerships I like with this guy? I like everything he's saying. Because, um, <laughs> they can't hear me. <laughs> I like you too. Todd. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to take years. Yeah. To, yeah. And you're going to, some of the first things you're going to see are kind of like you know, slash and burn, but it's going to take a while. And and. You know, 20 years ago when we were doing detention facilities and stuff, it was just plant to rural grass. And now uh, the, the one thing I want to really emphasize, point out, is what the middle school did. It was absolutely gorgeous with the waterways and stuff, but it's not a one and done. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they're going to be struggling with, too, is how do you manage and maintain it so that you don't end up with all these volunteer trees and things going in. 
So those are some of the things. As we go forward, you know, we need to be able to manage and maintain them. We want to go back to some of the stuff that was done 20 years ago and get the get the better vegetation in there, get the pollinator uh, stuff in there, so that uh, we'll just be that much better. But it will take time, and it takes it takes someone who knows how to plan and develop those those features. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and it seems like there'd be room for partnership with the schools, whether it's Hawkeye yep. or the school system. I was, we were talking about that, like we were listening to the ambulance folks about, just like we're trying to get local kids to go into manufacturing, um, it's like we need to partner locally to get kids into this sort of field and into EMS, mm -hmm. paramedic field, to keep them local and train we, them. We are starting to think of those things. For instance, there's some rural... Uh, 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 roads in town that we're trying to, to cooperate with Bremer County to do some things on their ditches because our road goes into the county. And then also, uh, the, he mentioned the middle school, the area behind uh, Southeast. We've started working on that with the school. So, yeah. so uh, I, I think the potential's there. I know uh, Eric came back from some of the educational things that we sent him to, and he said, do you know what we can do with pollinators? Do you know what we can do with butterfly gardens? You know? <laughs> so he's fired up. Yeah. And, so, and you can't tell Paul's not either. <laughs> so with this position then, this time of year, they transition and help with other snow removal, snow removal mm -hmm. et cetera. Or and we're getting more trails and sidewalks all the time. True. This is probably not, are we done with the vegetation one? I got a kind of a general tab question. Yep, we're good. Um, with the extensive trail system we have, and some of them have quite a bit of age on them, and thinking of the rail trail, that type of thing, where in your budget do resurfacing of those come into play and that type of thing? On that point, bridge replacement, we've got some of those that are looking a little tough in the trail system, and. Um, I can kind of run through quickly how are we going to start to address that in time frame? So like a lot of the existing trail system we, we have on the same seven year uh, sidewalk inspection program. Uh, rail trail, we went out, we did some, some leveling repair. We're thinking 2025 is going to be the big rehab year, so probably trail resurfacing. Uh, this year we're doing trail bridge inspection. That's going to tell us a lot more. But a lot of those structures are going to age out in, in the next five to ten years. So it is on our radar screen. It's just not quite in that five-year window yet. Okay. So that's about the time that big bridge is going to be looked at. And what do we do with that? Because it's getting a little tough. I just know get roots, all of that type of thing, we'll do their, their damage, let alone being asphalt in this nature. So okay. it's good that I didn't doubt that we weren't looking ahead. I just wondered where it fit. And yeah, we're a few years out from starting to take a real hard look at what are we going to do to resurface again. Bridges have been a big one we can kind of start to look at because some of them are showing some pretty good wear. It's like any other bridge. You've got to plan those. It'll sever the trail for a while, and some are pretty good size. So. Um, anything else, Kevin? That's all I got. Any questions overall? Congratulations. Yeah. Enjoy your retirement. Yep. Thanks a lot for the years. I'm sure I'm going to make several speeches in the next <laughs> couple of months, but appreciate the opportunity to serve the citizens of Waverly. Are you, uh, and you're, and you're a good counsel. Thank you. Are, you. are you going to tell us what your calendar is at the end of the year so we know when to schedule your roast? <laughs> May 12th. Yes. May, May 13th May is 13th. my last day. It's a Monday. All right. I'll so be retired on May 14th. All right. <laughs> we better right. switch. We'll put that on Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a we don't have council that day. We don't have council that day. It could be a second Monday. Sort of special. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Special. 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 Yeah, we could do that. All right. We'll jump into, uh, again, we have about four or five small budgets to hit, and we're going to jump into capital, and I'll run you through that. It's going to be probably quicker than you think because we're limited what we can do. So uh, we'll have a uh, bill start going through economic development and uh, community development. So economic development, uh, there's not a lot of change with personnel. Well, there isn't any change. Uh, it's still uh, Connie and Paige and I with our different percentages. Um, we still receive about close to $50,000 a year from the economic, or from the Waverly Utilities uh, for their portion of that economic development contribution. That's about 20% of the budget. 
Um, in previous years, you see the last three years, there's been some allocations for projects. That's where my time was budgeted, or was actually allocated to the Bremer Avenue project when I did a lot of work on that project. And uh, default, they just put it through the, the uh, economic development budget. Um, in the future, I'll probably put more things through the legal budget than the economic development budget. But that was the way we credited all that time I spent on Bremer Avenue with the different water services and some of those, those kinds of things. Um, we could allocate that to the project. Um, the focus this year has been on workforce development, and we're going to continue that in the coming year. We've been working with the manufacturers. Um, we're going to continue to do that. Um, the quality of life, uh, that's the, the big item there for $60,000 that's in the budget. Um, 60000 that is for Amperage. Um, you've, you've seen that the detail is in that packet, too. Um, it actually shows their, um, their estimate of, of cost for the next over two years. Um, we think that we need to move forward with this, and, and I, we think fairly strongly, because what we're hearing over and over is it's workforce. It's workforce, workforce, workforce. How do we get people here? If every one of our employees needs people and can't get people, it's hard to recruit another company to take to take more of that, to have more of those problems. So the first thing we want to do is to make sure that we can First of all, keep our students here, train our students, make sure that maybe they can stay around and do work for us. And we're working with those manufacturers with the state's programs, um, with Hawkeye Community College's programs, the pre-apprenticeship things. The, um, those are all things that we think is, is, is crucial to try to keep more of our, our students here, our, our high school students stay in, in, in the area. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that I put down 60000 because that's the minimum we need to really get started this year. And there's some things that are I have an asterisk by them on that amperage proposal. And those are the things that they think we really need to do to start with. We want to have a, uh, a website that would be a promotional type website for Waverly. Um, our current city website is functional. It's there, but it's not a promotional type thing. And we think this will be a great way to have a separate um, uh, a quality of life type uh, vehicle to use by our employers, by our, our different entities, um, and, and we think that's going to be a, a great way of moving forward. I've asked the, the chamber to consider uh, contributing to this plan. I haven't got a response back from them, so I don't know what that's going to be if, if we get something from the chamber with regards to this budget. And I have talked with a few um, uh, business owners and industry owners about the idea of asking them to contribute to a one-time um, ask for participation in this particular program. And we're going to show them the deliverables. We're talking about uh, digital products. We're talking about advertising. We're talking about uh, things that they can copy and provide to their uh, prospective employees, uh, trade show materials, and our participation in, in uh, job fairs, trade shows, anything we can do as staff to work with their people when they're trying to recruit people. Uh, one thing we found is the few times we've been able to do this, when they've had people in interviewing and we've taken them out and shown them the city, they were amazed at how much we could show them compared to what the employers are able to show them. And the fact that there was a, a, a somebody from the city that wanted to show off all these things really impressed those people. And we think that we're gonna, we want to expand that way beyond the few employers we were working with to start with. And so we think this is a really important thing that we really want to drive in in the future. Um, so at this point, the, the, the amperage ask is really that minimum 60000 and hopefully I can make that up with the rest of it um, uh, for with other partners. If we don't, we'll probably come back next year for another thirty to forty thousand dollars to finish the, the the program that's that's being proposed here. Any questions about that aspect, the amperage? What, how much have we given them so far, and what uh, do we have to it, show for it other than a slogan that didn't really? Well, we, strike we, we got a lot of data, we got a lot of information about what, what people perceive us as, what, what we think we should be. They, we've started with some proposed um, marketing campaign uh, slogans and that kind of thing. Um, we are moving forward with developing those kinds of things, and, and now it's really the deliverables. They want to use stills, they want to use videos, they want to use things like that. We've already started um, through the Live the Valley 
um, we're a part of that group. And we had a videographer from Wartburg go out and take stills and videos during the uh, Christmas on Main. And we got some just amazing, amazing footage. And we think that's the kind of thing that we can do all year long in terms of uh, Heritage Days and, and Oktoberfest and just use of the dog park, use of the pools, use of the golf course, all those things that we want to highlight and put together in a slick package that people can use. Um, we know we're a great community and people want to be here, but we're not getting everybody that we want to attract here. And, it's, and we, sometimes we have to bring them from out of state, actually most of the time, because everybody in the state is, is dealing with this problem. So we're trying to recruit them from out of state. we got to show them how great Waverly is and how great this, this area is. And this is a, one way we think we can do that. Uh, I saw that we were Iowa was... Uh, number one in, in, in uh, unemployment rate, which means it's the lowest, and I don't think that's a good thing. <laughs> I mean, it's nice that we're, we have people employed, but yeah. what that means is we're, we don't have enough people here. Work. And we really need to have more people here because I always learned in economics in, my, in college that 5% was kind of your maintenance rate. So if you're below 5%, you're, you're in a problem situation. So, and I know all of Iowa is facing the same thing. So we have to look outside the box and see how we can recruit from outside and bring them in from outside the state. And, and that's what we're going to try to do. So you um, say, uh, Bill, you say that, that Wartburg students, I assume communi communication students perhaps, were documenting um, Christmas on Main. Would they be? No, this wasn't a, students. These were, um, this was some of the, I think they have on staff that was working with us, or working for us at this. We, we oh. paid them to do it. Okay. Are you planning to do yeah. that for the rest of the year? We're going to try to do it as much as possible. That was a $250 expenditure that the, that the Live the Valley helped us with because some of that's going to be used in the Live the Valley advertisement that they're doing. It, we're kind of doing similar things to what Live the Valley is, but it's going to be specific for Waverly, and it's going to be preparing or uh, creating product that we can provide to our employers to use for, for, for recruiting. And we, we hope to go across to all kinds of types of employers, not just manufacturers, can be used by the hospital, can be used by the school, can be used by anybody else. Let's live the valley. Live the valley is the, um, the actually the regional partnership, the six county area, okay. and the uh, Cedar, uh, uh, the, uh, the alliance is, is part of that, the alliance and chamber. Oh. <coughs> Cedar Valley Alliance. And everybody is kind of contributing to that, so they try to hit all the communities that are part of that. So it's not just live Cedar Rapids, or Cedar Falls, Waterloo, it's live the valley, which brings in Waverly and Independence and and Grundy Center and New Hampton and those places. So we're trying to kind of mimic that a little bit, but focus it on, on Waverly and using similar type uh, advertising, but, but probably more, more directed towards areas where we want to recruit. So. Rhinebeck has been promoting on TV rather frequently. Who yep. put that together? Did they put it together, or a marketing company, or? I'm guessing they had a consultant to do that. I, you know, our, our consultant is looking at probably more digital advertising than um, than TV and radio, because we're trying to expand beyond our market, and the TV market. We're not really trying to take people from the other people in our in our market region. No, I region. understand that. Yeah, but. yeah. But it's it's really a it, it's really an information it's really ex allowing people to explore what is in Waverly because they really don't get they get here they drive down the street they go to the interview and then drive away and go back and they don't see all the things that are available because it's hard to see that and so we want to show it to them digitally you know with a with a video or or pictures and descriptions and we want them we want our employers to be able to make their own materials from what we create so they can use those materials. And you know, we've talked about a limited ask, we're not talking about large, large quantity from people, but we think that if they could help us with this initial, this initial push, that that's what we're gonna look to do uh, in the next couple months. I mean, I like the idea of a separate website to do this instead of trying to integrate it into the city, because I think there is two different audience, two different purposes. Right. As you talk through it, I'm wondering, is there the opportunity for the employers in town to put together a 30, 60, 90 minute video that we could put out there. Yeah, let's sell them on how great the city is, but here's something to sell you on the employers. Right, when we're selling the city, we're gonna sell the school system. So if the school puts together uh, information and, 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 data and, and pictures and things that, that we can use, or if the employers do the same thing, 
that can be brought into that. I mean, we, we just look at that as a beginning, and then we're going to put our materials on and our, our product and then look forward to, to adding things that do that. Maybe the golf course does something promotional. Maybe, you know, we want to bring in the amenities so that people can see them. Now, we don't overwhelm them so they won't sit there for 25 minutes or something, but it's still got to be a product that, that uh, can be there. And, you know, and a slogan is not a bad thing, you know, or something that you can use as a campaign type of a thing. And we think that that's, uh, we're well on the way to getting started on that. And, and uh, um, I see that happening this spring because that's part of our current contract. And I think it's 35 or 40,000, if I remember rightly, that we've spent mm -hmm. so far, committed so far. Um, the other thing is that I'll have to bring up to you is that um, the Cedar Valley Regional Partnership that we've touted for many years, uh, six county region, including the, uh, the Alliance and Chamber, um, is to find out some bad news. Um, our, our IEDA grant matches um, that have been going on for several years are just, just stopped abruptly. So in the, in the past, we've received up to $42,500 matched through IEDA. And now our match is, is zero. So as of this fiscal year, we're going to have, um, we have a carry forward of about $54,000, but only new money is going to be the partners match, our, our partners contributions, which total about $21,250. But going forward, we really only have $21,250 each year. So we're going to have to ask ourselves as a regional partnership whether we're going to increase our contributions. And that may be possible for some of the communities, but it may not be possible for all the communities. Where are you on that chart? Are you on that chart somewhere? With the, this, the partnership we're losing? That information, I don't think, is in the budget. Or is it not on there? It is, it is not in the budget. Okay. I just I, We just found mm -hmm. out about this. Okay. And we're not putting anything in this year's because we have $53,000. The, the regional partnership has $53,000 carried forward. And so we're looking at the next budget year that we're going to do that. So I'm just putting this on the on the on your radar that in the future, and it's going to really cause a re-evaluation of what that partnership is and what it does. Over the last three years, we've spent one year fifteen thousand, one year seventeen thousand, one year thirty-eight thousand, one year seventy thousand. So there's there's a lot of things that we've done with with job boards, regional job boards that we just made sure that that everybody accesses all six counties with our job postings. <coughs> and we have like joint advertising, joint uh, participation in trade shows, um, site selector visits, those kinds of things. They're not going to be possible with a twenty-one thousand dollar budget. And so we're just going to have to really rethink how that happens in the future. So coming the next budget, we'll be talking about those kinds of things. We really have to see how this plays out. But I just want to make that make you aware of that. Um, and we still are looking for sites. So we, we that's that's one of those things that now it's more incremental. It's how can we fill in? When when do we find out things are being becoming available? And how can we work with infrastructure assistance and those kinds of things to assist um, uh, developing business sites as opposed to taking out 300 acres and trying to figure out how we're going to put streets and, and water and sewer to it. I mean, we still keep an eye on those things because sometimes those things come available and you can't not jump on that opportunity to do that. Um, we haven't had that come up, but if that ever comes up, we're going to have to try to figure out what we can do. Um, in that situation. So that's economic development. Any questions on that? The community development is, is um, similar. At, you know, obviously, Rachel's a new employee in our, in our planning and, and zoning um, as a code administration. Um, she is. Uh, she's been here for for a number of months now and doing very well in, in assimilating, figuring out what what, what her her uh, role is, um, discovering new things. Um, I know that her budget this year is probably lower than it's going to be in future years because she doesn't know what kind of memberships. She was from Minnesota. She hasn't got into the memberships of some of these associations or the training opportunities and those kinds of things. And once she's w able to do that in the next. Uh, a budget year, I think that we'll see some items listed in those uh, categories so that she can move forward with helping to train the PNZ, providing things for the Board of Adjustments, um, those kinds of things. What we did put in there that's, that's un uh, different from previous years is the housing study. 
the last housing study in Waverly was done kind of in the 13-14 uh, year, and I think it was dated in, the, in 2014. Um, and what we found with that is once people found out we had one, we had a, a large number of people asking for that study and using that study to justify um, doing development by justify getting loans to do development. Um, I think it's probably the, one of the biggest reasons why we have the apartment building construction going on um, that, that we would not have had done. Um, we were not required, we didn't have to, to make a big incentives like a lot of the communities were, were having to do to get that done because they saw the needs and we still think people are looking at that now people are a little bit cautious about things and the, and the single family housing has, has slowed down substantially um, at least the last year was only 10 starts in, in single family housing which it had been 25 to 30 in the past um, but that was a little bit over building with with Omni you know building a lot of homes in a, in a short period of time too but we also only have 70 or less lots available, and we don't have, and I think I counted, we had 39 houses on the, on the market right now in the, in the entire community. So we certainly have housing needs, and we'd like to see some more subdivisions um, begun and, and get those open so we can get some more lots available. But the housing study was, was really important last time, and this time I think we can use Intercog. They've started doing that since the, since 2014. They've really got into that business and done a lot of those with a lot of our regional uh, uh, people. And so I think that's a good way to, to get a good housing study updated at that time. So we're going to do that probably in the spring of 20, but in the 1920 budget, but in that springtime. And that'll mean that, that a lot of those apartments will be, will be completed, and we'll, we'll get some vacancy information. We'll, get, we'll find out how much, uh, let's call it occupancy, rather than vacancy information. So hopefully we'll have a lot of occupancy of those and see if that's working for us. Um, other than that, that, that's community development. We're going to continue to up, update. Um, Rachel's working on uh, some changes and updates in her, in her uh, um her area in, in ordinances that will help with, with development and uh, planning. Any questions about community development? So the legal budget, we're finally getting into a point where, where we have the, the format that we're going to use kind of going forward with the legal budget. We've um, what we have is 40% is, uh, of my time and a third of Paige's time on this budget. And then we show all of the outside legal expenses that we're incurring per year um, for a variety of things, not just for me, but for uh, if there's any um, information we have to pay for, for uh, legal advice, uh, for bonding, for TIF, for those kinds of things, it's going to be shown in this budget. Um, if there's uh, negotiations for, for union negotiations and we need legal, that's going to be in this budget. Um, that's, that, that means it's going to go up and down somewhat depending upon what that year it brings. Um, and we'll get it adjusted as we kind of get more experience in doing it as a separate budget. Because I think some of these items had been previously with, with administration, I think, or um, some other things that now we've kind of separated out so we can kind of focus on what, what this will look like. There isn't really any significant changes in the items on the budget. It just might look differently than it has in the past for that for that reason. So the higher legal fees that you anticipate, is that related to union negotiations or? I believe there was that for this year that part of that was in the detail that there was a, there was some union negotiations. Both contracts up this fall, so we'll have that expense. And then as we go through our TIF ordinances, you know, a few times as well, that costs and adds up. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and we do contact gailers off and on for certain code issues that we come across or whether it's a bond usage or, and all that comes out of here as well. And I, and I would say that for TIF, we've been transitioning because we're 20 years out from where the big, large amount of property that was put in TIF. And as we've talked about, we're removing properties, putting back properties back in, and we're doing that a couple times. So I'll be coming back to you with another urban renewal plan amendment and another TIF ordinance to, to, to change. And then there may be one more amendment after that that's not going to be a TIF amendment. It may be just to add projects. So once we get settled into where our property is in there that we want to be in there, we may just do simple amendments to add projects to our urban renewal plan. That, and that doesn't take a lot of 
work. That's just a simple thing. It's the TIF ordinance that becomes kind of complicating when you do that. But we had to do that to remove these properties that were that are going to be developed and that we will be providing uh, potential incentives or infrastructure assistance. Any questions about that? That's all I have. Thank you. All right, so a few budgets left. We'll jump through here and we'll get into capital road projects. So let Carla come up and take us through council admin, your own budget, and then a uh, city clerk budget. I just start up something a little light. Uh, every year for, I don't, as long as I've been here, we've put these little conversation hearts around. And I just find it a little ironic that a lot of conversation was sparked by conversation hearts. <laughs> <laughs> Being that they're going to be uh, not anymore very soon. We did purchase them this year. They're not old. <laughs> Um, so, starting out with the Mayor Council Administrator budget, not a whole lot has changed. Um, for, uh, I guess uh, the biggest change would be I took $15,000 out of the um, consultant professional budget because we're not planning any strategic planning this year. We don't need to hire a facilitator or any professional consultant for that. Um, EAP was actually moved from the city clerk's budget over into city council budget. Uh, James and I talked about it, I think with Jenny too, and we just That's felt true. that it was a better place for it. Um, and then the minor equipment, I took out $2,000 because we don't need to purchase a laptop this in this fiscal year. We're actually getting that this spring in the current fiscal year. So um, other than that, the salaries and wages, of course, you guys determine your own <laughs> wages. So until you tell me to raise them and we go through all of Hello. the necessary requirements to do so, they'll stay the same. And then it's just uh, James's that would increase incrementally. Any questions on that? Yeah, just a budget. question, comment on the consultant. Um, it came up at uh, the chamber board meeting uh, when I gave my update that we're a ways out now from the last community strategic planning we did, that it may be, because a lot of what came out of that was not necessarily things we as a council or city staff would focus on. I'm wondering if we should leave a little bit in there to reconvene that group in some fashion to say, how are you coming on your block parties? How are you coming on these type of things? Again, I don't know if that's pizza at 5 o'clock sometime or, or, or something like that. But yeah. just so we don't lose the traction from that strategic planning, just a touch base to, to re-energize the group, see where they're at. I know. Cool. Rod spent a lot of time on the daycare issue, and I think that's made some progress. And to see if by reconvening we can re-energize, keep it moving, that type of thing. That would certainly do. When would you kind of envision that happening? Probably this. I'm trying to remember when the strategic planning was. August. August. September, September, late summer, August. September. So it's right August. August. Six months. Mid August. Yeah, sometime. Uh, so I guess that would be this budget year. So. Yeah. End of February ish mm. after we get to the budget mayor to, to see kind of done, or maybe after maybe March. get through budget first, so maybe after March, because yeah. I'd get through budget and let it at least look not so dismal out. Maybe it'd be better to, <laughs> uh, I don't know if the spring would work, sir, for us to reconvene. Or? Yeah, I didn't even think that I was probably suggesting something before this budget even took place. So. But we can locate it in this budget or try to. I think, it shouldn't I cost think we too can come much. up with that. Okay. That's not a problem. We'll I've, see when you wouldn't want to do it. Yeah, so. I've looked at the report various times, and there are some things that were going to be done 
the last quarter of 2018 or before, even the end of the second quarter, uh, a lot of it has not been touched. Yep. I know Hank Bagelman did tell me the other day that his mission statement group is ready to convene and uh, they're going to work on that and uh, yeah, brought some, some things. So I think it's time probably in, you know, into the end of March or April. Okay. Yeah, anything would work fine. Sounds good. Okay, moving on to the city clerk's budget. Um, I have to find my notes here. A few things have changed on this one. Um, we are. I've looked at a couple of different things as far as the internet, uh, telephones, website, agenda, those kind of things have all been kind of filling up some of my time. So when I look at um, the the software and updates for the telecommunications, that, that uh, account number 6373, it ends in those numbers, that's basically telephone expenses for if you see that in various departments, any of them that end in those four digits are typically telephone type expenditures. Um, we need to update our telephone software. Uh, we won't bother re, you know, purchasing new telephones, but our software that he manages our telephones expires, uh, the, the software Industry. doesn't, the support expires December 31st of 2019. So um, we need to look at that. That's, uh, it, it's gonna basically operate in the same way. There'll just be obviously some updates, much like Windows does. Um, so that's an that's an expense we'll have to incur. Uh, the new the vehicles for repair and maintenance I've actually decreased some since we traded or we we got rid of or traded out the old Taurus the 2001 and got a new Ford Escape. I didn't anticipate our repairs to be as much, and if there are some repairs, I would hope that they would be warranty covered. So I, I lowered that, <clears throat> pardon me. And then, um, I'm not seeing what I'm looking for. The contract services. Thank so. you. <clears throat> well, e contract services, yes, we uh, have the in there agenda manager. That's actually what I'm looking for. There it is. In capital equipment, we have $34,000 budgeted, and that is 30,000 of that is for a new agenda manager system. I know I talked last year about an agenda management system that we could do in house. I kind of got the feeling from council that maybe a need for something a little more robust was there. And so I've actually looked at eight different companies and um, kind of compared each of them for these various re or, and took into account these various items. So in doing so, I found a, a company, it's called Civic Plus. Actually, several other cities use that software in the state of Iowa. And as you can see by the total numbers, it is pretty close as far as what they offer and what they don't offer. Pretty much across the board, they offer like um, streaming of the council meetings, the cloud, those type of things. Um, we, we felt like Civic Plus was the one that we wanted to go with just because of the backside usage of us loading it onto the system, the view that the customers would, the customers slash citizens would take when they were looking at it. Um, there were many of them that had the agenda and as you go through it, it's just basically you scroll through the entire agenda. It's not outlined to where it's kind of broke down so you can find this is the topic I want to look at and this is the supporting documents, much like we're used to. 
Um, then I just found out last week that they are also now offering closed captioning. And I felt like that was a neat option too. Uh, that way it helps even more of our citizens that don't necessarily be, you have that opportunity to take the full advantage of what we're putting out there. So I guess I would, if council pleases to move forward purchasing a new agenda system, I would recommend this one. And you say our current one, the license is expiring or something? No, actually our current one, we purchased, the city purchased it from what used to be called Networking Solutions, now Bergen, who we use. They wrote it for us. Oh. Um, the person who wrote it for us no longer works with them, so they can't support it. So oh. now we use a company called Letter B who will do some maintenance for us. Uh, they charge $150 an hour to do any type of maintenance. Compounding that would be the fact that our Google Mini, it's the, it's the uh, equipment that's used to do any type of searches for whatever you're looking for on the agenda, past, present, whatever. Um, that's obsolete. We actually had to replace it by one that we found on eBay um, because you, you just don't find them anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that, it was a refurbished one, and we're just kind of limping along with it. Yes, kind of. It goes hoping. out again. You have no searchability. You have nothing left. So we've kind of utilized as much as we can out of what was written, custom for us. How long ago would that have been done? Uh, I want to say two years ago. I think you were just new. When they, I mean, when they wrote the original. Oh, I'm sorry. That was even before I started here in 2003, 2003, or 2003, 2004. So the advances uh, that have occurred in the last 15 years where this was written are far mm -hmm. beyond what we could have imagined. <laughs> so, Carla, on, on the numbering system here, are mm -hmm. these numbers like a zero to five rating system for how good these various components are? This was or, how we felt that they were. Okay, which is good? Which end of the scale is good and which Five's is not? good. If Five's you look at the upper left, well, you can't see it on the screen now. Yeah, was upper I was going to say oh, it got okay. moved. Yeah. And can you, can you maybe send us an email with some examples of towns that use it that we could look at? Um, or something? There so. were a couple of companies that didn't want to give me those, even though I asked for them, oh. such as uh, director point did not want to. But like, do you um, know some of the cities that use Civic Plus? When you're oh, d yes, yeah. that of we could I can. like sure. go and look and try to read their agenda and see sure. what it looks I'm sorry, like. I didn't or, understand. They're yeah. a pretty big player. There's a lot of cities that yeah. use it, so okay. we'll have a pretty good list yeah. of them. Yeah, they're that's one of not the better the known companies around. Is it going to be possible to take our existing old data and have that in the form that people can still search it and access it? Even that was, so new. as a city clerk, that was near and dear to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get sick to my stomach every time I think mm -hmm. of losing that information. Sure. So, yes, um, that is one thing that we want to keep. I did find it interesting that Civic Plus was the only one that was also optioning, offering the option to do web management and control, which means that if you so choose to do a communications marketing person or whatever, we could have the opportunity of potentially building our own website in-house. And we certainly would have the option of more, if we just use what we have, but our staff that we currently use would have more options too. You mentioned streaming capabilities. How, how would the streaming be done differently than it is now? It wouldn't be on YouTube. It would just be on their cloud address. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they have the capacity to search by topic. So if you wanted to go and search past agendas for, I don't know, certain topics, whether it's Champions Ridge or the Parkway or whatever, you could just find all the discussions pertinent to that topic. Yes, okay. Yeah. And the uh, 30, whatever it is here, what's the amount again? Um, it's about thirty-four thousand. That that's the initial, uh, fee, and then fee or uh, purchase mm -hmm. and installation, and then what is there a yearly maintenance fee? Yes, it's about. I, I put in the uh, after in the next year's budget, it would be roughly about sixty-five hundred mm -hmm. each year. 
that's what everybody's kind of gone to. It's, it's we're going to front, but you're going to have this forever going forward. And that's how they're now making their funding versus hitting you with the one time. Everything's licensed now out forever. And mm -hmm. we're seeing that more and more in everything we're doing with technology is there is a fee every year yeah. to keep this. Whereas it used to be you could buy it all and then you didn't worry about it. Now it's a lot less up front, but then you pay for it a lot more going forward. Well, and I think being on the cloud, they're responsible for keeping the infrastructure, yep. technology updated, those types of things. So in the long run, it's less headaches for the user. Is there note-taking capability with this? Yes, I asked about the annotations. So, um, I will mention on the letter B one, that since they are the ones that we currently kind of use for our support, I asked them to let me know or to give me a bid on this, and they were basically going to take what we have and make it better. I mean, as far as feel, design, what it could do, it, it came nowhere close to doing what the other ones will do, and uh, he wanted to charge just as much, so... So, um, and then operating supply or contract services, that's where uh, we put that. So, any other questions on the budget? We do have a general election coming up, so I put that money back into this year's uh, budget. I was just talking to Shelly Wolf the other day, and she was saying that this year's gonna, you're just gonna be able to kind of guesstimate because with the schools now, having their election on the same day as the cities, they don't, uh, she, Shelly told me that there are many auditors out there that are worried that it's gonna cost more. She said at this point she does not see that because it's still the same poll places, the same amount, number of people, things like that. She, but she says, I don't really know until we get there. So I put this much money in for a placeholder. Even though in 1718 it was about $2,000 more? Um, we had a couple of special elections that year. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that, and yeah, those can be costly. I guess I just have one clarification. When you talked about the, the EAP and the council budget and the EAP moving out of the city clerk's budget, as, as, a, as a benefits person, EAP to me means employee assistance plan. Is that what you're talking about? That is exactly correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it really didn't matter moving it one way or the other. It's still, as far as the state is concerned, it's still in the same service area. So it all. It's the administration more overall the entire city versus just city clerk. Just yeah, it makes sense. Just, uh, absolutely. I just wanted to make sure that the, the abbreviation wasn't meaning something else. You were exactly no, I correct. appreciate the asking for clarification. That's all I have. All Thank right. You, yeah. We will jump through finance, jump through wood serving, and take a brief recess, and then we'll jump into capital and road projects and. The accounting department has uh, July 1st of this fiscal year, Waverly Utilities took over all the utilities, and that includes the cities. Uh, so they are doing it all now. So we, you know, staff left. Uh, the way we handle the charges, they handle the charges for us is we pay for one full-time employee to cover our costs of water, sewer, and solid waste charges. Uh, we also had um, hired a human resources manager. She started at the end of last July, and she works 60% for us, or we cover 60% of her wages and benefits. The school covers 40%. So when she first started, she thought she'd be here on certain days there and certain days. Well, it quite hasn't worked out that way, so she goes where she is want needed. Uh, otherwise, as far as the budget goes, it's not changing that much. Um, it, con our consultants and, uh, is our um, for our audits in Gasby and our annual audit. I did put some in there, an additional amount for possibly a single audit. 
you never know what's going to go there or the Gasby to cover that because it's Gasby's always changing and new rules and regulations. Um, so really, our the budget hasn't changed too much. Do you think the 60-40 split for payment of that <clears throat> salary and benefits um, is appropriate to the time she's spending, roughly? I think it's working out okay. I mean, we've both decided that wherever she's needed, she goes. Uh, I think just in her first six months, she's had a lot of situations come up that, you know, she's had to spend just more time at one place or the other. I think it's fair okay. at this point. We do off and on. We'll call her at the school. She'll handle right. our business while there. She'll get calls here. So the physical location may not be yeah, 60 I'm just 40, but I think the, the work has been pretty equivalent. Okay. So she's uh, located at the school, or does she have two desks? Both. Two desks. Uh, she has an office in Jennifer's area, and then she has a desk at the school as well. So It seems like it was a good investment. I yes. think it was a very good investment. Yes, absolutely. Personnel page 3.6 then instead of 1. Yeah, probably. Okay. Oh, well, that, what's I guess that we're idea? paying for the full position, though. We're just getting reimbursed for the full Yes, oh, that's cool. how it's handled. I think that's probably it okay. ended up handling okay. it. But no, I understand what you're saying. That is interesting. Is that really a point 0.6 when it's all said and done? Mm -hmm. What was that? The, the personnel the box on the box on the bottom. It shows a full FTE at the bottom. Maybe it should be a point six since we're oh, really. Right. That can be changed. Yep. That's a good catch. And think about it. But yeah, you see the HR fees in the top. That's the 40% offsetting the cost overall in personnel. So. Okay. Anything else? Not it for me. Any questions then on finance? All right, what's the last departmental budget we need to get through? Yes, sir. Part of the discussion when the uh, city utilities went over to Waverly Utilities was just customer confusion on who to call, that type of thing. Has, has that materialized? How is I didn't hear you, Dan. Uh, one of the, the cautions we had when we were talking about moving the Waverly Utility payment process over to Waverly Utility mm -hmm. was that a citizen would come in wanting to talk about their water sewer bill here when they really needed to go over to the utility office or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Have we really had folks confused and showing up at the wrong place? And when it first started, yes. And we just directed them over to Waverly Utilities. Right now we have very little traffic with that. Adjusted pretty Once in a while, that. a phone call, just give them their number. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to take a brief recess or reset? Be fine. Okay. A little more than five or about five um, minutes? I'd say ten. I'd like to grab a laptop, make sure we get this hooked up so we can okay. have live debt with that. Very good. About uh, 225 we'll reconvene. Yes, sir.
our self-imposed deadline, so <laughs> You're ready to roll. it'll work. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. No, no, no we're getting together. Yeah. Um, if you look at the screen, we'll run through just a couple charts that we've got together. You've probably seen some of these before. I know I sent them to you earlier. Um, the first one is your total debt service. We try to kind of show all the different uh, strains of debt that we have out, whether it be water, sewer, TIF, local option sales tax, just straight debt, geo debt sales tax. You can see that by 2030, we're debt free. And that seems like a long ways away. It's only 10 years and we're debt free. And our goal was, when I first got here, was to get all of our debt outstanding paid off within 10 years, if at all possible. And we're basically at that point now. So when you go to your bonding agencies, Moody's, S&P, they really like to see that rapid repayment, they call it, especially inside of 10 years. 80% or more is, is what they'd like to see, well, you're at 100%. So when we start to look at how we sit financially, um, it'll be years yet, but we may eventually see an upgrade if values increase, things like that, and we continue these kind of trends to try and stay within that rapid repayment side of this. So again, I don't know if you have many questions for this, it's kind of a hodgepodge as you look at it, but you can see they drop off different times throughout. Of course, when you add more debt, it extends it further, but. Uh, but everything we try to issue going forward is 10 years or less, and this is why you want to keep that repayment schedule very rapid. James, did you say that um, the services prefer 80% rather than 100? If you can pin them down on a number, we've been told anywhere from 80 to 90 to, they consider that percentage to be rapid repayment if it's off within 10 years. I just wanted to get to 100%, and that's where we are going into this next fiscal year. So, thank you. Um, different just graph, for clarification same thing. On that graph. Yep. The sales tax one is what is funded the dry run project. Yes. Yep. The sales tax increment financing, they call it, um, and that is the last of the. And so, in about seven years, that comes off, or six years, it looks like. And so same information, different graph. It kind of shows you how it goes and steps down year after year till again by 30, we have no debt. So 2029 20, would be the final payments on all these. 
Then the other small piece we'll jump on is this is just our general obligation debt. It does not have uh, revenue bonds or local option sales tax or TIF bonds or anything, just a straight taxed general obligation debt. You can see how it drops off in 2028. So in eight years, we are debt free on the tax side. Assuming we were never to issue debt again. So you know that's not going to be the case or we'd be done with the meeting right now. Um, so, no, I do not want to say. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. The packet I handed out for you to look at, basically the first section that we're, we're working on is those are the projects that are already in process. You know, Mike has done a really nice job of breaking out a separate deck sheet for each of these with possible funding time frames and where the funding may come from. Of course, this all changes as we go forward. It's a great working document to start with. And we've kind of tried to follow a lot of this timeline the same as we go forward. Um, so you have the parkway in progress. We have 20th Street that's finished up that first section with the railroad improvements. Uh, Bremer Avenue is completed other than the streetscape portion of it. And then the parkway, we just went through last meeting, about to start in the spring, get that done as well. So in this current fiscal year, those are the projects that we have underway. So our question is for next year, which we're building, what would we do going forward? And you see the next section that we're looking at, that's what I have currently in right now. And a lot of that is based on conversations that we've had throughout the year or projections during last year's budget, what we would do. And I'll show you where it all sits here in a minute on this nasty spreadsheet. But um, we have this second portion of 20th Street, finishing that first phase. So it takes it all the way down to 5th Street included. Uh, Cedar Lane, that first phase up to Brown Avenue being done. Um, business 218 North, we have uh, federal money, RTA money is involved in that. So we kind of, we'll only view about half of that amount, the 800, but that is the total cost, is 800. About half of that will be ours, about 440 of it. The uh, next two, we do have funded currently with the water bond that we did for Bremer. Um, once the water dollars came in, we have additional funding that can actually do these two water issues at CUNA relocation and 10th Street as we move down that. Those two are currently funded this year if we needed to do it. Um, Third Avenue Northeast, we've talked about. It was quite a bit of work that was done up there patching that. Um, I understand we had a water main break just a few days ago too, did we not? Is it Greenfield? Is that there? It's another area someday we're probably gonna have to look at. I think it seems to be coming up a lot. We have a lot of breaks and patches, and so it may be another one on this list eventually. Where was it? Green? Greenfield. I'm not as familiar. That's out in Ridgewood. Up by our house. North, like Cedar River yeah, Drive. North of mine. Okay, Cedar River Drive. It helps me. Otherwise, I get a little lost in the weeds with that. So. Jewel Edition, actually, I think. Okay, that makes sense. I used to live on the street, so. But I think we've had some issues with that in the past. If we yeah. have breaks and. Well, there's something going on around there always. <laughs> There's activity. Yeah. A lot of activity. So, but um, Third Avenue uh, was one that we have discussed as well. Uh, I have that figured into here. The South Riverside Park, the second phase, the tab had briefly talked about, that is figured in. And then Streetscape, and again, the big facade grant program we're looking at doing potentially, and these are estimates, that's factored in there too. It's closer to 75 or 100,000 for the facade. And some of the substantial improvements to these businesses in downtown are a little more than just putting some paint on it or putting a window in. It's, they are substantial to change that look. Uh, and again, Bill will talk about that a little later as we get to that also. But, um, but those are the items that I have in currently. When I say currently, you go to the spreadsheet that I've got up on the screen. This is what uh, PFM used to charge us a ton of money to do, and it was so impressive. And it took about a day to build it, and now here we are. Um, and you get it for free. So this is uh, debt capacity. This is our capacity. This is the limit how much we can borrow at any one point in time. So as we look at that, every parcel in the city has a value assessed that we talked about earlier. It's about 780 million, roughly total 800 million. You can borrow 5% maximum against that. So it puts us at about 38 to 40 million maximum at any one point in time we can have outstanding debt. Now some things like the sewer plant, that's an SRF funding, that's not a capacity issue. You're not, taxes aren't paying for that. Water bonds, those are revenue generated from fees, taxes aren't paying for that. Those are what get us around some of that capacity issue so we can do those and it doesn't hurt us here. 
We have a self-imposed 80%. So even though we could borrow all the way up to 38, we only borrow 80% of that as a maximum by rule. Council's only done that. And so when I look at where we are comparatively, I'm looking at that 80%, not that 100. Is so it 80 or 85? 80. 80. Okay. 80. And that's where we sit is 80%. Not uncommon. A lot of cities have that. Not uncommon at all. So, so for reference, I put a gray bar across the screen here. That's fiscal 20, the year we're building. You can see we have Cedar Lane in there. We have the grants and we have the streetscape, et cetera. Um, we have the second phase of 20th, the estimated for that. We have business 218 and we have the water main repairs. Hang on. That takes us to total outstanding debt of 28.7. That means what we have left is 1.38 million, and that's it. And that takes us about 76% of our legal limits. We're under our 80. So again, it gets tight because we're so aggressive in the capital we're wanting to do. So a lot of this works. Um, Say you'd want a public works, you know, we want to do that, or we have a million three, why don't we have Cedar Lane, the second phase in there? Well, let's go ahead and put that in there. Let's just let's just see what happens. Oh, now we got a problem. Next year we're over our limit. And that's assuming we have a one percent growth, which we don't always get. This year we had three and we were lucky. Last year it was negative. So that's a problem. So we really can't do that. And so we have to get that out of there. Whoops, hang on. Yeah, I know, I know. It's, I got a little tiny screen here. You're seeing a lot better screen than I do. I'm not so sure about that, but. <laughs> I'm so, well, hang on. Let me blow it up some more. Is that a little better? Yeah. No. Okay. I'll just have to scroll a lot more here. James, uh, yep. what are the uh, decimal numbers at the top? I don't get what those are. That's about what it is on the tax rate million dollars is always about a quarter and so when I started to factor in kind of what we were looking at that was a ballpark it's maybe off a tenth here and there or a tenth a hundredth here and there but that's about what it would be and some of them might have been updated so for the sake of it I just leave it me not look at those but um, but one of the big topics that we've talked about going forward you know we have other items that are not funded or other items that aren't listed you know when I look at the list and I show you um, we'll go to fiscal 21 We'll highlight that in yellow. So then in fiscal 21, we would do Burger King to Dairy Queen. That's slated. We have to make our payment to DOT. That's why in that yellow column, those are things we have to do. We don't have a choice. We have payments to DOT that are coming. Um, we would also want to do First Street Northwest, which again is federal RTA money. We are committed to get that done, matching funds for that. And that's about all that really fits into there. Because again, say we decide, well, Cedar Lane can't be fitted in there. Let's just try it. No, got a problem. Can't do it. So this is really almost like a puzzle. Every time you change something, the ripple effect is it's bad for everything else. And so when we talk about a lot of the capital we want to fund, sometimes we just simply can't. We just don't have the capacity for it. And so, like I said, what I have done is try to fit in, based on what you've said, what you would like to have funded. One of the big topics that comes up a lot is Green Bridge. Mm -hmm. And we'll show you that in a minute. I've done a couple different scenarios on what that may look like. Sorry, I'm kind of, you know, I want that there. To, <laughs> it drives me crazy. Um, so what I have now is if it goes into fiscal 22. And the reason for that, when you look at your sheets that Mike's provided, you know, we could do it now and we could do it next year. We could do it and we'll show you what happens. By the time that bridge is taken out and replaced, we believe it's going to be 2022, 20, 2023. And if you back up to say, let's be done by the fall or summer, so we're not getting in the middle of this by winter if they do it. Back it up a year to get it done, back it up another year for bidding construction, it puts us at about fiscal 22, but starting a few years earlier on getting the construction done. The, the engineering, the those kind of things. So to me, that fiscal 22 is about the latest we could do it, in a sense, and still be in time to be done before that bridge was taken out and put back, if you choose to do so, and assuming it's on time, and they don't delay it another year or so. So from what we know and can control, that's as far out as you can move that structure to have it done, and still have it done, if you choose to do so. And that estimate is for a vehicular bridge. There is a lesser estimate for a pedestrian bridge, about 1.44 is what we put it at. 
but I don't know if a pedestrian bridge would accomplish what your main purpose in bringing this up to talk about was, which was vehicular traffic to be alleviated through the bridge construction. What, James, what is the actual date? I mean, I know that they have, a, they have a set in concrete date. Right. What is the actual date that we're kind of looking at for the Bremer Avenue Bridge? Is that going to be completely closed? Uh, fiscal 23 is about the time they're talking about doing it. So winter of 22, spring 23, somewhere in there. Right, so they're, they're looking at an FY23 project, which yep. in theory, that project could start in July of 22. Um, they're talking about maybe letting it in January or February of 23, but I, I wouldn't use that as our, <laughs> our benchmark in time. I, I would use the summer of 22. Okay. Yeah. So how much is that going to cost us as a city? Uh, unless we want to do some additional enhancements to it, it really shouldn't be much at all. It's a DOT bridge. We may be somewhat responsible for the sidewalks, just yeah. like we were with the Bremer Avenue. It would also apply to the bridge. So, so in terms of debt capacity, it's not a consideration? No, no, no. It's okay. hundreds of thousands versus millions. It's not okay. anything like that. They will fund the bulk of that. As far as it being open, I don't believe it will be. I think they'll remove yeah, the entire thing sure. and then replace it all at once, because trying to keep traffic open, it, yeah. I think it'd be a nightmare uh, mm -hmm. with the amount of truck traffic, et cetera, it goes across. Now look, again, park will be finished next late summer, early fall. That'll be there. We are looking at, do you do Cedar Lane in the meantime, ahead of it or behind it, or what do you do there? So that's kind of where we see, so we get the listing, we've kind of touched on a couple of the various things that we have built. Um, even Cedar Lane, the second phase, from Brown Lane to Horton Road, I've tried to move it up and move it back, and it just does not fit until 2022. The same year the bridge may be done, and that may be touch and go. It may not get done before the Green Bridge, if you even do it. If I could so, just back up a minute. Absolutely. To, um, the estimate that you have for the Green Bridge, is that with or without the uh, million-dollar state grant? That's with the million dollars included. It's yeah. about three and a half without it. Okay. That means we are probably going to have to go through the process of delisting it from the <coughs> registry to even get that. And how long will that take? Like to year? 12, 12, 16 I thought we had kind of said we were going to move ahead with that, regardless. We thought we would get the state money regardless, and they said now. Again, this keeps evolving. It's very frustrating when you deal with these guys anymore. That was always talked about, that it was state money. It's not federal. It's this program. No, they think they're not going to give that either unless we delist it. So we're stuck with this bridge being funded by all tax, three and a half million, unless we delist it to get that extra million it qualifies for. Yeah, I mean, why wouldn't we just go ahead and delisting. start working on delisting yeah. it? That's what we're hoping to accomplish here with our discussion okay. is if okay. we're going to move forward at all, we need to delist it. If you yeah. decide not to replace the bridge at all, then we wouldn't have to deal with it, but we still would probably move forward to delist it for some day. The deadline starts April of this year. Yep. That okay. And that cost is for a two-lane vehicular bridge? Mm -hmm. The million the dollars, that's point, all they would fund the, the million for. the 2.5 that's yep. on there now? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and it would have to be two-lane in order for us to get the grant. Yeah, they won't give you a million dollars to do a pedestrian right. because it's not DOT standard. <coughs> or and that, that. nor a one-lane. Uh -uh. <coughs> is not. there uh, any doubt that once you've listed a property that you can successfully delist it? Oh, I think we can have it yeah. delisted. Yeah. Um, it just takes time. It's the same as it would to have it put on, probably faster to get it put on than it is to take it off unreasonably. But um, I think we'll be fine in that manner. It's just it's just doing it and going through the process. But uh, the question is, do you even want to do that bridge? You know, yeah. it's going to be yeah. a year yeah. of construction, then it's done. You know, if we do that bridge and it becomes an alternate route, and we've talked about it, Mike, I know those streets aren't built to take that traffic. Right. You'll be looking at a street repair down there as well. They're seal coated through there. They're not built for that. That neighborhood you mean, will take a You mean to third. serve as an alternate route right. while the Bramer Bridge is being worked on? Right. Even though but the it, parkway would be the official route and Cedar Lane will take some of it to the north, yeah. we know that. If that becomes a quick traffic way for everybody to jump across, those streets are going to take a beating. Yeah. They're not yeah, built for that kind of traffic. traffic. You're, going to, you're going to have a lot of traffic on uh, Cedar Lane. Lane. A lot it's of traffic. Be, for it. Yeah, it's that's kind of why the first phase is really the roughest. Would you say, Pete, of the two? Yeah, no, Pete says yes. Then that's the roughest stretch of it. It's that first phase. The second's wider. It's still not great, but it's not the pinch points and the roughness that that first one is. I'd love to get them both done if that's going to be a route we want tab out there, but the timing makes it really difficult with the other things we kind of want to do. So, 
On unofficial routes, can we restrict the type of traffic? Can we post it no semi? Can we post it under five know. ton? Those type of things. Any idea, Mike? I know we can put that as a proposed truck route that we want them to take. I, I don't know if we can restrict it. To some degree, you can, but um, there, there are limitations to what types of restrictions you can impose. And you have to enforce it. Probably have to talk with DOT about what wouldn't wouldn't be allowed on that, because the CLA would be the same way. We don't really want trucks going up and around. I think that'd be actually important information for us to have mm -hmm. yeah. well, in making these decisions. James, James and I have had some discussions about the Green Bridge. Have also, yes, we have. I think as, as several of you probably have, have also already received some emails about keeping it at no bridge or a pedestrian only bridge. Right. My selling point on this is that Green Bridge is important for emergency vehicles during the reconstruction of the Brimmer Avenue Bridge. I don't want the fire department to go to my house having to go all the way out around Lover's Lane. I certainly don't want them to have to go out around Cedar River Parkway and come back in. And I would prefer to see some money in this year's budget just for engineering, to get the engineering going on the, on the Green Bridge so that we had an idea of what it was going to take. But I think it's imperative, and if we want to, the concern about semis and really heavy daily traffic on that on that street and bridge, I think is probably premature because semis are not going to want to make all the turns to get to and from the output of that. And uh, so, I mean, I've been a proponent of that bridge replacement since it was knocked down. Uh, well, clear back in 2002 when the original feasibility study was done about that. And I, it, I, it was an important bridge prior to that time, and it's still an important bridge. The other thing that's missing, or a piece that's missing in this whole spreadsheet, is Champions Ridge. Right. Due to council action, a week ago, We've pretty well indicated that the fair may be able to go ahead out there here regardless of what else happens. We have made an obligation through previous councils to install a lift station. I see no money in the budget for a lift station. I don't have it in for this year, obviously, in, in future and if years they, we have to figure if, it out. If they think they're gonna start grading, if they can come up with the funds and this council gives them the go ahead, and they start grading fiscal in March, May or June of this year, the fiscal year of 1920, that lift station is going to go in. Or maybe 2020. It could go in, but depending on how the dirt work is proceeds, Sorry. the I, I water and sewer infrastructure is going to need to be in before they do anything else, or after the next step right after the grading. Would that as much as that? fall in this it's piece possible. of possible. What's that now? Wouldn't that be covered under enterprise funding versus this, so it's not going to hit our debt capacity? We could do it that way. You would have a, a sewer bond that could do that or some fees like that. We could do that. It would be possible I to do agree. a revenue bond it, it, instead it of a taxable be, capacity. We need to stay conscious of our commitment if yep. it has to move forward. But also, because not the bond only we just did for Bremer Avenue, the first payment we just made for water bond, that's not in here either because it doesn't affect our capacity and our taxes. So that, that's why it's not shown as it would be a sewer revenue bond most likely or we'd have fees that we would do. I don't know also in regards to Champions Bridge, even whether if it's only the fair, is all the city's committed to do is help with the entrance off that I know about, entrance off of Highway 3. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in their proposal is there another drop of concrete for streets or parking lots. Right. That main entrance, I know there's a thought of a future north-south 
road, connection road between west of the sale barn and Highway 3. Is that entrance road part of that future corridor? And do we have anything to say about it? And how's it gonna be funded? That's a good question for them. I have no idea. Um, I don't like where they're putting the road in the first place. Let's Running see, all up of the west side of the problem. property. All of this is how, we don't know any of that. No, we don't. Oh, don't. A lot of us don't have a lot of confidence in that. And yet we have to wrap up this budget before we hear from them in March. Well, I don't think that's going to be a budget issue for us, though. The roads internal in that will be gravel to start with. They're going to have to just pave it in. That's not going to be anything for us on the road. The entrance part, we can talk about that, I suppose, depending on what it looks like. But I don't think we're having any issue with the roads internally. And like I said, we've talked about the placement of the road. I don't like it. I'm publicly, I don't like it. It goes up the west side of the property. Mm -hmm. And if we do develop north of that, we have to jut back. I think it's a lot more expensive than me put it up the ridge right up the middle, which is what we've kind of proposed and always talked about. There, there are some discussion points in that. If this moves forward, that's where we'd rather kind of I think we need that. to be careful here. Champions Ridge has spent a lot of time and money. They have plans on how to develop that property. Yep. They consulted the city on those plans. There were a lot of meetings about where that entrance was put. They move forward based on all of the discussion we're having here with their plan. So to, to start having a conversation now that we don't like where things are and they should redesign it, I, I don't think it's fair to anyone here. Did, did the, the other city thing say is, they like that one? Well, you mean that you, you're saying that, that city staff agreed to that western entrance? Again, this, these were two or three years ago meetings, so I'm going back on brain cells that are probably half dead, but yes. <laughs> Based on the footprint that they needed to lay down, it was the best option for the developer to put the entrance where it is. Was it the best option for the city? Maybe, maybe not. Is it workable? Yes, if it was a city street, it would have to wrap behind the church property to go north. So, and I have no problem with the entrance, Dan. I was going to say, I have no problem with the entrance. It's the road configuration, I think, is, and again, it's up to them. It's not up to us. We just know that it might have been. It's private property, so I'm not sure why we're talking about the private property's road. And again, I know the city is. Well, no, it's not a property. private property. <laughs> if you allow me to finish, my, I never knew that this, their development was going to be considered a city street to pass through to anything else other than the entrance. So if that was ever conveyed, I was not part of the meeting, that type of thing. So how it meanders through the Champions Ridge <coughs> property, and again, I know the city is the owner of a big piece of that. I can, I can understand why they're doing it. I mean, if you're gonna have a bunch of kids playing baseball, you don't want a major thoroughfare where kids are running across the, the road. I mean, that, that makes where, sense to me. Where they've lined it up on the west side is in alignment with our comp plan. Right. Okay, where this extra potential interchange off of 218 is coming up right to that west side. There's the church, there's Champions Ridge. Okay, now whether it's gonna wind through here or not to eventually link up up here or not, but that's, that entrance off of three is at the same spot that we've got on our comp plan for a future north-south connector from 218. And again, so if we were to go to the middle, that whole thing is gonna to have to shift over, and I'm not sure the DOT would be even interchange, entertain an interchange back further east, closer to the one that's already there coming into town from the south. Okay. And I don't want to bog us down yeah. Champions Ridge. We certainly yeah. are not here for that today. But again, it's not my plan. It's not anything I have because we've heard nothing about cost or possibility or I'm looking at next year and it's all I'm looking at because that's all we can deal with right now. Well, my only reason projects necessarily all of them yeah, possibly. Just to make sure we round out the, the conversation, the intersection point. is Again, these are based on discussions I may not have been part of the most recent, was an intersection that would grow as capacity was needed at the site. So turning lanes, extra lanes would right. all be 
in future phases. It wasn't going to be one huge intersection to start with. So I just want to be careful that we're not unintentionally over committing ourselves to something that doesn't have to happen as they move forward. I only have one other question. Uh, the infrastructure other than the lift station is to be put in by the Champions Ridge Group. That's what they said the other night. That's what they said. Our obligation is to put in the lift station. Where do we get user fees? It would be a bond paid off with user fees. It would be a sewer bond. The sewer fund itself would be adjusted to accommodate the fees needed to pay that off. And what's the cost of a lift station? Uh, three to five, you think, Mike? You're right in there. Yeah, $400,000. Does that mean an increase in fees? Uh, we'd have to look at the health of the fund and see if it's necessary or not, depending on how long the bond is taken out, what the payments look like. Um, similar to what we would do with any of the water and sewer bonds. So if need be, that can certainly be addressed. I'm not worried about that at all. We can certainly address that. But whether they were to do something there or we were to do something development there where we would need a lift station out there. Yes. Yes, that's the way that the sewer system would have to go, depending on how it falls. And it has to be in, uh, I believe, the southeast corner is where they've identified the best spot for it to be. And that's where we would have it. So, yeah, Unless one we way or another, it would be a lift station. So, mm -hmm. so moving on then. Um, yep. Sorry. No, you're fine, sir. Um, so, like I said, in the summary, that's the items that I have listed in there based on water main problems that we probably need to address, uh, RTA funds that we have committed, the discussions on 20th Street being finished, Cedar Lane being talked about last year, we do it in July. I mean, I guess part of me is, are there projects you'd rather have in or not have in? Because the piece we've not touched on that's also on this spreadsheet. Can I ask a question about what's up there? Yeah. So the, the timing of the uh, Green Bridge, Yes. Um, is that thought they can do that in one construction season? I, I would think so. Um, when you look at the progress that's made in the parkway in, in just over a year, <coughs> this is just a bridge. Okay. And, then, uh, I mean, and I think any they delays, do that. if we snug that right up against the fiscal year for the repairs on the Bremer Avenue, if something should come up that would delay the Green Bridge, then are we in trouble with We're access? Giving it a good year okay. to get done. Um, I don't think it'll take that long, okay. honestly, but it, it, again, the, the main question is, do you even want to do it as a council? Do you even want to fix that bridge? Two and a half, three million, it's a construction season without it, and that's where I guess to start with, you have to decide, do you want to fix it? And then it'll be when, and so when I look at it, say we move it up to this year, uh, we have to, we, again, trying to fit everything in. I left in the park stuff, because, you know, quality of life. Um, Cedar Lane gets pushed out. Uh, Second Street or 20th gets pushed out. Um, we are not doing, all we're doing is the water mains and some of the work in the park. None of the rest of the projects can go because we just don't have the capacity. Mm -hmm. Well, but I mean, could we get the historical um, registry removed in time to start it in this fiscal year? Probably not. I just wanted to show you what it would look like and say yeah. we did by some coincidence get it done in time to get it started. Because, you know, this fiscal year we're talking about is July 1st till next spring. Yeah. So I say it takes a year from now. In the spring, in theory, we could start. You'd want the funding available so we would possibly get the money ahead of time. We just have delay on it spending. But And so when you go to fiscal 21, it really doesn't change a lot. You might be able to squeeze in 20th, but you're not going to get Cedar Lane in either one, which, again, you probably wouldn't want to in the same year you're doing this. But... Uh, it just kind of maps it out that way. How much of the engineering that was already done for the Green Bridge can be used again? That I don't know, Mike. Do you have any idea? There, um, so that was a there, single lane. Right, we talked about there's, there's a fair amount because of the survey work and the geotech work that was done. Um, it's like the first $40,000 worth or something like that. Yeah. But if, I mean, they're certainly compared to fast track it. Things Keep in mind is that um, uh, in the next month or two, we're going to get notice from the DOT on which candidate bridges are eligible for funding and replacement. This will probably come up again. That would be for FY 20, 
funding, um, which is the budget we're working on. Uh, but from, I guess if I can put some personal opinions into this, um, we're to commit two and a half million dollars to the Third Street Bridge. Um, puts a lot of other projects on the back burner, as James indicated. Do you sacrifice the second half of Cedar Lane, which is going to be a local detour route for when the Bremer Avenue Bridge is done? So, our, I understand the desire to do it and wanting to have it available for when the Bremer Avenue Bridge is replaced. But that's a 10, 12 month project, and then it's not. What about, what about delaying 20th Street? I'm just thinking about the number of people that use Cedar Lane. Um, you know, I don't know when the development is supposed to start off 20th that will increase the number of people out there. But It'll probably be a little while. Yeah. So it's going to be a while. Yeah, we wouldn't probably get it to 20th anyway. It would probably head more to the east in Hickory mm -hmm. Heights. And that area. I don't think it would have to be on 20 for a while. So, Mike, did I hear you right? The Bremer Bridge replacement would be a 10 to 12 month project? Is that what you were talking about? I, I think we need to plan on a 12 month window. Um, it's not going to be done in six months, and right. it's not going to take two years. I think 12 months is realistic, um, but we won't know until they really get into the design. And we're talking about actually replacement, not... All replacement. Okay. You know, I, I think I know the answer to this, but even if you would take the two and a half million for the Third Street Bridge and put it into two different fiscal years, it, it, does it allow the wiggle room that we need to stay under our 80% or...? Um. Well, like I said, when I look at what I've got now, I've got a million four left on what we have currently. Um, I can't even put Cedar Lane in at a million because it messes up the next year because we have the payments to DOT. So a million two fifty, let's say, would do the same thing, and then a few years after that, we only have seven hundred, four hundred. We just don't have a lot left with the other things that are planned out to be done. Um, if you go back to your first column and and take out, move everything up. One, good, and then change your gray bar to one million two hundred fifty thousand, and your yep, and then go up, put a one million two hundred fifty thousand in the twenty budget that we're talking about now. Oh, you want to do it like the next year? Okay. Yeah, I mean, what just is that? just putting that in. Puts us at a, almost a half a million problem next year. Okay. Hmm. That's, and so then you got to kick out First Street Northwest, possibly, which we have federal money in. Now, if you go back and add a or a row in the Green Bridge, so if you wow. push everything down to twenty-one, it still doesn't. The the big one to take out there, to me, James, is the Public Works that's hidden in fiscal year twenty-one. That's 1.4. Right. You push that down, now you've got a lot more capacity. Uh, we have some more. It's only, again, moves at 977 left. I still can't put the million 250 in there. That, that's what I'm getting at. It, it, it's just the way it works is everything else. Because it's not just the year you start. It's you only have 10% less the next year and the next year. And it calculates that all the way down through. So I think what I'm here with you, Dan, is let me... Insert this, cut this over. So we're basically going to duplicate this. Let's shrink that up. And then we'll move that down here. So you're saying after over two years, right? 20 and 21, split 50-50. Yeah, again, from selling bonds and stuff like that, I don't even know if that's a feasible way to approach it. But. It could be, but it's still, again, it's 300000 It hits us even moving the public <coughs> services out. Um, I mean, yeah, we can 
make it work this year. My fear is we still have to get the balance of it, the other two and a half million somewhere. Um, so if I make it a million, and then the next year, let's say we cross the fiscal years with it, let's say it's a million five. Um, we kind of we still have that problem. And as view is go strictly by the eighty percent. Grant, I'm not advocating going over the eighty percent. You can; it's your choice to do that. But then, where do you stop? Yeah. Every yeah. year going over. What becomes your new level that you don't go over is, is eighty-five. And Tim, do you remember back when we kind of bumped into this eighty percent when we did the financing for the dry run project? Did we go over it, or did we wiggle around enough to stay under it? I thought we wiggled just underneath it. But just I don't, I don't remember taking sure. any formal action. I know we talked about it was somewhat of a arbitrary number that we all agreed to, to work towards. Yep. I don't know that it would take council action if we bumped up to 80.5 or something like that. But yeah, I'm not sure how it was established. If it's something you'd have to, if there was like a formal resolution taken to establish it, that, that I don't know how it was. That goes uh, back before I was on council, so, so it's been there quite a while. I mean, so, so I don't know if it was a resolution to not go over it. You may have to state you're going to one time. You know, it'd be something maybe you'd have to do from yeah, uh, can do it. just a paper trail standpoint as to why. But I mean, I don't know if this will make sense in this conversation, but. In my tenure on the council, we, we had a very planned out process. And then the opportunity to fund the dry run project came along and we couldn't afford not to. Right. We kind of got ourselves back to an even keel and then the Bremer Avenue project came in maybe a little sooner than we anticipated. It's another project we couldn't afford not to do. Mm -hmm. Now we're trying to get ourselves with our feedback under us, and now we've got a bridge replacement that necessitates doing these other projects. So it seems like we're getting ourselves in the cycle of having maybe projects thrust upon us that we weren't really planning for. And again, that's no nothing negative about any other prior council. It, it just seems we're struggling with how to get back to a more managed debt process here because of the projects and again I don't know that I could argue that not doing the rest of the parkway we shouldn't have done that which is adding to the complications here so long way of saying there's always been valid reasons we keep having a very aggressive project load here which we have to have this type of conversation well, I'm going to make it even worse for you, because that's what I do. Uh, these are all the projects that aren't funded that we've talked about trying to do this year and this next year. And, you know, Horton Road, we talked about that on the back end of uh, doing the uh, Adams Parkway bridge there. We've tried to extend that out, but when the funding comes through, you know, we didn't have it to be able to extend and do it. Um, the 10th Avenue Trail extension, we've talked about that as well. And these are all in your package, too, the deck sheets on um, when we get the uh, improvements made by the state coming through and we have that last chunk of trail to get connected up, can we do that? Um, a traffic study. Looks like it says traffic. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, it was late last night when I was doing it. It's foreign. Well, we actually have a resolution on us saying that we were going to do the, the traffic study. Did it say when? <laughs> no. no, I'm just I'm saying this next I year I'll fit it in. Just, on it. No, I, I think we were pretty clear not to put that on there because we didn't want to be committed to having to spend it. I can still spend it. That's okay. I mean, it's okay. We can pass another resolution. Right. Back there. But that, that, that was brought up the fact that you know we probably didn't want to commit to something two years out. I think Brian's right. What if I want to tell you is when you look at this, I got about three hundred and fifty thousand left that we could add on, and that takes us right up to the limit. That's it. Other than you know, I'll do something else. And so, I mean, if there's something on here you really want a traffic study, we can do that. Or removing the dome down the WPC dome, the old one down the park. It's about 100. The water main PRV valve to help the high pressure system. We get to, that's 100. 29th reconstruction. That was going to be in fiscal 21. I can't fit it in yet. The sanitary sewer study. That's a huge one because it mm -hmm. identifies where we're getting leaks in our sewer system. It causes our lift stations to get a little funny on us. These are none of these are in here. And these are all good projects as well. So 
this is kind of what we're running up against is, is how do we how do we balance this out? Um, so again, any one of these, we could actually do one or two or three of these, possibly, if you still wanted to. I didn't want to assume and jump into those. I just went with what we had committed for funding, water main problems, the couple projects you've talked about. That's where I left it. And none of that's in stone either. You can certainly change them. It's just to give you a flavor of where, where we sit. Um, and there's other stuff we still haven't talked about the rest of this budget. How do we fund the sidewalk program that's in the hole? How do we continue to do soup coal? Do we take it from local option, consider continuing or not? We just talked about that. Uh, you know, GIS has been talked about. Do we do it in a year or two? Do you accelerate it? That's a cost. You've got your communication director position to figure out. That's a cost. All that's on top of what we've already talked about and where we see the rate to sit. So maybe if we could back up on the streetscape. Yep. You know, Bill, uh, Bill Jones had a meeting out at Rado where some of us were there. and. We talked about would it be possible to stage that in, was there any additional talk there that you know, maybe stage one was not putting a planner at every location they wanted, but every other, or? If you would, Bill. Just, again, if. Well, I think when we talked about that, the streetscape, the max was going to be 300,000. Yep. It was like 230 or 240. And it actually could be less than that because it was like the things that were per item, depending on what they did. So they could you could do it over a period of time. Um, we just wanted to put in the, the placeholder, but the kind of the maximum. And keep in mind that South Riverside increased because of that area behind the, the Four Queens and some of that area too that might increase that cost to make sure that that got done at some point. Otherwise, it's place I can't hear you unless you have a microphone. Oh, you are. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think the streetscape is, is a project that needs to be done if we're looking to spread costs a little bit. You know, it is, yeah, just. If you're, if you're kind of looking at that, put it I bought yeah, it at yeah, least yeah. 200 to start. I mean, it's like almost between 200 and 300 when it comes down to that. We, we wanted to do at least 200 in streetscape to make sure we had a big, a right. big start to it. I think. So, so but now, what did you change it to, James? So, if I take 100,000 out, which takes it to park was 325, that gives you. Um, 275 for streetscape and the facade program. The streetscape is about 230, usually 50 for the facade program. It it helps a little bit. It's under the 100,000. Um, it doesn't really move you up too much on what you can or can't do here. Um, I mean, yeah, we can certainly do all that. Like I said, there's all the other projects to look at or fund or not fund. And, and uh, this isn't easy. This is the hard, nasty stuff because these are the big things you have to decide do you do them or not and how. And that's what we're trying to kind of help you look at. But you just got to provide me the feedback of what do you want to see, what do you want to do. So, so for my own, my own clarity, if we did the Green Bridge in fiscal year 22, yep. as you got here, would it be done in time for the Bramer Avenue Bridge reconstruction? Yeah, I believe so. That allows a full year to get that bridge done mm -hmm. and the year prior to get engineering, specs, bid, etc. I mean, I don't know, Mike, is that feasible? The full year? That's not even doing it. That's not even doing engineering this year. That would be next year. You do your engineering, bid, specs. It took about a year the other times we did it. And it would be completed and you'd start construction and opening in the summer of 22. I mean from my perspective that the main reason for replacing the Green Bridge is so that there's access to the downtown businesses. After all of the construction that's been going on on Bramer Avenue, I'm really concerned about not having a good access to downtown while the Bramer Avenue bridge is under construction. So whether we're getting that green bridge done next year or three years from now, I just want to make sure it's done before the Bramer Avenue bridge is, is done, is, is taken out. So, I mean, I, I understand that this is something that's been like an albatross around our necks and it would be nice to kind of get it cleared and taken care of. But if we can look you know, at our people and say, okay, this is when it's gonna happen, and it's gonna happen before the Bramer Bridge is reconstructed, I'm satisfied with that. I mean, they're gonna, I mean, it means that we'll be, 
enjoying two years of emails from some of our constituents telling us what a bad idea it is to put a two-lane traffic bridge in there. <laughs> but I think that as long as we are taking action to help protect our downtown businesses, I think we're, in the, I think we're doing the best thing for the city. I, I do have a concern. I agree with you in general. Um, I, I uh, am concerned, though, about the road damage that was mentioned earlier by staff. And so I guess I would still be interested in knowing whether there's any way that we can uh, restrict that um, or how far, how far we can restrict it. I also have a, qu a question. I, I'm not remembering uh, what all is included under, um, oh, what did I see there? Uh, shoot, there was something about 218. Where was that? Oh, uh, mm -hmm. the business 218 North? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What did that include? That's uh, federal RTA money. And so um, about not quite half of that is paid for by the feds. This is our matching portion. And that goes from basically use it what, from Pizza Ranch up and around out to the airport and to the city limits. Okay. So that's kind of DOT feds saying this is what we'll do and about when. So yeah, and so we, have we don't have any control of that. We have money committed already because mm -hmm. we applied and they said yes. Same so they, thing with First Street Northwest right they there. They set the date on that. Later. They tell us when that's happening pretty um, much. It's when it's planned in, I believe, mm -hmm. if you would, Mike. And First Street is a state project also? Uh, it's RTA money, federal money. Right. I think it is our federal aid program. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit different now because we're able to trade federal money for state money. The state works with it on that. On that. But here's the thing to keep in mind. These are programmed five years out. Um, and uh, myself, county engineers, and others, you know, we, we look at these projects and we decide whether or not to fund them as a group. We have very serious reservations when we start seeing projects where they start postponing, postponing, postponing. Uh, when we see stuff like that, the next time that community comes requesting money, money or the county, we're like, hmm, really? You know, the last project, you kicked two, three years down the road on this. So when we program funding, we want to see the money expensed and the project completed when it's programmed. Mm -hmm. so, and you have doubts about this or what? What's that? And you have, and you have some doubts about no, you're saying if we delay it. If we delay it. Oh, right. right. I see, yeah, I see if, what you're if, saying. Okay. If we start kicking the can yeah, on yeah. this, it will come back to haunt us, to to haunt us later. Yeah, sure. So my question was just, so. is that's the window that it's it's been designated to go right. into. Business 218 North is, is summer of 2020. First Street is 21. And um, that's the way it was mapped out okay. several years ago. Yep. And so is the county paying for a portion of it also? No, no. It, it's... It's going to be federal or state funds uh, paired up with local funding. I know I'm jumping around here, but so if Sorry. we go back to second phase of 20th Street, what of the, which of the either later options or not funded options could be plugged in there that we might think are, have a higher priority and would still keep us at the cap of our debt level? Like these projects here? Yeah. Like I said, I still have, I'll kind of show you what I've got here. Because um, the second phase is north of mm -hmm. Eisenach, right? right? These are the water main no, repairs. No, 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 the second phase is taking it up to Knight Avenue. Yeah. Right now, right now, uh, uh, Fifth okay. Avenue to the railroad okay. tracks. Right. 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 Or just north right. of the railroad okay. crossing. Uh, well, and kick in an extra 350000 It's still, we're still okay. We still have enough here and there, et cetera. Much more than that, we run into a problem here. It just is the way it phases out. So, like I said, there is three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I just didn't plan in because it wasn't necessarily for me to say um, of other projects that could be done if you wanted to. If there's a few more you wanted, like the traffic study or any of these others, that combination. Um, or you're absolutely correct. If you want to delay one, we can certainly do that too. Um, it, it's like I said, if you didn't want to do Twenty Street now, would you want to do it next year? Because um, if that's the case, we will uh, bump it, and we'll see what that looks like. 
so far so like, good. So you just have to figure out what other projects second, you'd second want to do. Phase of twentieth is just taking it from going narrow past Bartles to wide at the railroad tracks to back narrow going up to Night Ave. So it's making it wide all the way down. Okay. Yep. So it's not the it's, it's not, not the north, north of Eisenhower. No, it's not. No, no, it's just finishing yeah. that first section on either side of what okay. we just did down to fifth. Yeah. So on the on the sheet we've got where it says twentieth Street reconstruction phase one. Yep. Here it's phase, second phase. Uh, I'd call it the second phase. It's really the second phase of the first phase. Yes, one B, one A. I don't, I don't okay. know what you want to call it. So they're the it. same. No. These are the yeah. same. Same okay. thing. Yep. Even though the price, the dollar's a little bit different. Yeah, around seven fifty. Because while we have a fund balance sitting in the first project, we don't have bids yet. We don't. So I try to just edge it just a little bit to be close. I can take the thirty-eight thousand off that, but. It's not going to help us a whole lot right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Without hopefully, hopefully not opening a big can of worms, uh, <laughs> the traffic study, Yeah, we pretty well committed to that on our three-lane, four-lane rationale. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think that's important that that get funded. If that's what you want to do, we certainly can. we got room to plug it in. I would agree with that. I guess the, the question there is, is, is when, you know, what, what's an optimal, optimal time to do that after you've made a change like this? To, to me, who should it, do it? I don't think we should do it this fall, but next spring, yeah. spring, spring, of 20, 20. spring of 20 would be a good time because yeah. the parkway opening this fall, it'll still give people a chance to, to develop and do patterns through the fall and winter. And then by next spring, we should have some settled patterns to know. Or what about even a little bit later? Well, when I mean, we were does talking, that help us with this? When we were talking about this, in, we were talking about this before, we were talking about January of 2020. So I have down my notes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we were talking about that would be this fiscal year we're building. It's so still it would this fiscal year. So yeah. that, that's when we'd look at getting the consultant on board. We want to do the data collection like in April of 20 because we, we want the snow to be gone. Um, we want school and college to still be in session. And then we would uh, spend um, late spring, early summer wrapping up the report so that we'd be able to present to council uh, around Labor Day. And any uh, cap proposed capital projects from that would be able to be considered um, at budget time later that year. Right, but if we do that, that doesn't work with a debt cap, right? Yep, it will. Oh, well, one, one okay. Is easy to get. Oh. Okay. You know, I'd have to say I was a little uh, of the items. Plopped it in right there. Oh, okay. I, I was I, I was not totally sold on, on the need to do a traffic study originally. I thought that it really wasn't something, that spending that much money just to, to know which streets and which uh, mm -hmm. places we were having issues with, but um, that we could probably do that internally. But I think in light of, of some of the controversies that have arisen here, it would probably be money that was well spent, so we could check that out. So I think if we can move the traffic study in there and coming back to the, the projects, I agree with Brian. I, I, would, I, th I think that we do need to uh, look at an alternative way of getting traffic across the river other than simply Cedar Lane. Uh, I'm not quite as concerned about the semis going through there. If there's right. enough of a, a warning or, or information um, that there is restricted semi access going through towns, we try to divert as many of the semis. Semis aren't gonna to wanna to go on that road, I can guarantee you. I mean, I followed a semi when we had Bremer Avenue closed by, uh, by the railroad tracks and we were also working on uh, Fifth Avenue by the railroad tracks. And, and there was a semi that was in there, and I was behind him as he was trying to wend his way through all of these uh, the streets, hitting, hitting overhanging trees, and, and a couple of times he had to back up two or three times, go forward, back up, get around a the corner. They don't want to do that. So I think that it's not a question of restricting semi-traffic, it's just making sure that the semis know that if they come into town, they're going to have a real difficult time getting across the and, river. And I mean, it's going to happen. the parkway is going to be open at that point, the parkway yeah. bridge. And I think yeah. those semis are going to prefer to take that route to get to downtown, even if it's longer. Yeah, if it's longer. Yeah. It is true that any of the locals, they're going to be taking you know, the Green Bridge to get through to save time. But if you're driving a semi, you're not going to want to have to you know, make a turn every half a block to get over the Green Bridge and save your... I agree much with distance. all of that, but you still 
have those that are might make a mistake or you know. Oh yeah, absolutely. Have, oh, and I think it uh, hopefully would provide some peace of mind. I know not total, but some peace of mind to the residents there if we, there we were clear restrictions. We can sign those streets no semis. Yeah. We can okay. sign Third Street no semis. Okay. We can sign Cedar Lane no semis. Yeah. We can do that. I mean, that's our city course. street, so we can do that because it's a safety concern. It's, mm -hmm. it's right, turn right. angles. Mm -hmm. It's all that. No, you know, we can't tell the crawl that they can't take their their concrete truck down there, but the semis for the length and the yeah. turn radiuses, we can do that. I mean, you still may might have semis going down well, the street. Get lost, but yeah. It's not going to be a stream of semi traffic, but there is going to be substantially increased traffic okay. because uh, at least cars. Um, and I guess my, my concern is, uh, well, I kind of echo the, the mayor's concern on, on the safety issues with getting emergency vehicles uh, uh, across the river if the only bridge is the Adams Parkway Bridge. And then secondly, um, you know, if the traffic can be split up a little bit, so some of the traffic might be going over 3rd Street and some of the traffic on Cedar Lane, we don't have all the traffic on Cedar Lane, which I, I'm assuming that we can finish Cedar Lane or, or at least phase one of Cedar Lane by that time. Are we looking at both phase one and phase two or just phase one? Well, phase one's what we could fit in. I tried to put phase two in with the other things and we talked work. about. It just it pushes us over. Okay. Now, granted, you could do it in the That's early the part of 22, but you'd be pushing it up against just in front of that bridge. It would be close. It would depend on when it actually is going to come out if DOT holds that five year plan. Mm -hmm. So it's still possible, but the first phase is the worst of the two, just because of the yes. narrowness. Okay. The second one would be great, but it's the first phase is tough. Yeah. Is it a 25 mile an hour speed limit on third? On third, yes. I believe. Yes. Yes. yes, it is. Residential yes. river. Yeah, the my street. I mean that we'd really need to enforce that. And on Cedar Lane, I, I assume, I haven't been there for a while. Yeah, it's 25 as well. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of signs telling you that's 25 right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. In fact, there's some residents on Cedar Lane wish there were some speed bumps yeah. installed. Well, they are. There is natural yeah. ones right now. <laughs> you know, even too far off, far off the right, or it's, it's, you're going to have them. So there are some. Yeah, I think this is great discussion, and, and I agree that the traffic study is probably of what I saw down there would be my priority one. Sure. I just want to keep cautioning us, if we don't stop bumping up against 80%, we're never going to get us back to a more manageable state. So yeah, right. if we start adding much more in, we're just pushing this out well, farther and farther until we get a little more yeah, I know, And I know we're looking at this year's budget and, again, looking at some of the ones coming up. To me, and you know, I was a big advocate for getting the first phase done of the public works, but I just don't see where we can budget. The, that's the one big one that I think we can push off a little while right now because it is it's going to be fully funded by I, us. So I would I, rather push that off a year and pull the Cedar Lane stage right. two up a to, year. To me, that, to swap that big two. Of a chunk is one we've got the larger facility for maintaining our vehicles now, for storing our larger vehicles, this is not as much of a necessity as that first phase was to me. Yeah. It's, a, it's a nicety to get the rest of our stuff in one facility, but. And, and uh, fill me in again, what exactly is going on in, in phase two? I should have known that because I know we've discussed this before, but. Uh, which, which which public work? It's the, the north phase going right, right. But what is actually going to be there? moving out there? Some more bays and other equipment is going to be able to be stored out there. Which is currently now where? A little bit everywhere. A little bit everywhere. <laughs> so, um, you're aware of some of the pieces to the puzzle that have been put in place. There are still other pieces that yet to need to be laid and some of the things that are coming up is is that um, out at the wastewater treatment facility we're going to lose our storage building out there as part of the, the project that's coming on board based on where they need to position the oxidation ditch we're going to lose the line maintenance storage building that's where the jet vac machine is stored so that facility goes away. Um, 
so we need to be able to have storage space available for that. Uh, without the addition, without the north wing, that space doesn't exist. Uh, that's one consequence. Another one is, is being able to get uh, the water and sewer line maintenance division moved out there permanently. And they're currently in the, the buildings right, just right across right next south door, of us. Right. Right next door. So we have some changes in staffing that are going to be proposed, not in this proposed budget, but the following year. One of them is that GIS tech position, which um, really fits under the supervision of our water and line maintenance superintendent, because this person will also be charged with uh, in addition to mapping our water sewer infrastructure, it will also be doing the locating for the water and sewer infrastructure. And so the, the, the plan is to put them under the, the direction and supervision of, of our superintendent there. Those facilities, those offices, are already out at the Public Services Center. They're basically vacant. What we're waiting for is the north wing to be built so that they can also take all their equipment out there. It doesn't do any good to move the personnel out there if all their equipment is back here. So there are other pieces to the puzzle that are going to be impacted by any delay to the extension. We've already moved it out a year. It was in, the original plan was to do it in 2020, but we ran into constraints uh, fiscally because of the timing on the Bremer Avenue project that impacted our ability for the water, the water fund to help support the construction of that building. That timing was out of our control. It was basically set by the DOT. So it's already been bumped a year. And it will create some challenges just on timing. Uh, the way it's mapped out, it would not be completed and, and uh, operational until November of 2021. As, as it's proposed right now. Okay. Thank you. Are there are there any other projects that might suddenly pop up that uh, would have government uh, matching funds or partially government funding that we would have to stick in this schedule? Not another Fourth Street or another Bremer Avenue or another. God, not that I know of. I mean, we built about everything. I think we can almost build it. Because like. <laughs> um, Fourth Street is the last portion of that that section coming in. Bremer's completely done. The Collector Streets have been done. The Cedar Lane is one of the last big ones to be done. There's just not much left except getting into residential properties, uh, the smaller streets. Um, as far as RTA funds, those are mapped out five years out, so we know what's there and what's not there. Um, we have the two. Um, I can't think of anything else that would come in that, I mean, all the bridges have been addressed, the new one's getting built, parkway's getting done, this one's getting done, green bridge, I mean, we don't have any more bridges left. Um, we just, uh, the big sections of the big chunks of highway, chunks of highway are, are done, they're addressed. I, I don't know what else would be left, honestly, I hate to say that, but I don't there, know of any concerns else. the airport, <laughs> nothing's good, no, nothing coming in there. It's different right. funding, FAA, so I don't okay. see an issue really there. Um, uh, I really don't know of anything else. Hospital? That's not going to affect us all? Any, any infrastructure around there we're going to have to worry about? I don't think so. I mean, right. that's all just adding on to their campus. It's all self-contained within the streets we have. That shouldn't be an issue. It may help with street congestion because the parking will take people off the street. And that'll help that in a sense, but I don't but, see any other But there's not going to be any kind of, you know, sewer water projects coming from the... There'll always be sewer and water I mean, projects. but do, say, a hospital or something. Um, I don't think so. From the plans we looked at, yeah. it's all I'm, I'm, under obligation. Well, they've all got it together, it looks like. Okay. Right, we met with them um, a few weeks, ago, weeks ago, and, and we, they had uh, site plan drawings. Um, we we uh, uh, coordinated with and confirmed uh, water main and sewer main, uh, and it looks like we're going to be good. Uh, they've got their stormwater management all mapped out as well, so transportation um, internally is all all double so they're making good shape the replacement of water main on 10th street southwest yep figure does that include reconstruction of 10th street itself then i believe so uh three four hundred thousand i think it should be yeah that includes okay. it. same as the third third avenue 
northeast, running by the uh, pharmacy area down there, mm, Myers yeah. Pharmacy. Yeah, those are all project work, not just the infrastructure, just the whole thing. So, James, this is a great spreadsheet. <laughs> yes, yeah, it we paid a lot to get it, so <laughs> yeah. glad we keep really using helpful. it. Yeah. Even though they wouldn't share it, it didn't take that long to rebuild it. So, <laughs> and you don't even see the first 20 columns from C to U. It's just. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I'll give you a peek. Uh -oh. Yeah. Well, that's really helpful. That gets into the rebates we've got, the sales yeah. tax, oh, wow. lost right. bonds that are out there, enterprise funds, TIF mm -hmm. taxes. That's wonderful. That's it's cool. um yeah, it's a headache at times just because you want to do everything and you can't do everything. Yeah. So so and we don't have to hammer us out right now right. in a sense. We're gonna meet and talk again Monday. There's other stuff we right. can do today if you want to. We've got February 9th as well, but right. a recap where I sit right now with it. So Greenbridge, I still have it fiscal 22, which I think is in time before this bridge is done. And that's if it's delisted, and that's a two lane vehicular right now. Uh, first phase of Cedar Lane, we have funded, we have uh, Streetscape at 240 ish, roughly. The park at three and a quarter, and about 50 in the facade grant there. We have the rest of 20th getting done. Business 218, it's our portion from the federal funding. And then the uh, water main project for uh, 3rd Avenue and the traffic. Uh, traffic study. And then as far as the other projects here, we're, we're holding. I mean, yeah. there's nothing dire here by any means. There's just some nice, we sure like to do them sometime. And you didn't put the traffic study in yet at a later point in time, is that correct? It's in right now. Next year. It's so it's in this fiscal year to be done in the it's spring. It's part oh, okay. of the, uh, the water main repairs, et cetera. Okay. okay. It's the et cetera, right? All right. There. Mm -hmm. Good. Just for my own edification, why are the water main Ooh. repairs not out of uh, water revenue bonds? They're a small portion of the overall cost. It's less than half of the cost. We could do it. Mm -hmm. We'd have to sell it's a separate bond, it. and some of the fees mm -hmm. and the ratings on it would be almost as much as half of one of the projects. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for us to cover it in a GO, and we can still use mm -hmm. water fees to pay back the bond. So from a taxing right. standpoint, it won't hit us. It's just capacity it would. It's it's only a hundred some thousand, let's say, for the water. The bulk of it is the street and everything else coming back on it. So, All right. Thank so you. yeah, um, I knew the reason. Mm -hmm. James, once we settle on this chart, can can it be printed? Sure. Because that's it's, really handy. It's a big to sheet of paper, paper but you can have it. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. It's an eleven by but seventeen. It's, nice it's still play. pretty no, small. It's nice to play around. Yeah. It'd be nice yeah. to have the final. Make sure you copyright it to get any royalties. If <laughs> yeah, it's about the case. So um, glad PFM doesn't know I stole it. Knowing we're getting, <laughs> PFM doesn't know that. <laughs> knowing that we're getting close to, I created to the end it. of That's our conversation here. Um, I want to be careful on how I go about this. Um, the fire department has brought forward some very good projects, the training tower. Yep. I would highly encourage us to have a discussion on the placement of that sooner than later yep. so that it uh, can give them some direction on where they want because part of it is the the dome that's been looked at in oh, yeah. past evolution that is a possible training facility type thing or a location for a training facility so i think we Oh, to the fire department to, to give them a little direction if we think their project fits in the master plan for the okay. park. You mean to use the the dome that we're talking about removing as the? That I, again, I I don't want to call. Oh. What I'm suggesting is I think this council owes the fire department some direction on if they think the placement of their training tower fits in everyone's idea of what South Riverside Park master plan is. If, if it does, great. If it doesn't, I think they deserve to know that sooner than later. In regards to that, Deb, have you looked at what the relocation of that splash pad to the south, part of the Don Pass, south of the, quote, farmer's market area uh, would do? Is that a possibility? We've not looked at that. Certainly could. Put it on your list. 
before May. Is there anything else you want to cover on debt or capacity or anything like that right now? I'm sorry? Is there anything else you want to cover on debt capacity, et cetera? Hmm. Are we missing something? No. We need more money. <laughs> I'm aware of. I do want to apologize for my comments, Champions Ridge. That was my personal opinion. I should not interject it. And for those watching, please don't ball me out for that. Personal opinion, not for me to decide. Their plan is absolutely fine. I'll put the best on it. But again, my own issue, my own opinion on it completely. So again, I apologize for the outburst. Um, James, I thought... that, unless you want to go further into the budget, we will meet again on it Monday night and next two weeks from today, yeah. February 9th. We have a little bit to cover yet. Uh, water, sewer, solid waste, enterprise funds, TIF, debt service in a sense. We've kind of got hammered out depending on what this looks like. Um, but I'll go to Spear tomorrow with what this preliminarily looks like so they can start getting some not to exceed amounts out there. Doesn't commit us to anything other than the cap, which we know how much the cap is. We can't go any higher than what we got. Um, and so we'll move forward on that. And then we'll have just a few other things to look at, talk about the other positions, and then we'll get to the debt. Um, not the debt, but the tax rate, where it sits, what that means. And I know I feel like I'm stuck behind this thing. <laughs> what that means, and uh, we'll hammer all that out then on the 9th, depending on how much more you want to cover Monday night. So if you continue on today, if you like, or cover more Monday night, or like I said, February 9th, we have a whole day to hammer that out too. So if there's anything in between that you want, let myself or staff know, we'll try and get it together. Have it to you as soon as we can. Any questions, any issues, we'll certainly address them. I mean, all departments have brought forward some initiatives, staffing changes, addition, new programming, that type of thing. Yep. With, are you looking for yay nays on that, or? Not yet, necessarily. I'd like to at least see the whole thing and what it looks like, and then, unless there's something yet and we just, you don't want, then that absolutely can give us some feedback. Individually or of collectively, we obviously have to do it in a meeting, but individually, if you have more comments or questions about any certain things that have been brought up, we'll answer all we can. Otherwise, at some point, yeah, we'll have to start. And again, if the levy rate's where it is and you're fine with it, then I guess you're fine with it. If there's reductions you want to make in areas you'd like to look at, that's where we'll start to get into the yes or no's, do we, don't we, those kind of things. So I just want to at least get as much out to you today as we possibly could. And, I think we covered a lot um, in our almost eight hours, or getting to be seven hours. Um, but if there's more you want to hear or see today, absolutely. Staff is willing to stay. Um, they are. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but we have Monday night as well, because we just have the update from the W. That's all that's on there. So we have time Monday night or February night. We have the whole day if you need to, due to a final resolution of everything. So. So yeah, that's not right now, but eventually, yes, we will need some yeses or nos, unless it turns out that we're good with the levy rate and it sits where it sits. So, well, I think, thanks. Uh, thank thanks you to all the staff for. Yeah, yeah and thanks, James, for this uh, spreadsheet information. That's actually actually helpful. Yeah, every once in a while we'll have some. <laughs> actually, I think the mind can only absorb yeah. what the what the behind can stand. <laughs> and, uh, so I would entertain a motion for adjournment. I heard that saying, but I agree with it. Move <laughs> to adjourn. There's second. Second. I'll second. All those in favor say yes. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.